I now request our principal madam to present the memento for our guest. I now request Dr. Sanjay Kumar Manjulji and Dr. T. Satyamurti ji to receive the first copy. I now request Dr. Ramadevi, Ramadevi Shekhar, Director of Center of Excellence Art and Culture, to propose the concept note. Shri Guru Bionamaha. So I deem it uh, my pleasure to stand before you and to present the concept note of the two-day national seminar sponsored by ICHR. Thank you for this opportunity, Indian Council of Historical Research, to trust our college to give this wonderful opportunity. So this year being the um, hundred year of the excavation of the uh, site, uh, Harappan site. So the excavation of Harappan site, uh, 1921, marked a significant milestone in the field of archaeology and the discovery of ancient civilization that flourished in the Sindhu Saraswati Valley over 4,000 years ago and captivated the world for its complexity and diversity. As we commemorate the 100th year of the historic excavation, it is an opportune moment to reflect upon the rich cultural heritage of the Harappan civilization, its enduring influence on the Indian subcontinent, and the transformative insights gained from the recent excavation. So through this seminar commemorating the 100th year of the landmark of the discovery aims to explore the diverse aspects of the Harappan culture, focusing on the regional variations, recent excavation, burial practices, and its enduring influence on the contemporary society. This seminar is uh, into five themes. The theme one, the cultural legacy of Harappan civilization, continuity and resonance. The f being the first theme of the seminar, it will focus on the profound cultural heritage left by the Harappan civilization and its resonance through the ages. Here the speakers will discuss the unique urban planning and the architecture, case studies showcasing the continuity of Harappan symbols, revealing the new evidences, recent excavation and discoveries. In this theme, we will find the recent findings in the area of urban planning, craft specialization and social organization and advances in the archaeological techniques and technologies used to uncover the hidden facets of Harappan civilization. And through the case studies in the highlighting newly unearthed artifacts, which provide the new insights into the daily life, religious practices, and economic systems. Theme uh, three, Harappan diversity and regional adaptations. Through this theme, it will spotlight the diverse nature of the Harappan civilization, emphasizing the unique characteristics of the different regions. The key areas will discuss the ecological diversity and the reflection over the Harappan material culture. The case studies highlighting the regional variations in the pottery, beads, seals, and glass production. The theme four, which will highlight upon the Harappan civilization on the impact on the contemporary society, traces of Harappan cultural elements in the modern Indian art, architecture, and tradition, case studies exploring the integration of Harappan motives in the contemporary fashion and design, the impact of the Harappan civilization on regional languages, customs, and rituals, the development of unique script and the urban planning, the left and indelible mark on the later culture, the theme five, which will discuss upon the interdisciplinary perspective, science, history, and the anthropology, through this, scientific methodologies used to analyze Harappan remains, including the DNA studies and the isopotic uh, analysis, the fusion of historical records and the archaeological data to reconstruct the Harappan way of life, case studies which will demonstrate the how interdisciplinary research has enhanced uh, in understanding the Harappan trade routes and uh, social structures. 
to conclude this uh, here being the 100th year of the Harappan excavation, which will present an excellent opportunity uh, which will deeper into the remarkable cultural legacy of uh, ancient civilization by exploring its continuity, the impact on the contemporary society, the latest finding from the recent excavation, the seminar aims to shed new light on the most fascinating chapters in the human history. Through scholarly discussion, presentation and uh, dialogues, the participant will contribute to more comprehensive understanding of the Harappan civilization, the significance and enduring relevance supported by the evidence-based case studies. We aim to reach understanding the, uh, this remarkable civilization and highlight its enduring legacy that resonates in the contemporary times. Thank you. Uh, hoping to receive uh, new knowledge and uh, new DNA researchers. Of course, uh, uh, Sanjay Kumar Manjulji is there. He will give us about the recent excavation and other scholars across the India. Uh, we are very much uh, happy to receive from you what are the new things happening in the Harappan sites. Um, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I now request Dr. S.T. Deepa, Research Director, Sri Shankar Lal Sundarbhai Shasan Jain College for Women, to introduce Dr. Vasan Chindeji. Happy morning to all. I feel elated to stand among amidst this august audience to introduce the guest of the day. Professor Vasan Sindhi, former professor and vice chancellor at the Deccan College, postgraduate and research institute, deemed University Pune, and founding director general National Maritime Heritage Complex, Gandhi Nagar, and presently adjunct professor at the National Institute of Advanced S Studies, ICC campus, Bangalore, and director of research project, is a well-renowned archaeologist and one of the foremost scholars in South Asia. Professor Sindhi obtained his BA in History from University of Pune and a Master degree in AAHC and Archaeology from Deccan College, which was then under the University of Pune. He subsequently completed his PhD in P Proto Historic Archaeology on Early Settlements in Central Tapi Basin from the same university. He has been conferred with honorary DLIT degree by Vikramashila Hindi University. Professor Sinde has been teaching the postgraduate course in archaeology since 1982. In addition to being a recognized postgraduate teacher and research guide at Deccan College, Deemed University, University of Pune, Solapur University, Buddha Best Hungary, and he has been also conducting teaching for postgraduate diploma course at the Institute of Archaeology. Archaeological Survey of India, New Delhi, since 1991. In addition to his teaching activities, he has also supervised a vast number of MA and PhD research students. At present, 55 MA, PGD, MPhil students and um, 37 scholars have completed their research under his supervision, with several more currently receiving guidance or co-guidance from him. He also uh, provided guidance to around 15 visiting scholars from foreign university. He has been a pioneer archaeological research since uh, last 43 years, specializing in proto-history of South Asia, maritime history, as well as field archaeology. He has completed 16 major research projects in the process of which, which he has collaborated with uh, scholars and institutes from around the world, from institutes such as University of Pennsylvania and uh, Cambridge and Oxford Universities in the United Kingdom, to the International Research Center for Japanese Studies and Research Institute for Humanities and Nature. He has also directed a vast number of excavations around the country, from Karapan sites in Gujarat and Haryana, and the De Deccan to the proto-historic and early historic sites in Rajasthan and Maharashtra. He has traveled extensively to and delivered lectures in Israel, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Iran, Denmark, France, England, Germany, Belgium, Italy, Omen, Malaysia, China, Japan, South Korea, Russia, 
Ethiopia, Kenya, Greece, and several other countries throughout Europe and uh, Asia, as well as uh, North and Central America. He has also visited and worked with more than 17 international museums around the world, analyzing material ranging from the prehistoric to the late medieval period. He has been award awarded a number of honors and scholarship from various national and international bodies in the course of his academic career, two of the most noteworthy ones being 100 most influential vice chancellors by the World Education Congress, and the Wang Mehta National Education Award for Outstanding Contribution to Education. Professor Sinde has delivered no less than 225 special lectures in different parts of India and 48 in institutes abroad. He is a member of 20 national and international academic bodies. He has attended and presented his research in a large number of conferences in India and abroad. He has a vast administrative experience. Apart from working on numerous high-power national and international committees, he has been acting as field director of many excavations since 1990. He was pro-vice chancellor of Deccan College, deemed university from 2008 to 2013, and vice chancellor of the same university from 2013 till June 2019. He has a vast experience in organizing conferences, seminar, and convocations of the university. So we are really happy and honored that uh, you are here, and uh, we are looking forward to have uh, have your knowledge sharing with us. So thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. I kindly request Professor Dr. Vasanjin Deji to deliver the inaugural address. Vanakkam, Vanakkam, Namaste, Jai Jinendra, uh, the principal of the college, Madam, Dr. Sanjay Manjul, Professor Sonaune, my other friends, Professor Ban, Professor Jivan Kadakwal, Professor Ajit Prasad, other colleagues, friends, students, and the student of this college and also the staff. First, I would like to thank uh, for inviting me here. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Ramadeviji because I know her and uh, the kind of uh, outreach program she's doing is very much uh, appreciated because uh, I feel that the Harappan knowledge has not really gained a strong base, in fact, in southern part. And uh, she is pioneering, in fact, you know, in this respect. And uh, I am really happy that uh, somebody like her are doing this. I also, uh, I was extremely delighted to hear about the uh, development that is happening in this college. Uh, I was, madam, I was also associated with the Jain Mahasabha and I was looking into the spread of uh, Jainism, in fact, outside India. And I would travel extensively in that respect also with uh, Nirmal Kumar Setiji, who was the uh, chairman or the president of Mahasabha. And uh, so I am very much associated with the uh, Jain traditions and the aspects also. Now, uh, friends, uh, I am uh, here to speak about the uh, Harappan culture. You know that, you know, that uh, before the discovery of the Harappan culture, why it is so important? Because the, before the discovery that happened in 1920s, but let me tell you that, you know, for last, uh, for four years, from 19, 2021 20, to 24, the excavators were not really able to understand the antiquity of the remains, how old the remains are. So it took them four years. And finally, on 20th September 1924, the announcement of the discovery of the Harappan civilization was made uh, through a small but very important uh, paper 
that was published by John Marshall in Illustrated London News. So that is the beginning of the discovery of the Harappan civilization. Now we know that, you know that uh, this civilization is known by different names. We call this as Harappan civilization mostly in India because we go by the basics in archaeology. When the culture is discovered, it is named after, for the first time when it is discovered, it is named after the region or the site where this culture is uh, discovered. So the re elements were identified at the site of Harappa, which is in Pakistan today. And uh, then, of course, you know, different names were introduced, terms were introduced like Indus culture, Indus civilization, then Indus Valley culture, Indus Valley civilization, and uh, also Indus Saraswati civilization. And uh, of course, you know, everybody has given the uh, logic behind that, you know, why they are introducing these terms. But, you know, in order to avoid the confusion, because we know that, you know, we are talking about the same culture, but perhaps the students are not really aware, you know, whether we are talking about the same culture or about the different culture. So because of that, you know, there is a lot of confusion happening. And in spite of, you know, uh, more than 100 years, uh, we have been researching on this culture. We have not come to this particular consensus yet. And uh, this is high time that, you know, we, you know, come to the uh, consensus that, you know, what term we should use. And, uh, so, you know, it's very difficult because, you know, we have been trying uh, to uh, do that, but uh, it is becoming difficult. So, uh, why this culture is important? Because, you know, if you see the history before the discovery, mostly written by the colonial historians, particularly Vincent Smith. Now he talks about the big gap in the history of South Asia. And he says that you know, India jumps from Stone Age to the Stupa period or the Buddhist period. And he says that there's a big hiatus or the Vedic night in the history of South Asia. So that was the understanding. Most of the scholars thought that the settled life in this part happened maybe around 6th century BC onward, not before that. But uh, the discovery has stretched back the antiquity of settled life at one stroke by almost you know, 2,500 years. And now in Pato, we boast of a continuous history and continuous history for last almost 2 million years, that is 20 lakhs. This site in Pato near uh, Chennai in Tamil Nadu, Atirampakkam, which has produced the, you know, the early date for the beginning of the uh, Stone Age culture in this part, which is going plus 2 million now. So from 2 million to the present, we have continuous history. And the beauty of the Harappan culture is that I always consider that this is the uh, founder of the Indian culture and tradition. So most of the traditions that were introduced by the Harappans, most of the basic knowledge about which I'm going to speak so these aspects have continued you know in major part of south asia today and therefore you know harappans are very important they have laid the foundation of the you know of uh, south asia and we always talk about the concept of a nation but let me tell you that you know concept of nation or the empire as per our present understanding goes back to maybe modern period we, we associate that with the Mauryan period. But, uh, you know, if you look at the Harappan uh, culture and the development that has taken place, I feel that the concept of nation was introduced by the Harappans. Now, we have these, you know, three different phases of the Harappan culture. The early phase is called the formative stage. And uh, that formative stage is very long now. You know, the research that we are doing in Pat uh, Sanjay Manjul and us, uh, we are doing in Pat in the Saraswati Basin. Now the dates are going back to almost 6,000 BCE. There are some you know, debates, you know, whether you know that early phase to be, should be to be called as pre-Harappan or the early Harappan. But uh, my understanding is that you know, that should be called as the early Harappan because there is a continuity from 6,000 or 5,500 BC up to the end of the Harappan culture. So that is a very important phase, and in that particular phase, we are getting the evidence of the gradual growth of the urbanization. It is not that the urbanization that we see in the Harappan culture has, has evolved suddenly. There is a long precedence 
and the process starts maybe around 6000 BCE and ultimately it culminates into the formation of the urban phase around 2500 BCE. But when you look at the history of a phase between 2500 BC to 2000 BC or 1900 BCE, we see the urbanization happening in that particular period. And in the earlier urban phase, there were a number of regional cultures, at least you know, six regional cultures have been identified. And these regional cultures were integrated into a, a uniform culture around 2500 BC and over an area of roughly almost 2 million square kilometer. So vast area, almost double the size of Pakistan. So on that, you know, on, over such a large area, we see the uh, emergence of a uniform culture coming into existence. So that is the, you know, a very important example in the world history where this type of integration was made by peaceful means. When it comes to the empire, we always have, have the impression that empires are made by forceful means. You know, even the you know Mauryan Empire, and later, but uh, perhaps in the in the uh, history of the world, this is the unique example where we see the integration of such a large area into one uniform culture, you know, without any violence by peaceful means. So this is very very important that we you know need to learn, and we always compare it the Harappans uh, with the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians, because we know that you know this Mesopotamian culture or the civilization and Egyptian civilization, they flourished almost simultaneously. And the Harappans had very strong contact you know, with this region. Uh, are you showing my presentation or? So uh, meanwhile, you know, till uh, you found this presentation, Harappan continuity and Harappan relevance and continuity, maybe. Yes. <coughs> okay, let's stop here. So, you know, Harappans, you know, the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians, they were, they flourished almost simultaneously. And the research that we have done over this, uh, you know, very lengthy period, that clearly indicates that you know these three cultures were well connected to each other by the trade activities and because of that a lot of cultural elements also had traveled from Harappan to other regions and from other regions to the Harappan regions also uh, and you know uh, when we suppose you know you are given given a choice uh, which site you would like to visit whether maybe Egyptian site Mesopotamian site or Harappan site you will always go for Egyptian site because there are pyramids and large, maybe life-size images uh, that you know are visible even today. And uh, you know, Harappans not have not created those type of uh, maybe monumental architecture or large size or the uh, human size uh, figurines. So the impression that we get is that perhaps Harappans were not competent. But let me tell you that you know the Harappans were much more competent if they had decided to create this type of you know architectural monuments or images they could have done easily because Harappans are considered the best civil engineers in the contemporary world. But here the philosophy was different. Philosophy and the administrative system was different. Mesopotamians and the Egyptians were ruled by the kings and queens. They are the monarchical system whereas you know whatever evidence we have clearly indicates that Harappans have some kind of democratic setup. And the democratic values start from the you know, Harappan times. We do not have in the Harappan levels, you know, the palaces anywhere. 
If the palaces were there, they could have been at, the, at four or five sites, which, you know, which are considered to be the large Harappan cities. Secondly, now we do not have royal tombs like you know, we find in Mesopotamia and Egypt. And they have buried huge amount of wealth. Particularly you now, if you see the wealth that is discovered or recovered from the Tutankhamun's you know, tomb, even you know, one tenth of that is not found in, in, the, in the entire Harappan region so far. That does not mean that Harappans had not, you know, they did not have sufficient wealth. They did have a lot of wealth. So here, you know, the value of the Harappans was different. They always cared for the common people. And uh, they were literally plundering the Western, you know, Mesopotamians and Egyptians through trade because the evidence that we have for the trade, that clearly indicates that, you know, that there was a surplus amount of trade, you know, trade, you know, of the Harappans with them. So a lot of things were sent from here to Mesopotamia and Egypt. And through that, they were generating a lot of wealth. And that wealth was used by the Harappans for creating those beautiful, very well-planned and very hygienic cities. So that is considered a very, very important contribution of the Harappans. Can I, can I have the next one? Or maybe you can give to me. I can operate that. Okay, now here you can see that, you know, the, where the Harappans have flourished. These are the two river valleys, the Indus, uh, which is known to everyone. And parallel to that was the, uh, was the river called, you know, Vedic Saraswati. I think, you know, the research, enough research has established that it was a Vedic Saraswati. So between these two rivers, you know, the, mostly the Harappans have flourished. That was the core area of the Harappans. And then, of course, you know, they had occupied much larger area up to Gujarat uh, and also Makran coast, you know, to, to the west. So this is the area where the Harappans flourish. Now you can see that, you know, I was talking about uh, the, uh, the urbanization happening uh, around uh, 2500 BCE. The urban phase, uh, it is called also the Harappan civilization. We also call it as the, as the mature Harappan phase because most of the traditions most of the knowledge system was perfected in, in, part in this particular phase. And uh, before the partition, uh, the most of the sites were known along the Indus River Basin only. And two classical sites, Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, which were simultaneously, simultaneously excavated in 1920, I think they are located in Pakistan. So after the partition, there were only two sites left on Indian side. And then, of course, you know, there's a big challenge for the Indian archaeologists. So we accepted that we carried out ex extensive and intensive survey along the river banks. And now we know the situation is that we have discovered more than 2,000 Harappan sites. And nearly two-thirds of them are located on Indian side. And you can see in Pat here uh, the area that was occupied, uh, the most important uh, Okay, the most important region, of course, you know, between these two river basins, Indus and Saraswati, I think Saraswati was most attractive because, you know, there were less floods, floods in fact, in the Saraswati basin, and it is ideal for the uh, establishment of large settlements there. So we find large concentration of the uh, settlements, in fact, in the Saraswati basin, you can see uh, here. So it was a very, very important for the, uh, for the Harappans. So what is the contribution that the Harappans have made? Uh, we know enough about the Harappan history. Uh, we have talked about different phases. We know about the lifestyle of the people. But uh, we are not really highlighting the important contribution that Harappans have made to the history of the South Asia and also to the history of the world. And one of the important contributions of the Harappans is that they have taught, in fact, how to make you know very beautiful, well-planned cities, which are so hygienic. Even you know the urbanization happens in Mesopotamia and Egypt also, but we don't find you know this type of well-planned and you know well-executed cities in the Mesopotamia and, and uh, the uh, Egyptian region. So this is considered to be one of the important contribution of the Harappans, and we can see that you know this is the actual evidence uh, from the site of Dolavira. And we also have evidence from different sides. How well planned the cities were. The concept of maybe you know, a square, 
you can see in you know, two main streets running north, south, and east, west. They meet, you know, here. So perfectly perpendicular, you know, planning of the settlement. So this is very, very important. Uh, we find this evidence in the Harappan levels. It's not moving. So, uh, you know, uh, the uh, tradition that was said by the Harappans, that is not forgotten. When you look at these settlements today, in uh, Punjab, Haryana particularly, then you can see the, you know, the correlation between Harappan settlements and the you know, present settlement. You know, we are following the same path. You know, we are not really forgotten the system that was said by the Harappans. And on the, you know, on one side is the evidence from the site of Kalibangan. And on the other side is the picture of the, you know, maybe village of Rakhigadi. So see the similarities. Next. And the other important contribution uh, that is, according to me, the most important contribution is the introduction of the scientific construction method by the Harappans. You know, today, and that method is being followed not only in South Asia, but all over the world. And that method is called today, it is called English bond. But you know that, you know, this English bond method was not known to the Europeans till 14th century, but that was introduced by the Harappans. Now in the English bond, when the uh, uh, brick wall is constructed, one line of the brick is placed horizontal, next line is vertical. So that is the method. So that method was introduced by the Harappans. So that, you know, this is so, there is so much, uh, you know, relevance to know this particular method. Even the whole world is following that. So we say that, you know, instead of calling this as the Harappan, you know, or, or English bond, it should be called, called as the Harappan bond. So this is a very, very important method of the uh, construction that was introduced by the Harappans. Next, please. Yeah, you can see the modern construction. And in the previous slide, you know, you have seen the construction of the Harappans, which are survived at the site of Mohanjadaro. In fact, I visited Mohanjadaro twice, and I have made a detailed documentation. Uh, Professor uh, Ajit Prasad and uh, Professor Ban, we also traveled once together in 2012, and we have visited most of the Harappan sites there. Next one. Uh, we don't know much about you know, whether the Harappans knew uh, different sciences, including mathematics because you know, we have not been able to decipher the Harappan script yet. And we do not have direct evidence about you know, the development in various science, scientific spheres. But from the evidence, you know, we can certainly you know, infer that Harappans knew mathematics very well, because these are the instruments, measuring instruments, that the Harappans have created. And these were instruments were used in the construction method. You know, because of that, the uh, Harappan cities are so well planned. So this is an important you know, evidence that we have, the actual evidence from Harappan sites. Next one, please. We always thought that you know, the concept of commode has come from the West. But you can see here, this is the earliest evidence of commode and the toilet uh, you know, that is found in the Harappan levels. And what is interesting, that this concept has continued till today. And even if you see the toilets in the, particularly in the rural part of the country, they are exactly like, you know, the Harappan toilets. And what is interesting, you know, close to the toilet, there's a big jar and there's a small lota in that. Even today, we keep a bucket and mug in pat in our toilets. So this is the continuity in pat, you know, what one, one can see for last 5,000 years. Next one, please. Yeah, you can see the continuity. Next one, please. Now, the uh, on the left-hand side, uh, there's a picture of the bathroom. And I'm sure that, you know, most of you will mistake this as a modern bathroom. But this is actually the specimen. This is the actual bathroom excavated from the site of Kalibanga. And see the, you know, advanced, you know, uh, stage in fact in this particular respect. And what is interesting that, you know, Harappans have also created those uh, beautiful decorated tiles. And this concept of the decorated tiles has continued from the Harappans in modern times. So you can see the ancient and the modern parallel of that also. 
Next one, please. A unique uh, system that the Harappans had adopted, and which is considered the maybe one of the wonders of the ancient world, is the very impeccable the drainage system, sanitary system that Harappans introduced. So they had open drainage and the closed drainage, and usually the open drainage was connected to the to the bathroom, and the closed drainage was connected to the toilets. And very elaborate system was adopted by the Harappans. Can I have next? You can see you now on the you know uh, uh, this is the picture from the site of Lothal uh, where they excavated uh, very good evidence about the drainage pattern that the Harappans followed, and they simply followed the you know simple gradient pattern you know flowing water flowing from the higher levels to the lower levels, and almost each house had toilet and bathroom. I think you know in that contemporary world nobody could nobody could have thought about this you know this type of sanitary system that the Harappans thought of. Next one, please. And uh, of course, you know, this, they use open drainage, they use uh, closed drainage, they also, you know, this, you know, constructed pipelines, which is not much different from the modern pipeline. Next one, please. And what is interesting that, you know, we find uh, from the excavation, we find the drainage, network of drainage in the Harappan cities. And usually, you know, the network was, network was connected to the main drainage line. So you can see here the opening of the main drainage line at the site of Harappa, which was excavated. And uh, this, you know, the opening is somewhere outside the city wall, making sure that, you know, that no dirty water spreads within the settlement. And therefore, you know, the city, the Harappan cities were so hygienic. In fact, uh, I excavated on a site called, site called Farmana and also Rakigudi uh, before Sanjay Manjul. And we excavated a lot of uh, uh, skeletal data from the uh, Harappan uh, cemeteries. And uh, uh, we also studied the pathology uh, present during the Harappan times. And some of the Korean scientists were working with us. And at the end of the study, the Korean scientists were so disappointed they say that you know we don't really detect a major disease during the Harappan times, and that was because the Harappan cities were so clean. Two aspects are important here. One is of course the cities were very clean, and Harappans have introduced the you know health science in the form of yoga tradition and so meditation. So because of that, Harappans were so healthy, and the whole world has realized the importance of yoga and uh, tradition, you know, meditation today. So I'm going to show that evidence also. Next one, please. See, this is the picture from the site of, uh, from the village of Rakhigadi. Almost you know, the same pattern. When we move, in fact, around the village of Rakhigadi, uh, usually you know, when we are excavating, we stay there for three to four months. And you know, whenever I used to go around in the village, I used to get impression that I'm moving in the Harappan village because exactly the same you know, dimension of the road, the same you know, make of the room, and also the house pattern, modern house pattern, is derived from the Harappan plan. We have the open courtyard in the middle and rooms on all sides. And this is the most scientific uh, maybe uh, plan that Harappans had devised because it is in the extreme climatic condition, this plan is very, very uh, you know, scientific. Uh, so, but uh, you know, we are not learning from the history. Now here you can see the drainage pattern, which is open in the street. Next one, please, you can see more elaborate. See, this is the modern drainage pattern. We are following the Harappan pattern, but not you know, uh, you know, to the perfection that should have been done. Next one, please. Uh, you know, of course, you know, Harappans were the first to develop the concept of whales. They brought the clean drinking water you know, to the settlement, and we have a lot of evidence. And there is a continuity in pattern of this particular tradition even today in major part of South Asia. Next one, please. Uh, one of the important part, you know, that aspect that I would like to highlight here is that how the Harappans could generate so much wealth for the development of the urbanization. I mentioned that, you know, Harappans, they had, they were at disadvantages because they did not have sufficient raw materials available within the Harappan region. They were controlled by the contemporary population outside the Harappan region. For example, you know, gold came from South India, from the Hatti mines in, in near Gulbarga. Then copper came from Rajasthan, the you know famous Khetri belt. 
and you know maybe various other raw materials came from different sources so what the harappans did in fact the strategy that the harappans adopted is very very important they did not try to you know attack these people and get this you know maybe uh, control of the source they developed very good contacts with them very you know congenial con you know relation with them and through this relation they acquired the raw necessary raw, raw materials from them and the harappans had technology with them so they processed the goods and they supply the goods and you know, the finished goods to the same people from whom they you know acquired the raw material that is how you know they started generating lot of wealth and then at one stage that re that they realized that perhaps you now we should go beyond the indian subcontinent and that is how you know they started developing contact with oman with persian gulf with mesopotamia and egypt and you know that you know through this uh, you know outside or the international trade linkage they were able to generate lot of wealth and that wealth was used as i mentioned for the development of cities and towns and for the welfare of the people so this is a unique example i always give the example of japan because you know i have spent you know a lot of time in japan i have visited you know this hiroshima nagasaki and i have seen the destruction you know that happened in the second world war and nobody could thought that you know japan will rise again but you know that japan rose within 15 years and they became a world economy power and they showcase that in fact in 1950s now japan was completely destroyed but in 1964 in the olympics they showcase the uh, economic power that they generated and the principle that was adopted by harap you know, by the japanese was exactly same as the harappans japan also did not have a lot of natural resources available they started importing them from india china which were the developing countries then and then started they, they started producing a large you know mass uh, finished goods and they supply the finished goods to the same countries from whom they acquired the raw materials that is how japan could you know generate so much wealth and they became a world economy power so uh, you know i don't say that you know the japanese have learned directly from the harappans but this knowledge has survived and it has spread in different parts of the world also next one please they developed this you know the for the hinterland trade they developed this uh, uh, this vehicles for the communication purpose the bullock cart and we have the actual evidence of some replicas of the you know bullock carts in the harappan region next and they were the pioneer in part in developing the maritime contact and uh, the maritime contact was developed for the trade purpose and they were the first you know to develop this in part in the indian subcontinent and uh, for developing this maritime contact or maritime trade they needed some infrastructure and that infrastructure was created by the harappans at the site of lothal you can see a huge structure now that structure is identified by archaeologists as the earliest dockyard anywhere in the world we do not have such a parallel anywhere in the world and this dockyard was used for two purpose for trade purpose as well as for maybe building and repairing ships and the boats we always thought that you know they have to, we have learned this concept of ships and boats or the techniques from the romans but before romans in fact you know we had this uh, infrastructure and the evidence so this is considered a very very important contribution of the harappans and even today in fact you know there are some communities particularly in manvi region of uh, gujarat even uh, yes even in gujarat you know even goa kerala even tamil nadu also orissa bengal they are following the same method in fact they are using the same age old harappan technology to build the you know modern you know small ships or the boats and today you know there is a doubt trade between kutch and oman which was started by the harappans and that is continuing even today so there is a lot of continuity happening in this respect also next one please next so what kind of boats the harappans had with them they we at least have you know these two replicas the replicas on the harappan seals in the upper you know on the left hand side on the upper you know picture you can see a plank boat with a flat bottom and in the lower part in fact there is a boat made of thick grass it is called reed boat so these two you know kinds of boats were built by the harappans and from this picture you can make out that you know these boats were capable of you know traveling a long distance because inside the boat there is a house this is a cabin 
and in fact in the upper part also there are birds in that so birds are required you know when you do not have you know very strong you know, communication network you need birds to locate nearby land so this is the kind of evidence that we get so these type of boats were built by the harappans for the long distance trade and even today exactly the same boats are being used uh, you can see a boat in a small boat here next one please uh, uh, in the uh, right and uh, left uh, right and lower corner there is a boat uh, which is being used even today in the indus river when i visited uh, mohanjodo second time in 2017 i took some pictures even today people are using the same flat bottom boats you know in the in the river uh, indus and uh, the middle one of course you know is the boat you know is the picture of the reed boats uh, which are being developed and built in on large scale in in, in iraq mesopotamia even today next one please then of course you know one of the uh, uh, excellent uh, knowledge system that the harappans introduced was the water harvesting and water management and this is the evidence uh, from the site of uh, dholavira which is in kutch part of gujarat now let me tell you that you know this in this particular you know part of uh, gujarat uh, uh, the climate was extremely arid and the climate during harappan times was not much different it was also arid that time but they had to develop this particular city here because of maybe various reasons and one of them could be that you know this falls on the important trade route between sindh and saurashtra so they had to develop some important cities and some important settlements and as a part of that this particular city was developed but what is interesting here that they did not just come here and started living here they came here they studied the geography and geology first and then they decided to locate the city between two rivers there are two small rivers one is manhar the other one is mansar and what they did in panna in this region there is a occasional rainfall in the desert part particularly but whenever there is rainfall these rivers get flash floods and this you know and this you know flood water or the rain water that was coming that was you know arrested by the harappas by putting series of dams on both the rivers we have the actual evidence of that and you can see the location of the you know even the dams that the harappans put and then of course uh, they diverted the entire water inside the settlement next one please so they diverted the water inside and in case you know there is you know a huge volume of water coming in which might damage the settlement or the city they created this storm water outlet so that you know that you know the huge volume you know that can be taken care of so this is the system that they, de they develop and even today when you know the planners they make sure that you know this type of storm water drainage is is a very important part of the drainage system that they develop anywhere next one please and then of course inside uh, they created uh, those underground water reservoirs so this is the actual evidence that was excavated by the excavator uh, from the archaeological survey of india or is based and uh, you know there were this underground water reservoirs in different parts of the city the city is divided into three parts and in each part you know they have discovered this underground water reservoirs next one please this is one of the biggest one these are some different you know smaller and even a big uh, deep well also you can see here suppose the water from this you know tanks is over maybe there's always water in the deep well which can be drawn and put in the drainage in the water channel system next one please this is all ex excavated from the site and also you can see the underground water channel system connecting different underground water reservoirs you know so that you know the reservoirs are filled one after the other and what is interesting here that you can see the you know amount of water that was that was flowing huge amount of water and also in the left hand side picture you can see at regular intervals there were air ducts also and this is most scientific even today this is followed that you know, to prevent the blockage and for the maintenance purpose uh, this is done next one please the agriculture system has not changed from the harappan times till today uh, you can on the left hand side is the are uh, the plowed uh, field uh, excavated at the site of kalibanga 
And you can see that the you know, same cloud you know, system is being followed even today in the Indian subcontinent. So Harappans were the first to introduce you know, the rotation of crop system. Two crops in a year were introduced by the Harappans so that they could generate sufficient wealth to support you know, different classes in the society. Next one, please. Uh, even the tools are not different. You know, maybe the medium has changed, but the basic shape has not really changed. Uh, in the upper picture, we can see the model of the Harappan plow, and uh, the modern plow is not much different from Harappan's. Next one, please. The tandoor chicken concept. Harappan's were the first to develop the delicacy called tandoor chicken. We have the actual evidence of that from the site of Kalibanga, and that tradition has also has continued till today. Next one, please. These are the modern and the ancient tandoors. Next. Even the Harappans have introduced uh, cotton. The earliest evidence of cotton is found in, in the Indian subcontinent at the site of Mehrgarh, dated around 7000 BC. They also have uh, introduced uh, uh, silk textile, wool textile, and also jute textile. In fact, we have the evidence of that from the Harappan sites. Next one, please. Uh, this is the evidence from, of the silk uh, uh, textile, that, or the silk thread that was found. Next. That has all been studied in by now. Jute and the wool. Next. Probably the pin printing was done by the Harappans also. They introduced this particular concept because they found, you know, on the shawl-like garment uh, of this uh, so-called priest king, there are some traces of the color. So probably, you know, this, uh, you know, they introduced the uh, color printed textile also. Next one, please. Then this is, of course, the beautiful pottery that the Harappans have introduced. They, you know, they were quite advanced uh, in this particular respect. And uh, the type of vessels that the Harappans have produced, the same vessels have continued till today, indicating that you know, there is no change, basic change, in fact, in the food, food habit of the people for the last 5,000 years. Next one, please. Uh, you can see, you know, if you keep one modern and one Harappan pot side by side, perhaps you will not be able to identify which one is modern and which one is ancient. And they are being used even today in that part. Next one. Yeah, you can see the you know, upper Harappan pots and the modern pots, how similar they are. Next. They produce a large amount of terracotta figurines, male, female, and also animal figurines. And uh, maybe they were toys. Some of them could have been used for worship also. And we are following that tradition in different parts of the country even today. Next one. Uh, even, you know, the, uh, the technology that the Harappans had developed for making pottery, for making bead, that has also continued. You can see that, you know, the modern potters are using the same, maybe fast wheel for making pottery. Next one, please. The females are also, they get involved in the work. They mostly do the paintings, probably the Harappans also have the same system. Next one. They also, you know, use the, the same kind of uh, firing technology that the Harappans had. So the Harappans used to fire pot in two different kinds of kiln. One is open kiln, which you can see here. And on the right hand side, you can see the picture of the open kiln from the Harappan site. Next one. And also close kiln. Next one. So even today, of course, you know people are using both in fact the close kiln as the, as, as well as open kiln. And the technology that they are following today is exactly the same as the Harappan. Next one, please. Uh, they made different kinds of beads. A lot of these beads had a great demand in West Asia, particularly in, in Mesopotamia and Egypt. So they created, they produced them on mass scale for the trade purpose and also uh, for decorating themselves, in fact, they, you can see here. And that tradition, again, has, has continued uh, in the, some parts of South Asia. Next one, please. Uh, even there are some families in Khambat region who are making beads by using more or less same Harappan technology. So that tradition, also the knowledge system has not really died. It has continued even today. Next one, please. Next one. So this is actually evidence of uh, the manufacturing of beads uh, and uh, the associated material, like you know the tools that were used in the manufacturing activities, etc., from some Harappan sites. Next one, please. Uh, Harappans also made you know very tiny uh, steatite beads, 
and uh, like today, they also messed up in use for embroidery work uh, during Tharapan times. Next one. Uh, this is a famous uh, that uh, bronze figurine called the so-called dancing figure, which is in the, in National Museum in Delhi. Uh, but what is interesting is that you know the the you know, plaited hair pattern that was introduced by the Harappans that has continued even today. So there is no change in this tradition that the Harappans have introduced. Next one, please. Even the, you know, these different hairstyles, uh, hairdresses, there is not much, you know, change in that part also. There are some communities who are following this, you know, same Harappan tradition. Next one. Next. Yeah, this is that so-called, you know, this... Uh, <laughs> so-called the priest king. And see, the Harappans were so, you know, they, you know, they loved fashion also. So they used to keep maybe trim beard, and that tradition again, you know, has not really, you know, died. And the glaring example of that is our, you know, honourable Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Next one, please. Uh, they we do find a lot of, you know, bangles made of maybe made of terracotta, uh, even uh, copper, you know, copper and even silver. So that tradition also has continued. Next one, please. Uh, uh, Professor Bhan has excavated you know, a lot of evidence about the shell working in Pati uh, sites site in, in Gujarat. And uh, that tradition again you know, has continued uh, from Harappan till today. And particularly in Bengal today is so prominent. Next one. Uh, these are some of the copper tools that the Harappas made. Uh, they used two kinds of technology. One is called simple hammering, cold hammering technology. And the other one is a complex, uh, which were made in mold, cast in mold. So both the technologies uh, have continued today. Particularly now there is a community called uh, Gadia Lohar in Rajasthan. And they are following the same tradition as the Harappans did. Next one. Uh, they also made uh, the jewelry of uh, silver and gold. They developed the technology, but basic technology for making these. Next. And we have evidence uh, of making uh, this uh, copper tools, even the gold beads uh, in different Harappan sites. So the Harappans have manufactured them. They have de developed this particular technology, and that technology has continued for 5,000 years. Next one, please. I was mentioning to you about this, you know, two important, um, uh, the health science uh, that was developed by the Harappans. One is that, you know, uh, at the site of Kunal, uh, we, uh, the Saraswat, you know, who was the paleobotanist, he has found some uh, seeds of some herbal plants. So probably, you know, this Ayurveda was introduced by the Harappans. This is my, you know, hunch. And the other science that they developed was the health science, like you know the uh, this type of meditation, you know, tradition, and uh, and that meditation tradition has continued from Harappan till today. Next one, please. And I was talking to you about the yoga tradition. We call them as yoga, but actually it is yoga, and uh, you can actually see the fi you know, terracotta figurines in different yogic posture excavated from different Harappan sites. So certainly, you know, this was uh, very much, you know, developed uh, uh, in the, you know, Harappan times. And then, of course, you know, it is continued. And even today, we follow Ramdev and, you know, Ayengar, uh, which have maybe mastered this technology now. Next one, please. Uh, these are some of the concepts. We feel that, you know, they came from the, you know, from Europe, but actually we have the, you know, evidence of the pet dogs. Uh, which is being, you know, uh, uh, used by the Harappans. Even they have used some, you know, maybe small tubs for, you know, giving birth to the, you know, small child. Next one. Uh, 
Namaste tradition. I think the whole world has realized the importance of Namaste tradition after the pandemic, and that is also uh, was introduced by the Harappans. So this tradition is so old, you know, at least five thousand years old in Indian subcontinent. Next one, please. Uh, uh, also, there is a site called Naushara in Pakistan, uh, where we found these uh, female figurines, and there is a small, maybe vermilion, in the parting of the hair. Uh, Professor Bibilal has elaborated this very extensively, and uh, again, that you know, putting vermilion in the parting of the hair is not you know the recent phenomenon. Right? This, is, this is very age-old tradition in, in Indian subcontinent. Next one, please. Uh, they introduced maybe chessboard pattern, uh, chessboards. These are games which are introduced. We have the actual evidence from the site of Lothal and other sites. Next one. Uh, some games, uh, you know, in the yeah, in that picture you can see some of the objects recorded from the Harappan sites, and they were the gamesmen, and uh, we are following the same pattern today. In fact, you know, there is a pot uh, at Lothal, uh, which is not here now. Uh, on which you now there is a painting of a story of a thirsty crow, and that thirsty crow tradition you are you know today in Patna we tell our children. So that tradition also has continued from Harappan till today. Next one. Uh, we don't know much about the uh, education system during Harappan times because we do not have sufficient evidence. But from this, uh, these are the uh, in that particular you know uh, picture on the left hand side. Uh, these are the specimens of slate uh, from the site of Mohanjadaro excavated. So probably this indicates that the Harappans had proper, you know, very you know formal education system in place. And when I was a child in Patna, I also used this, you know, the modern uh, writing tablets. So that tradition again is very very important. Next one, please. Next, be previous one. Yeah, when we visited, I maybe uh, Ajit Prasad and. Uh, uh, Bahan will remember that you know, we saw this uh, cage inside the uh, uh, museum of Harappa, and when we came out, you know, we saw one person in carrying a bird uh, in the cage. So that tradition again, you know, in that Harappan cage, you can see a terracotta bird, and also in the modern cage, you can see this, the continuity. Next. So we also, you know, the Harappans have introduced a comb, that is the you know tradition. We always thought that you know the concept of feeding bottle has come from the waste, but actually, you know, this is the actual you know uh, specimen from the site of Kalibanga excavated, and this is the earliest evidence of feeding bottle anywhere in the world. So this concept was also introduced by the Harappans. So a lot of tradition we feel that came from outside, actually our our own tradition introduced by by our founders. Next one, please. And finally, you know, we tried to understand who are the Harappan people. So this was the last, uh, you know, uh, research that we did in fact at the site of Raki Gadi. And uh, also uh, we have published that uh, in a very prestigious journal. And on the uh, right hand side, you can see uh, this particular research was identified as one of the nine breakthrough researches in the world uh, in 2019 at the uh, International Conference on Genomics. So this is the research that, that we did and scientifically accepted by the uh, scientific community. So this research clearly indicates that you know, the Harappans were the indigenous people. They had contact with outside world, of course. There's a lot of mixing happening also. But the you know, main ancestry was uh, the indigenous. Next one, please. And also, uh, the other research we did for the first time, uh, the, it is called craniofacial reconstruction. So for the first time, you know, we have shown how the exactly Harappan people look like, particularly you know, from the Haryana region. And uh, in the upper, you, you can see the reconstruction of a uh, face of a 18 or 19 year old Harappan boy. And in the lower picture, a 45 year, 45 year old Harappan woman uh, is shown. Next one. And they more or less like, look exactly like the modern, you know, the modern people look like Harappans rather. So there is a continuity as far as the complex is concerned. There is a continuity from Harappans till modern times. There is a continuity in the genetic history from Harappans till modern times. And uh, the evidence that you know, we have gathered from uh, South Asia 
indicates that you know, the uh, Harappan uh, you know, genetic history has spread almost all over the South Asia from Andaman Nicobar up to Ladakh, Kashmir, and from Bengal to Afghanistan. So most of us carry the Harappan uh, rather genes. Next one, please. And of course, you know, I just say that, you know, that how the Harappan traditions, knowledge system, and Harappan, the Harapp Harappan genes have spread in the entire South Asia because outside the Harappan region, there were a number of communities and there was a strong interaction between Harappans and the, the regional or the hinterland communities. And because of that, there was a lot of give and take. Because of that, a lot of cultural elements had traveled from Harappan to other regions and also vice versa. Next one, please. And, uh, you know, uh, one wonders in fact, you know, how this uh, Harappan knowledge has survived today. I think in India, there is a very strong oral tradition concept. In fact, you know, I remember, Jivan might remember that, you know, we were excavating at Balatal in uh, uh, near Udaipur in Rajasthan. And one fine morning, you now there was one, uh, you know, person from the village. So out of curiosity, I asked, you know, what do you, what do you, what do, you do? He said that, oh, I just read genealogy of the you know royal family in udaipur he was illiterate and he had no you know knowledge formal education at all but he could remember genealogy for 800 years so that tradition is so strong so because of the oral tradition passing on from generation to generation this knowledge has survived till the earliest universities of the world takshila and nalanda this is the evidence from nalanda Till this, you know, you know, studies were developed, this tradition has continued for, you know, to oral tradition. And then, you know, most of the formal education was given in fact, the Harappan knowledge system, or what you call as the Indian knowledge system, that was taught in fact at these uh, universities. And you know that, you know, this knowledge system was so important and people have realized the importance and the relevance of that. So people from, there's a record, people from different, 40 different countries, they used to come to learn the Indian knowledge system. So that was the base, in fact, that was the importance of the Indian knowledge system. And that Indian knowledge system was introduced by the Harappans. Next one, please. And we are also making efforts, in fact, to, uh, you know, take this knowledge to the, to the people. Because unless you make people understand about the importance of the knowledge system, perhaps they will not really understand the importance of the heritage. And if you are to preserve the heritage in the country, because such a vast heritage, only you know certain agents like Archaeological Service of India or State Departments, they cannot do that because you have such a vast resources. So we feel that you know there should be a participation of the people, and people will participate in the preservation and the you know maybe protection of the heritage, provided you know they are you know made understand you know they are made to understand about the importance of the heritage. So it is the responsibility of all of us. We have to, you know, make people understand the importance. And that kind of exercise, you know, we did at the site of Rakhigadi, and it was so successful. Today, people have realized the importance of the presence of the heritage site in the village. Earlier, they used to think that, you know, this, is a, you know, maybe this is a curse for them, but today they feel that, you know, this is, you know, maybe boon for them. So that transition has happened because of the outreach program, and that needs to be done on larger scale. Thank you very much. So this, yeah, this is what we know we do in fact. You know, whenever, whenever we excavate the sites, you know, we do a lot of outreach program. Uh, we invite the school children and the even villagers, and we make them understand you know, what exactly we do. Otherwise, there will be a lot of misunderstanding among the people. Uh, one, you know, once I was excavating at. Uh, a small place called Karsola, very close to Rakhigadi. And we had a very uh, distinguished visitor in the form of former Prime Minister's daughter, Professor Upinder Singh, who was the professor of you know, history in Delhi University. So she came and you know, with her, because being a daughter of Prime Minister, uh, there were a lot of IAS and IPS officers. And I was explaining the re you know, results, uh, remains that we excavated to her and to her students. And in the background, you know, people were murmuring, mostly the IAS and IPS officers. They said that, you know, what a waste of the national wealth. Why these people have come all the way from Pune and working in a small village in Haryana. So somebody said that maybe there is a wealth buried here. So they have come to dig out that wealth. 
Somebody say that maybe you know, uh, they are just you know, wasting their time and they are wasting maybe the resources of the country. And one very interesting comment came. Somebody said that you know, these people did not get an opportunity to play in the dust when they were children. They are playing now. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I now request you all to have your tea break. I you all to come back after five minutes. nation.
select uh, uh, candidates selected by BB Lab in 1960-70. He was a director general of Archaeological Survey of India. Lal Sahab se me 1982 me mila. To mujhe bahut khushi hui. Matlab bahut bade gentlemen the. Aur mujhe achhi tarah se unhone receive kiya. Aur ek tarikhe se unhone khudai bhi mujhe allot kar di. Professor Lal was a true karma yogi who has inspired. Several young minds to take up archaeology as a profession. Professor Brajdasi Lal, Bharat ke mahan purata to vid to the hi, aur unhone bhot mahatpun kam kia. Isliye Bharat Sarkar dwara padam vibhushan se unko samanit kia. Main apni aur se unko hardik sub kam nae preshit kar raha. He took over the reins of as DG, Director General, the Post Independent India, and contributed immensely. Trained and taught the successive generations of scholars. Professor Brijbasi Lalji, the centenarian living legend of Indian archaeology. In the year 1959, Professor Lal became the first director of the School of Archaeology, where students came from all over Asia, such as Thailand, Nepal, and Afghanistan, to be trained under him. Professor B. B. Lal was the director of the School of Archaeology. So I joined the School of Archaeology in the first batch uh, on the 15th of October 1959. Uh, we were uh, in all nine students. Joining the School of Archaeology was a very unique experience for me to be to be exposed to such a wide range of subjects. Professor Lal also used to take our classes on. डिफरेंट प्रोटो हिस्टोरिक कल्चर्स बेसिकली लाल साहब एक टीचर की तरह पढ़ाते थे हर चीज को और बच्चों को या इस जो भी सुपरवाइजर है या जो भी उनके अधीन काम कर रहा है तो उसको पूरा प्यार देते थे और उनको डिसिप्लिन भी पसंद था इफ यू सी द राइटिंग द राइटिंग देर इज सेवरल बुक्स एंड रिपोर्ट्स इन द नेम ऑफ प्रोफेसर लाल दैट इज द रेफरेंस बुक फॉर अस वी एक्सकेट We publish reports, but these remain confined to the scholarly world. The reports are set up in the libraries, and occasionally, the scholars see them. Research scholars, in particular. I met uh, Professor B. B. Lal Sab in 1976 and 77. At that time, I was in the School of Archaeology. Before that, we heard about him. but did not know much about him because uh, i was a student of history so in history we had a one paper of archaeology so in that paper we have always been hearing about him and especially about his contribution in the excavation at hastinapura between 1951 and 52 professor lal conducted excavations of the key site of hastinapura the excavations at Hastinapur where he mentions in his uh, book that he found uh, painted gravel on a particular side but on the river side he could not find the painted gravel the substantial part of the painted gravel settlement at the site was destroyed by a huge flood in the adjoining ganga so he is wondering why is it so and he kept asking why till you know One o'clock at night, he gets up with an answer. He said, "Let me go and check. Is that possible?" So he went. One o'clock at night, he goes along with Chokidar carrying uh, uh, lanterns and comes to a conclusion that the river must have cut the soil. And the next day, he orders an uh, you know uh, underwater excavation. He goes. deep down 15 meters to find that the painted gravel was there and then linking up with the literature uh saying that uh, at the time of uh, nichakshu there will be a flood and the uh, the capital will shift to uh, koshambi and he cross checks in koshambi and finds that deep down there there are painted gravels all the bit degenerated what he found in hastinapur Field work is always full of challenges of all kinds, so we cannot list them and say this is this, this is this. It requires what it requires actually 
is devotion to your work. You forget everything and jump into it and do it. Unless that is the spirit, you won't succeed. Professor Lal found the evidence for this in the Puranas. When the city of Nagasahvya, that is Hastinapura, is carried away by the Ganga, Nichakshu, the ruler, is said to have shifted to Kaushambi. Our history was written in such a way that they built in the rituals, they built in the traditions, they built in the, the whole environment, the whole universe. And the archaeological finds should be say, linked. That is, otherwise literature will go alone and says, uh, findings will go alone. So if you can link it both, then it becomes very authentic. So, of course, uh, he worked like that only in so this Mahabharata project. The methodology of writing history of our ancient rishis was different. The book Mahabharata is not all about war. War is just a small, not even 20% component out of 1 lakh verses. Not even 20,000 belong to the war. It's a huge tale of every aspect of life. In the year 1954-55, he dug a trial trench and found Indraprastha fortification in the Purana Kila. The remains from the period of Maurya, Sunga, Kushana, Gupta, Rajput were excavated. From the lowest level of painted greyware culture, it confirmed that the Purana Kila is indeed Indraprastha of Mahabharata times. Dr. Lal has done great work in proving that this is when the Mahabharata was done. There are two extremely divergent views about the historicity of the Mahabharata. As an archaeologist, Professor Lal thought that the best way to ascertain the truth might be to explore and excavate sites associated with the Mahabharata epic. Hence, he explored all the sites associated with it, such as Hastinapura, the capital of the Kauravas, Mathura, the birthplace of Lord Krishna, Kurukshetra, where the war was fought and found that they all contained the painted grey ware in their lowest levels, datable to circa 1200 to 800. Kayena Manasa Buddhya Kevalaihi Indriyaihi Api Yoginaha Karma Kurvanti Sangam Tyaktva Atma Shuddhaye Ayodhya was the capital of ancient Siam and even today all the kings are called Rama, Rama the first, Rama the second. Even if you're born Lakshmana, when you become king, you have to change your name to Rama. That is how closely they are associated with the Ramayana. They have integrated their religions much better. For example, in a Muslim Nikah, they have to have the Ramayana, whole dance drama of Ramayana. But you must narrate the story of Ramayana. Don't forget that was the ancient kingdom of Sri Vijaya. For them, they go completely by literature. The next project, namely, archaeology of the Ramayana sites, though conceived while in the survey, could not undertake it, since, as the Director General, almost all his time was taken up by administrative and other allied matters. It was only after voluntary retirement from the survey in 1972, Professor B. B. Lalji could plan to take up this project to begin with at the Jivaji University, Gwalia, and later with full attention at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, 
at Simla. He resigned from his own then. He took voluntary retirement at the age of 55, which nobody would have done at that time. Because he wanted to go back to the, I mean, this college and the university and teach again. So that is what he had done. And by that time, when we met him, he was in the Institute of Advanced Studies. There from he had come as the director of the excavation. And then we had a very I mean, a great opportunity to work under him. The survey helped him in the field work, which ran from 1977 to 1986 which was mostly headed by Sri K.N. Dixit. Under this project, five sites were taken up for investigation. Ayodhya, the capital of the Koshala Kingdom, from where Rama hailed. Sringaverpura, where Rama, Sita and Lakshmana crossed the Ganga in the first lap of their exile. Bharatwaja Ashrama, where the trio stayed overnight to pay their homage to sage Bharatwaja. Chitrakuta, where they stayed for quite some time before proceeding southwards and Nandigrama, from where Bharata carried on the governmental affairs in the absence of Rama. Excavation means you have to work like a laborer. So we did that kind of work there and the result was wonderful. And on the basis of which, you know, the Supreme Court of India, they could solve the problem which has been troubling the mind of India since the last 500 years. So that was conclusion which was drawn by Professor B. B. Lal that in a way facilitated in concluding this one and in helping the Supreme Court of India also to reach a conclusion. His contribution to the victory of dharma and laying the foundations for the rightful construction of the Rama temple through peaceful means will always be remembered. Ramam ki aityasikta mandir aur setu sahitya puratatwa aur anya vijyan ke saak se aapki mahatpoon kritiyo mein sumar hai. Important thing is that he worked in the era where things were not favoring his thoughts. He always had thoughts which were related to Bharatiya Sanskriti, Bharatiya Parampara. But the time in which he was surviving, the wind was blowing against him. There were many who were trying to oppose him, his ideas, his thoughts. He still stood firm on his ideas, on his ideals, on his findings. And that is why we are seeing the revolution in the concept of archaeology. In a way, he in fact revolutionized the whole concept of archaeological studies in India. He taught us archaeology. When I say us, Sushma included, and my mother. My mother accompanied him everywhere. She learned archaeology for him. I call Called, always called her the non-paid uh, uh, technical assistant and she could do anything she could you know uh, make photographs and write down monitor and make out a list of all the artifacts found she was a very great help and I went to Shrikvairpur with my in-laws they are both so simple and they were ready to eat any simple food and live in a very simple way and morning he would go for work and in the, no matter how hot it was, he would be there and afternoon he'll come for lunch and rest a little, again go back for work. So this was his uh, routine. When he had done the excavations, he went right inside the deep excavations that were there done and he started explaining everything. So what did he do for that? आने के बाद उन्होंने बड़ी पिकेक्स जो मजदूर चलाता है वो खुद ले ली वो खुद उसको बड़ी पिकेक्स से काम कर रहे हैं और खुद कर रहे हैं तो शर्म से वो लड़का जो सुपरवाइजर है वो उनसे वो पिकेक्स लेता था फिर वो उनके सामने खोता था जब वो खोता रहता था थोड़ी देर उन्हें देखा अब जो थक गया है तो उसको बोल के कि ये पूरा एरिया तुम करके रखो मैं अभी लौटता हूं इन द डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफ हनुमानगढ़ स्टेट ऑफ राजस्थान कालीबंगन 
has brought to light settlements of mature Harappan times, ascribable to 3000 to 2600 BCE. The agricultural settlement is the earliest ever discovered in an excavation anywhere in the world. In the Rig Veda, there are a number of hymns in praise of Saraswati, such as the famous Nadi Sukta. In the basin of Haryana, Rajasthan, a large number of sites ascribed to various stages of Harappa, also Indus, Saraswati Valley civilization have been discovered. I mean, it's a site in Haryana which is associated with Brahman. I thought if it is so, it must be really painted graveyard. It's a very high mound. We went around the mound, found nothing. There is plenty of water uh, accumulated on the ground, rainwater but no water to drink. We had, whatever little we had taken, we finished it. So we sent Girjaram to nearby place to get some water. Then we went up the mound. I said, let us see what is happening there. And at the top of the mound, there was a well which had stopped giving water. It had dried up. So people were rejuvenating it, taking the silt out uh, so that water may come again. And to our great surprise, we found painted graveyard in that silt. So that is the kind of sacrifice, as you may call it, one has to make for achieving one's end. It's a complete dedication that is necessary for we have found so many more cities on the banks of the river Saraswati thanks to great pioneering archaeologists like Dr. B. B. Lal. He was curious to know why Kalibanga died, civilization died. And to get an answer, he again got uh, Ghagar to be bored by uh, a special team uh, consisting of uh, and led by an Italian. And they came to a conclusion that uh, the river dried up around 2000 BC. And then he realizes that uh, in Rig Ved, uh, the Saraswati River has been mentioned uh, 75 times in a particular mandal. Therefore, if the river was a mighty flowing river, it had to be written before 2000 BCE. And he suggested that it is written in 3rd millennium BCE. You remember what Max Miller said? No one on earth will ever find out when Rig Veda was written. Not just generations. We all ought to thank Professor Brajbasi Lal for his excavations, his reports and his well-reasoned conclusions. He has created a base for interpretation of Indian archaeology. Whatever uh, we are doing, just uh, upper uh, level of that base. His disciples in India today are eminent person, director general of say National Museum or archaeological galleries or director general archaeology. They all are highly placed. They are well established. Let us pray that India produce scholars like him in great quantity so that we change the narrative not only related to India but also related to the entire world with respect to India. आपके द्वारा भारतीय संस्कृति के पुनर्थान में किए गए योगदान से भावी पीढ़ियां सदैव प्रेरणा लेती रहेगी। आपका संपूर्ण जीवन राष्ट्र सेवा को समर्पित रहा, जो सभी के लिए अनुकरणीय है। Professor Lal was bestowed with the third highest civilian award, Padma Bhushan in the year 2000 and the second highest civilian award Padma Vibhushan in 2021 by the Honorable President of India for his seminal contribution to Indian archaeology. Professor Braj Basi Lal, Prax Vigyan. Let 
latest key power doors and windows open so that fresh air may come from outside at the same time we should remain firmly seated in our own tradition Our first session on Civilization Continuity of Harappa will be started by Dr. Sanjay Kumar Manjulji. Before that, I now request Dr. Ramadevi Shekhar to introduce him to everyone. I now request Dr. S.T. Deepa Ma'am to introduce Dr. Sanjay Kumar Manjulji. I am uh, actually gleeful to introduce the guest, Dr. Sanjay Kumar Manjul, Joint Director General in Archaeology Survey of India. He obtained his MA in Ancient Indian History, Culture and Archaeology, Patna University, PhD from Magath University, Bodh Gaya and PG Diploma in Archaeology from Institute of Archaeology. He has discovered and excavated number of sites in the country, such as the quarry come factory site of stone members members of Karapin near Dolavira, Kuch, Gujarat, Adibadri, Yamuna Nagar, Haryana under Saraswati project. He also carried out trial excavation at Ambari Gauhati during his tenure as SA partner circle and excavation branch partner. He conducted excavation at Lathya and trial dig at Sagradit UP, Raj Vishal Garg and uh, sorry, Ra Raja Vishal Kagar Bihar. His outstanding contribution to Indian archaeology is excavation of Binjor in Rajasthan and Sonali Bagbath UP. The finding of Sonali considered as discovery of the century. He is instrumental for conversation and preservation of centrally protected monuments of northeastern states, Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, including World Heritage Sites. He has also contributed for nomination to UNESCO World, UNESCO World Heritage for monuments like Nalanda and several sites in the tentative list. He is also instrumental to development of archaeological museum across the country. More than 20 research papers published in reputed journals and four excavation reports and one book in his credit. He is also an expert member of various universities and institutions such as the member secretary for the advisory committee for multidisciplinary study of River Saraswati, Government of India, expert member Department of Science and Technology and expert member ICHR beside a few others such as Deccan College, National Museum Institute, University of Calcutta, Gurushetra University, Nagpur University etc. Apart from archaeology he is also a known painter and poet. Thank you sir for being a constant support and guidance. Thank you so much and over to you sir. I now request Dr. Ramadevi Shekhar to present Dr. Sanjay Kumar Manjulji with a moment.
to share my uh, experience or some of the views in a prestigious seminar in uh, here. Uh, particularly, Ramadevi uh, called me several times for this uh, seminar. At least you have to participate. Uh, I know uh, I travel uh, her a lot uh, for giving me my abstract and time and also the date uh, because uh, the lot of pressure of officials. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, but yes, I'm happy uh, to be here. Uh, uh, to present uh, some of the new uh, discoveries or uh, new evidences from two sides. Uh, sorry, I, uh, in abstract, I have written only Rakhi Gadi, but now uh, in rethought uh, at night, so I have included some of the uh, uh, slides from Binjor also because. Uh, uh, as the galaxy of scholars are here, so uh, I thought we have to uh, share some of the uh, slides from Binjar also that is also in the similar bed of Saraswati. Second thing, why I am choosing uh, these two sites, the Binjar and Rakhi Gadi, because I know uh, Professor Sinde and uh, Professor Kharagbal both are here. And uh, they will took a whole chronology of Harappan. I know very well. So I don't want to repeat all those things which has already been uh, 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 taken or uh, delivered by Professor uh, Sinde. And uh, maybe uh, in later on, uh, Kharagbal also uh, took all those sequence from right from the discovery and uh, uh, the uh, important features and researches already done in 100 years and more, more than 100 years in uh, Harappan studies. I always think uh, there is several part of study of Harappan uh, archaeology. One is, uh, yes, in the time span, long time span of 100 years or more than 100 years. One is before independence. And after the independence also, there is a lot of shift in uh, the thought process and the researches. And then now, when the lot of technology or a lot of new things introduced in archaeology for multidisciplinary approach, the last uh, 20 years, there is a lot of new ideas or new uh, uh, thoughts come up uh, in Harappan archaeology as well as the relation with the Harappan archaeology in other regional archaeological findings uh, not confined to the core zone of Harappan like uh, as uh, uh, very well uh, narrated earlier by Professor Sinde, uh, the Indus and the Saraswati region, uh, these are the core reason. But apart from the core reason, uh, uh, the Ganga Yamna Doab and then relation with the other areas are uh, also very, very important. So yes, now uh, I'm confined to uh, micro level to um, uh, macro level to micro level and uh, confined to two distinct uh, excavated site, which uh, I have done in excavation particularly in the Saraswati, Diswatwati river. One is Binjor, uh, uh, now uh, renamed uh, after uh, the canal of uh, 4 MSR. And uh, another important site, Rakhi Gadi. Uh, 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 after Binjor, I'll uh, take over uh, to Rakhi Gadi also of a recent finding, which has uh, added the new dimensions or new understanding of Harappan contribution uh, in, uh, to the world. So uh, this, is, this slide is uh, very, very important. If you see uh, the paintings on, uh, on the pottery, particularly from the uh, one is from Binjor, another smaller is from Rakhi Gadi. You can see the whole landscape 
and then uh, uh, in the barricading also all around and the variety of animal and then uh, a, a distinct variety of trees also so that uh, tell many of the things or understanding of flora fauna and also the lifestyles uh, of harappan another slide having a uh, fish and other geometrical pattern so the res natural resources uh, how they have used the natural resources that reflected in the painting also so uh, that's a very very intricate painting uh, found in the pot of uh, uh, from uh, binjor and uh, rakhi gadhi also next uh, can you give uh, uh, this is the uh, very uh, one map only uh, uh, very generalized map uh, for uh, understanding of the distribution which has already been narrated so i don't want to uh, go this is the uh, excavation at uh, Binjor, a uh, very small site, uh, around uh, 150 meters uh, by 150 meters. More, uh, to more than 30% uh, of mound has already been destroyed by the uh, locals uh, uh, creating tanks, etc. So we took some excavation for understanding. The site is located uh, very close to the Pakistan, only five kilometer. Uh, uh, Pakistan in Ganganagar, Anubgar uh, Tehsil. Uh, so it's a very close to uh, Pakistan and uh, this is uh, probably the last site in Indian uh, borderland and after that uh, the Pakistan uh, there is a, a lot of sites in Pakistan also but uh, this is the last excavated site in Indian territory uh, on uh, Saraswati river presently known as a Ghaggar or in Pakistan is the Hakra. So uh, uh, this and why this site is very very important uh, because this site produced many new things or new uh, understanding of uh, Harappan culture uh, particularly continuity of uh, Harappan culture right from 5000 BCE to 1900 BCE there is no gap at all and also uh, important because it's a single mound most of the area having the separate mound of early harappan or mature harappan or uh, sometime uh, yes uh, but the earliest finding right from uh, 5000 bce to 1900 bce with the evidence of uh, uh, dated evidence and also the continuity of seals uh, right from the early uh, level uh, of 3600 around th uh, six, uh, 3600 BCE uh, to uh, uh, 1900 BCE. The continuity uh, of seals, development of seals and development of pottery also. So the transitional phase of pottery is very very important. Uh, the Prabodh is here, they have uh, studies along with me uh, about the pottery. Uh, particularly uh, the whole uh, pottery right from the early level to uh, late level we have the continuity of pottery also and uh, among the most important thing this is the only site having full of industry so uh, more than uh, 250 fireplaces we have recorded uh, among the fire plus uh, places there is different type of hearth kiln uh, etc so i'll show uh, one or two photograph uh, for a better this is the chronology right from uh, uh, early level natural soil to uh, top of the bottom uh, bit dated so if you see the photograph the overlapping of uh, hearth and uh, a lot of hearth. Uh, so uh, within the small trench, you can see uh, the variety of hearth storage uh, overlapped uh, in uh, one each uh, one over over it. So uh, some of the area having uh, bigger hearth for smelting. 
uh, the joint hearth, the hearth with uh, a turret, uh, uh, the elongated yoni shape hearth, rounded hearth, and also hearth for making of charcoal, the pot hearth for craftsmen. So they try to control the heat, uh, uh, making a variety of size and shape of the hearth. So this is very, very interesting finding. In, so yes, the excavation is very, very tedious to expose the hearth uh, and the document uh, each of the hearth. Fortunately, we got uh, uh, evidence of in three hearth, the copper smelting uh, uh, hearth also, uh, some of the uh, copper slag also, and then entire cycle of uh, right from the uh, smelting to reuse, uh, everything is there in this site. So this is the major contribution in Harappan study uh, about the whole process of uh, copper smelting, uh, making of beads, tools, etc. Uh, at the site itself. So see the variety of hearth, uh, the joint hearth, etc. Uh, open kiln. Uh, uh, another interesting finding is fire altar. The similar fire altar uh, reported in Kalibanga also with the octagonal EST uh, in between. Uh, this hearth is entirely different from 250 hearth. The nature of uh, this uh, fire altar and then sediment inside is very, very sticky. Uh, uh, at the site, the other hearth having uh, the different kind of deposition inside. Uh, and then context also, this is just near to uh, the fortification area. So this is another interesting finding uh, at the site. Uh, yes, uh, now uh, the seals. So this is the earliest uh, level seal, uh, the pendant seal. The similar kind of seal uh, found in uh, other site also, uh, like uh, Kunal, we have the several uh, shorter seal, but uh, uh, because uh, the reuse of the seal and they have not found uh, the uh, upper part of the seal, so that called uh, button seal. But actually there is no button seal, all seals are pendant seal of early level. So this is the intact evidence of uh, pendant seal, uh, very tiny, uh, without uh, use of alkali over it. So this is the first seal. Uh, if you see the second seal, this is also a pendant seal having uh, a different animal. One is a turtle, a antelope, a mongoose, a, and also maybe a, uh, the ash or uh, something. So uh, these seals, both both side is very very in, uh, interesting. This is the only seal having this type of uh, uh, depiction in anywhere of uh, reported uh, from. Uh, so this is also a pendant seal, uh, uh, triangular having a, a concentric circle. Uh, this is also a pendant seal. Uh, another seal uh, having very thin. Uh, fabric of uh, geometrical pattern. Uh, this is also geometrical pattern. Boss is coming up, uh, but uh, very uh, not prominent one and uh, very less alkali uh, use on that. Uh, uh, another uh, seal having uh, then uh, a script as well as uh, the unicorn uh, come up. So this is an interesting seal. If you see the unfinished seal, having a half part having al use of alkali and half part uh, uh, without use of alkali because they have uh, discarded this seal. Uh, some maybe uh, problem of uh, writing the wrong writing. So they uh, scratches uh, that writing. So that is the reason one side is uh, thinner and another side having a thicker one. So this discarded because uh, they don't use uh, the impression of uh, from that. So this is a discarded one. The, if you see uh, the boss uh, changing and uh, the thicker one and then uh, another uh, development of seal, see the, uh, the shape of the boss is changed and the shape uh, and thicker one also. 
Then the last phase of the seal is terracotta having only script. So the entire development of seal right from uh, the smaller one to the terracotta seal, uh, uh, the whole chronology is there with dated uh, in the layer. So this is the unique contribution of the site. Uh, all of the site uh, having uh, the early Harappan seal and the mature Harappan seal and all that, but not in the sequence in one site. So this is uh, the contribution of uh, Another contribution of the site, uh, the uh, 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 food balls offered, uh, offering of food balls, uh, having multiple food grains among that. Uh, the paper has published in uh, reputed uh, 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 peer general. Uh, uh, so uh, the along with uh, bull figurine, two bu intact bull figurine. Dish on a stand, the offering uh, of uh, animal uh, flesh, possibly one uh, some bones are also there, and seven football having multiple grains inside. So that is another interesting uh, uh, evidence uh, at the site. Along with that, we found uh, the upsidal having white painted floor and uh, the offering pots having a post firing painting uh, at that. Uh, these are the evidence clearly showed uh, the ritualistic evidence at the site. So this is the uh, uh, actual uh, uh, first of its kind of uh, ritualistic evidence at the site uh, with the scientific uh, uh, evidences. So, uh, so uh, see, uh, uh, whole area, the upsidal one also, the offering pots and uh, these food balls and salt, uh, uh, one uh, very thin uh, seal is also there at uh, the site and two uh, bulls etc. at the same complex at the corner of the site of uh, northeastern area. So this is very very interesting uh, finding. Now come to the Rakhigadi, uh, another site. I don't want to go in uh, in the detail, uh, so I try to just uh, uh, give the glimpse of the new evidences coming up in the sites to add on the Harappan research. Uh, you, we all know the Rakhigadi having uh, several bound uh, at the site, particularly Rakhigadi Khas and Rakhigadi having seven, uh, six mounds and seven one is the burial site, almost the flat land. So burial ground including burial ground having seven mound at the site and the, at the distance of uh, three kilometer and above there is other another site also Loari Rago and all that uh, in uh, satellite area. So uh, the sorry. Uh, if you see the chronology of site right from the discovery and uh, uh, the uh, recent uh, declaration of iconic site, it has the glorious past and uh, 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 Professor Sinde has done a lot of work at uh, Rakhigadi site, uh, uh, particularly in uh, the burial site excavated uh, uh, as, uh, more than uh, 56 uh, burial at the site, including uh, extended burial, symbolic burial, etc., and also done the DNA and uh, facial uh, reconstruction, etc., at the site, uh, uh, and also done uh, some of the excava uh, excavation at various mound, also mound number uh, four and uh, two, uh, to understand the entire chronology, uh, etc. Now, uh, why again the site has been chosen for the excavation? As uh, the early excavator, Dr. Amrin Nath has done the tremendous work at the site, particularly at mound number two, having the entire chronology uh, right from 6000 to uh, uh, 2000 BCE from uh, mound number two that has been uh, published uh, in several journals. 
uh, and uh, Professor Sinde also taken up uh, a large scale uh, excavation at burial site and also uh, uh, some of the excavated trench at uh, mound number uh, two and four uh, and other mounds, mounds also. But still, because site is so big, having lot of potential to understand the settlement pattern which has not been addressed uh, earlier uh, in small excavation like three years, four years, it's not possible to understand the whole area or settlement pattern at the site. And also the problem for understanding the relation of each of the mound. Uh, like uh, very close mound, mound number two and mound number three, what, is, what are the relation of mound number one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's a really uh, difficult, why uh, they have uh, had uh, the several mound uh, at that area. So that is also a very, uh, very interesting uh, 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 and I'm interested to understand uh, the settlement pattern basically. Uh, and other aspect also, uh, which has not been addressed earlier, to add on the work of uh, prof uh, great work of Professor Sinde and Amrain Nath. So I try to add on uh, uh, the new uh, aspects which has not been understood earlier. So uh, these are the, uh, 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 if you see the RGR1, RGR1 uh, we have uh, very much uh, try to understand uh, the street and lanes and uh, both the uh, end of street and lanes. Uh, street also having uh, the whole, whole area of uh, approx 18 meter uh, uh, sector divided uh, at of 18 meter and then cutting of lanes. So it's a very, very systematic uh, uh, settlement pattern and uh, the architectural uh, pattern, if you uh, say, particularly in the mature Harappan phase. But in the early Harappan phase, uh, having the different kind of settlement pattern. So that is not uh, planned as the Harappan's plan, mature Harappan plans in uh, uh, RGR 1, 2, 3, uh, etc. So if you see the street, uh, uh, street of different phase, phase one, two, three, four. So uh, if we, the same thing you can see in uh, this wall also. And uh, the one lane is cutting here, uh, going uh, north-south. And then again lane is cutting here, uh, going north-south. And uh, we have tried to understand the length and uh, then again the another sector is also here, in almost in the same pattern. And then mound number three also having the similar kind of uh, settlement or uh, similar similar kind of uh, planning of uh, uh, the, this sector. So this is a very, very interesting plan uh, of uh, 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 Harappan's made uh, for uh, his uh, settlement. Uh, two uh, things uh, I'll also try to understand if uh, this plan is there, the street is no uh, having very uh, narrow one, uh, not very big, broad. So where they put uh, is uh, bullock cart and cattle, etc. So that is not, uh, there is no space at all the inside of uh, this settlement pattern. Why? because they have planned for the hygienic purpose, maybe uh, along with the fortification, there is a broad area, open area. So they try to uh, put all those things there itself, the cattle, etc. They uh, possibly they don't allow uh, within the a smaller street, uh, the bullock cart and all that for maintain the hygienic uh, uh, system. Possibly, I, I don't know, there is uh, no, concrete evidence yet we have, uh, we try to understand why this type of planning they have done, very close planning uh, uh, in this area. So these are the uh, drawings. Uh, uh, recently, if you see the late phase of a structure, uh, still they have plan uh, of uh, street and all that. Uh, there is open area having the street. Uh, 
this is the lane uh, and uh, another smaller lane is here the house plan the uh, continuous house plan uh, uh, see uh, the street and uh, plan of more number now uh, rgr3 first time uh, we uh, also took excavation at rgr3 which has not been taken up earlier uh, rgr3 fortunately having much much uh, better architecture uh, combined with the burnt brick and also the mud brick so uh, the unique architecture system uh, at uh, I see the street along with the drainage of lined with the uh, brick structure uh, uh, burnt brick structure having mud brick and also the burnt brick structure see the burnt brick structure actually uh, uh, particularly in the street area uh, what they have done they have encased the burnt brick structure along with the mud brick uh, earlier maybe the mud brick structure so they have encased with the burnt brick at the outer lining uh, to uh, uh, stronger or uh, strengthen uh, them the entire structure so uh, these are the view views uh, uh, now uh, recently if you see the well uh, 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 with the wedge shape and also the all around the well how they dug the well and also uh, uh, the drainage uh, pattern see the close view of the, of the smaller well uh, at RGR uh, corner of RGR so uh, the drainage uh, the cover drain you can see the cover drain clear uh, here uh, at the top uh, so this is the unique structure we uh, come across at mount number three probably the double story 32 uh, brick uh, structure uh, from right from the bottom to top having mud brick or uh, uh, structure uh, probably the double story because so long uh, uh, or uh, in elevation uh, you can see here the very very massive structure having plastered uh, mud plaster of almost uh, one inch thick plaster uh, over it so that is the reason the plaster uh, because of the plaster they survive uh, a long uh, duration another interesting finding of uh, unique finding or this added uh, the glory of uh, uh, not only the Rakhi Gadi but the Harappan uh, civilization that's a, a structure like stadia it's a huge structure uh, around uh, 60 meter long north south uh, possibly estimated uh, area uh, I can say and uh, 20 meter uh, breadth uh, having a 40 degree 14 degree inclination and 1.75 uh, around one step so this is the stepped structure uh, for the public and then similar nature of a structure we come across in the mount number two and in between a huge area like Rangabhumi which has been uh, found at uh, Dhalavira the very very similar kind of structure but the step we have uh, here which has not been found in Dhalavira so this is the unique example of uh, stadium or open space for the multi-purpose for the public uh, uh, performance or we can say Rangabhumi much much earlier than uh, the Romans and the other have done this so this is the earliest example of uh, the stadia uh, we can say uh, uh, here uh, these are the uh, some of the view I, uh, I think the video is not playing here uh, oh because they have uh, a copied only presentation so uh, all those video is also there in uh, the link with the pres presentation see uh, uh, some of the structures here uh, 
my teacher, my mentor, uh, Dr. R. S. Beast, has already been visited uh, and uh, devoted two two days there, and uh, they testified that yes, you have uh, truly identified that this is the stadium. So they confirm uh, this uh, discovery of uh, stadium also. Uh, this is the uh, another interesting series of hearth at the uh, uh, in open area. So we have uh, a very good evidence. Uh, it's yet to be determined why this series of hearth is here. So uh, uh, it's a uh, next next year task for understanding of this. This is the modern burial. Uh, another interesting finding at uh, uh, RGR seven, uh, which is a bur burial ground. Uh, 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 where uh, already excavation is uh, done by uh, Sindesar. We have excavated two, two burial there uh, at the same ground, just uh, 20, uh, 20 meter away from that area, which has been excavated earlier. It's a just uh, integrated part of uh, the earlier excavation also. Uh, the similar kind of burial we have also uh, uh, recorded or uh, unearthed here. But uh, interestingly, uh, below the burial, we got uh, more than two meter deposit of habitation area. That's an early Harappan deposit. One upsidal is also there. And then lowest level, we got uh, the sacrificial, probably sacrificial pit uh, containing animal bones, charred animals, uh, animal bones in uh, lowest le uh, level of uh, this area. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the video is not there. Uh, the lower level, we got the huge pit uh, in this area. And also uh, see the another level, uh, the hearth, another level also hearth. Uh, this is upsidal area below this. So you can see the various levels in this burial ground. So this is the entirely uh, different understanding why uh, the mature Harappans have done the burial here uh, if uh, earlier deposits are here. Probably uh, the very nearby we uh, also trace uh, the uh, uh, paleo deposit of paleo channel with geological survey of India. They have done the coring uh, nearby uh, around uh, 300 meter away from this area. Uh, possibly uh, the early Harappan abandoned this area including mound number 6. Uh, both, both the area they have abandoned here. Uh, and after some time uh, uh, the, the burial, mature Harappan people, uh, they have done the burial here. So uh, this is the probably uh, interpretation of that. So this is another interesting understanding of uh, Rakigadi and the resettlement, uh, re-understanding uh, of all those uh, area. Uh, these are the uh, one copper mirror also uh, found in the uh, burial, it's very small. Mm. See uh, the extended burial having offering of pots uh, the closer view of uh, below the burial you can see the hearth and uh, uh, deposit. Another interesting area the lower level probably having pit dwelling. It's a, uh, it's a very difficult to understand in a very smaller area because it's a, almost a last day of the excavation. But uh, the, I'm noticing that uh, the lower level probably having pit dwelling. So uh, in this year, we try to uh, be the horizontal uh, some area to understand whether this area also having the pit dwelling like uh, Birana and other Kunal and all that. So this, this is the uh, probably the earliest deposit uh, of uh, this entire area because we have uh, very stratified uh, the mature Harappan burial, then early Harappan deposit and then below this area probably the pit dwelling. So this is uh, the added uh, one. See uh, the black line 
on that. This is on the natural soil. These are the pottery found in the early, early level uh, uh, over the pit dwelling. Uh, so see uh, the pottery mostly uh, slow wheel, uh, handmade also uh, uh, of early Harappan uh, level. So uh, this is uh, the interesting pottery found in uh, just over below the uh, burial and uh, over the pit dwelling. In the pit dwelling, we have very tiny shirts, one or two, uh, uh, nor, uh, so we have to understand again uh, this area. So, uh, uh, yes, you, you can handle there. Okay, now uh, another interesting uh, finding uh, at uh, Rakhi Gadi. Uh, new additions of that. So very close to mound number six, we have a large area having uh, the pottery, a spread of pottery and deposition also in the field. So uh, I have given uh, mound number six one because I don't want to break the chronology which has already been uh, named uh, of Rakhi Gari seven, six and all that. So I have given uh, six by one at that area and we took uh, some uh, trial dig also. Why we have taken the trial dig here? Because we got a copper harpoon uh, at, uh, in this uh, area. So this copper har harpoon, I think uh, Sindesar also, uh, also uh, seen uh, earlier uh, copper harpoon is this area. So I tried to took uh, some uh, excavation to understand the chronology why the copper harpoon here which is uh, identical to the Ganga or Gang upper Ganga Yamna Doab area of uh, copper hoard uh, uh, deposit along with the uh, OCP etc. Next. Uh, uh, so there, uh, there is some stratification uh, at uh, that uh, area. Uh, we got a lot of pottery. Uh, next. Huh. These are the pottery uh, at the site, uh, very close to uh, the OCP pottery. If you see the fabric, color, and texture, and shape also, these are the OCP pottery. So uh, uh, probably uh, the OCP people also occupied a separate mound uh, we, uh, uh, from Harappans. So these are the additions uh, we have at the site. Next. Uh, this is the harpoon uh, we got. Interestingly, uh, we try to understand uh, whether this type of finding earlier also from Rakhi Gadi. So we uh, uh, contacted uh, Jajar Museum and interestingly from Narnod, very close to uh, the Rakhi Gadi, uh, they have uh, bought a horde of uh, a harpoon or and uh, other weapons from that area itself. And then local people also testified that even in the Rakhi Gadi, the same field, they have found uh, a lot of uh, hoard of this and uh, that uh, gone to the Darnod and they uh, uh, sold, sold out uh, by the uh, different peoples. So yes, uh, probably in that area, because the Narno or the another area, there is a lot of finding of copper hoard and OCP. This area is very uh, close and connected with it, this area. So this is another uh, addition of continuity, probably continuity or sometime maybe the overlapping. We don't know uh, without the dates and, uh, but this is the added understanding of Rakhi Gadi. Next. Uh, uh, yes, next. Uh, these are the uh, antiquities, variety of antiquities you can see from Rakhi Gadi and other site also very identical to Harappan site of everywhere, either in the Binjor, Kaliwanga and other site. Next. Uh, uh, some of the antiquities found, you can see the cutting marks also in the estritite bead. Uh, uh, and uh, lapis and carnelian, edged carnelian, the micro beads, etc. found from the site. Next. 
these are fish hook and the copper, other copper object and implements. Next, uh, the gold also, the copper mirror, uh, uh, and then gold uh, probably at the part of the fillet. Next, uh, uh, shell uh, objects and gold object, fiance. Next. Uh, the, uh, some of the sealing and seals also uh, we got in the excavation. Earlier excavation, uh, we have uh, a lot of seals there. Uh, by Sindesar also uh, having lot of seals in the excavation and Nats are also having. We also got uh, some of the, uh, the above you can see the ceiling. Uh, elephant ceiling, beautiful elephant ceiling and uh, some of the uh, terracottas, a variety of terracottas. Uh, next, uh, graffiti marks, next, uh, the variety of pottery, next, uh, variety of pottery you can see the painted one also, next, uh, next. You all know uh, the pottery, Harappan pottery, etc. I don't want to go into <laughs> the deep. Next, uh, thank you uh, because it's a, a wheel is always churning uh, for new evidences. Uh, and also, if you want any uh, questions and any query, I'm happy to uh, answer it. Actually, um, basic concept is same. The basic concept of making of the public a space uh, of a sitting arrangement for the uh, public or the performance or the open space for uh, 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 the performance. Uh, uh, the visitors uh, always told this is the Rangabhumi having the performance uh, area. Uh, for that. The similar kind of concept uh, is there in uh, Rakhi Gadi uh, probably, uh, but the Rakhi Gadi having both side uh, steps in mount number 2 and mount number 3 also. In between there is open space. So uh, the clear cut, uh, the stepped structure uh, shows that uh, this is a very, very interesting uh, public space uh, for the uh, performance uh, or uh, uh, different kind of bazaar or some maybe uh, uh, the different concept. And also this open space is linked for, uh, for the very strategic location of uh, this estate, yeah? the mount number 2, 3, 4 and 1 all together combined in between uh, to cater this space. So the location is very, very important. Uh, uh, of uh, this area. So yes, uh, the concept is same uh, as uh, in Dhalavira, uh, the Rakhi Gadi also having the similar concept. This also shows uh, the urban uh, concept of Rakhi Gadi, not rural concept because finding of mud bricks uh, always uh, be denoted that uh, maybe the rural concept of uh, those things, but uh, this is really a urban phenomena. Thank you. In the last season on RGR3, you formed a long wall. Uh, Dr. Shinde Saab also had come at that time near the Dargo, not just below the Darga, and uh, beautiful with superb bricks, and they look so fresh. Have you deduced the purpose of that long wall? Of course, it's a, uh, actually, uh, as I told in mount number one also, having uh, the very good street along with the uh, both sides having house plan. The similar kind of planning uh, at mount number three is also there. Uh, Sanjay, a um, couple of suggestions. Yes, sure. Uh, there might be a stadium, but uh, at this stage, better not to jump into conclusion. Because still you have to have some conclusive evidence for that. There's a possibility that you can say 
as far as the uh, ocp is concerned i think there is no ocp near you know near in that area area so far so just you know you have to identify whether that is a regional maybe a variation of the early harappan pottery that also you know uh, try to find out that and uh, i have seen the uh, harpoon and uh, i have also visited jarjar the gunny pool of uh, harpoons in fact and they say that they came from this so i think unless uh, because i have not used that because unless we find this in proper context perhaps it is difficult to use that at this particular stage so this is the just a suggestion for you thank you thank you sir i have a small question uh, both for you and professor sinde uh, do we have do we have in rakhigadi uh, citadel area uh, do we have you know uh, fortified uh, fort wall for the mounds do you have these features you know otherwise this seems to be completely different kinds of uh, kind of you know uh, settlement uh, at uh, rakhigadi uh, you know comparing to other harappan sites otherwise can you keep the mic so this is this is otherwise you know not not the monotony so can you comment on that see i think you know uh, you cannot compare rakhigadi with uh, harappa mohenjodaro or dolavira because those sites are very distinct and there is no you know hi human interference there as such so ragigadi you know maybe two third of the site is under occupation you know a lot of people are living on that so uh, at this stage you know it is very difficult to say now this part is a citadel that part is a lower town this is very difficult to say that but uh, certainly you know as far as the fortification is concerned amrinath when he excavated he has reported you know the part of the fortification there so i am sure that you no know, for a site like ragigadi there may be you know a fortification because of the uh, maybe you know, human interference because of the lack of you know proper preservation perhaps we are not able to you know detect that at this particular stage secondly you know most of the structures bearing a few structures they are made of mud bricks so there is lot of erosion happening on that so you know they are not uh, because they are not made of burnt bricks they are not preserved the way they should have been maybe he can add in that sure uh, <coughs> it's a really very i am also searching the same as you go uh, uh, but interestingly at a uh, mount number 1 also uh, possibly the enclosure area is also there of a uh, mud uh, rampart we try to understand uh, the smaller area and we find that uh, maybe the enclosure is there the mud uh, rampart at mount number 1 uh, as far as mount number 3 is concerned the massive structure coming up in uh, the outer area uh, at uh, the entire site uh, along with uh, the stepped structure uh, uh, interestingly stepped structure also having a mud brick and burnt brick also they have repaired a uh, several time particularly age of the uh, uh, step they have put uh, burnt brick sometime to repair uh, those area so there is a lot of burnt brick also they have used to retain the step so it's a very very interesting part in uh, mount number 2 uh, the nath sir uh, has reported uh, the long wall uh, at uh, almost top of the mound but that wall actually the wall the inclination of uh, towards uh, the ceremonial so called ceremonial ground uh there is a step structure so we have exposed a little area to understand whether the similar kind of uh, arrangement uh, were there or not so we found the similar kind of step there itself at mount number 2 also but unfortunately most of the area uh, either uh, cut by the rain or by the trench itself in the early excavation because if you uh, a step anywhere you can find uh, around 60 meter there is no gap of brick there is no gap in in the section also 5 meter so they have made the solid structure they have not made uh, the uh, only encasing at the top so entire uh, structure in the elevation also a solid one of 5 meter at the height so such a massive structure 
why they have made such a massive structure in a stepped fashion. So uh, yes, uh, come to the conclusion. Uh, that is the reason I first I told uh, a stadia type structure for the public purpose, possibly. Possibly it's a, a earliest stadia of the world. As far as the outer fortification is there, the land use is entirely changed. So it's uh, very difficult to find, uh, find out uh, the outer fortification of uh, that area. But certainly uh, it's a possible that the, each of the mound also having the enclosure wall or mud rampart. Thank you. Except the burial mound, all other mounds are contemporary? Uh, yes, uh, interestingly mound number uh, one uh, having uh, ar uh, early Harappan deposit also around 7 meter deposit, uh, 7.5 meter deposit uh, mound, mound number one but uh, not that type of pottery we got in uh, below the burial that type of pottery is not there. So maybe the mound number one uh, settlement come up later than uh, that area of mound number 6 and uh, mound number uh, 7 uh, the b below the burial area. Mound number 6 also having uh, the early uh, pottery. Uh, this mound probably come up around uh, 3000 BCE uh, etc at mound number 3 but mound number 2 some of the part and mound number 6 and mound number 7 may come up early than this area. So that is the reason I, uh, I try to understand this, uh, the whole Rakhi Gadi uh, is the largest early Harappan uh, mound. Harappan mound may be shrinking, but the largest area occupied by the early Harappan itself. Because of the planning of the Harappans, they have shrinking the area. Uh, uh, in the forti fortified area. So they have uh, shrinked uh, uh, the whole area. So some of the area abandoned like mound number 6 abandoned uh, in early Harappan uh, level itself or little bit of flimsy deposit of uh, uh, mature Harappan. Uh, the mound number 7 uh, uh, also abandoned and used later on as a burial. So these area abandoned and then confined to the mound number uh, 4 three, uh, two and one uh, itself. Okay, thank you. I request you all to have your lunch break. Back after 30 minutes.
want before the, I thank them all. Next slide, please. Now, uh, Professor Shinde made it easier for me that uh, explained that Indus Saraswati is basically the same as what we call Harappan civilization or Indus Valley civilization. As well as uh, uh, Professor Shinde said 200 sites, my record says only 1600 settlements have been found so far. Well, we really don't know exact number of the sites which have been found in India and Pakistan. Uh, the, they, the culture, the Harappan civilization is separate to 80,000 uh, square kilometers in South Asia and it is the twice the site, uh, size in uh, uh, twice the size of the Egypt and Mesopotamia. Current studies which have been carried out on the transition between the two early urban civilization of India claim that there is no significant break or height as this is perhaps next slide please. <coughs> Now briefly, subsistence, what we see that major subsistence items during the early historic period had already been cultivated and domestic during the Harappan phase, various types of cultivation uh, process in the show, the Kalibangan uh, plowed, plow share as well as this. Now basically, I'm just skipping these. Then the, what, what we have, they, we have various types of wildlife, which they, they, it had, they have been used for food, so at least some of the plants have, as well as the fish. So, <coughs> next. Shindesar also showed us the uh, transportation during the Harappan times. You, you, can, you have seen that unfired cetatite seal from the Mahanjadaro and similar in the Indus sites in the, near Mahanjadaro in, on the Indus bank. We still have these flat, bay, flat uh, boats. And then Mandavi, uh, he also mentioned about Mandavi. Uh, the, the, we have the present day uh, build, it is boat ma made at Mandavi during that time. The various types of uh, Harappan carts, you can see the black cart. In the, and then what we see in, in the last one <coughs> is the uh, flat frame chases of uh, black carts from Punjab, present day Punjab. So we see similarity a lot. Now what you see the boat here is, the, is what was reconstructed by on the basis of what they have found in Oman, the the reed boat with the with the with the vitamin <laughs> applications. So they try to reconstruct it by the Italian team and this uh, the Italian team and the French team. Next time, please. We see also this again. He suggests about the similarity between the various shapes. Continue. We see these carinated vessels in metal as well as in the pottery. Then we see these thalis or what we call the plates. Uh, we see the, a lot of continuity in the shapes even today. We find a lot of continuity in these things. Next slide, please. Uh, the industrial debris left by the artisans are uh, very important material, sorry, very important material for, uh, for basically the waste of the uh, production is very important for understanding the various crafts. And I will be talking about shell working now. I will, I will not be touching all the crafts which Harappans have talked about. I will definitely confine myself to the shell working and the bead making, stone bead making. And then, unfortunately, earlier excavation never took uh, interest in the manufacturing waste. And recently, the, this, uh, this study of the manufacturing waste has helped us a lot to understand these industries. Next slide, please. Uh, this is very important. Uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, well, uh, results from the uh, excavations of uh, in Gujarat, uh, the the shell associated with the <coughs> shell associated with the early Harappans. We have a lot of shell. Uh, Gujarat was a hub of shell ba bangle manufacturing during Harappan times. But now we have evidences the shell was used uh, for making <coughs> bangles. Uh, this is the work of uh, Rajesh. Uh, who is here, and then uh, the associated with the burials. Then uh, Dr. Uh, <coughs> Professor Ajit Prasad's uh, site also, the Bengals associated. Well, like, I, do, I won't be able to say much about these sites because I have not studied the material. We, we should give some time for to Ajit Prasad and Rajesh to study and present this very important uh, in the, well, of this industry for, of early Harappan in Gujarat. Next slide, please. Now, uh, basically, what we see in the Harappan times, we have three types of shell was used for making both the tribunal of Iron, you see, and then the bangles. It was used for, exclusively used for making bangles. Pigulina vesicle is another shell which was also used for making bangles. Chakoris ramosis was used for making bangles as well as the ladles or spoons, shell spoons. 
And <coughs> facially trapezium has been worked, found from the Sindh sites. It was used for making LA pieces. But in Gujarat, though the, the shell was collected, but it was never used for making anything. Next slide, please. Maybe it was meant to be sent elsewhere. Now, this is a site uh, in Gujarat where we have a shell manufacturing workshop. What you see here, I think what you see in the center there, you see a shell box in which 5,000 shell circlets were kept. That was unfinished bangles were kept. And, and nearby there is a, a grinding stone on which the bangles would have been ground before they were supplied to the person who had needed it. And <coughs> next slide, please. What is important that uh, how the shell was made into bangles. Briefly, the first apex is broken to make it hollow from inside by putting the chisel inside. And then it is cut diagonally into various circlets. And what is important is the, is the type of saw which was used for grind, well, sawing these uh, shell. It is a present day or even up to 80, 1980, the shell was uh, uh, cut at Bengal by a convex saw. You can see the convex saw, a denticulated convex saw. And the study on the, on the manufacturing waste of the Harappan period shell artifacts indicate the type of the saw was perhaps very similar to what we have in present day Bengal. Next slide, please. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> then further, once they are cut into diagonals, they are, they are further ground to make the finished bangle internally as well as outside and the finished bangles. And such bangles you can see, you, this is the famous uh, dancing, so-called dancing girl, and the present day how these, you, a, girl, a woman in Gujarat, how they wear the bangles. But they, of course, what they wear now today is the plastic bangles. Next slide, please. Chakoris Ramosus was, as I told you, was used for making bangles. This is the bangles from Chakoris Ramosus, as well as the grooved bangles. Uh, this is what, not grooved bangles, but then this uh, ladle, a spoon which was made from this Chakoris Ramosus. Uh, as I told you, facially trapezium, though it was used for making inlay pieces in, in sin, sites in the Sindh, but not, it has been collected by the fishermen uh, in Gujarat during Harappan times, but it was never utilized at the site. Next slide, please. Uh, this is how the ladles, uh, a brief reconstruction of how the ladles were made, how the bangles were made, or what type of waste is associated with the bangle manufacturer, ladle manufacturer. The top you see, uh, the, that is the bangle manufacturer. Here the difference, only difference is that the shell is not perforated from the top, but it's perforated from the below. And the, what you get, you get these apex portions. They don't have, the, the, the apex has not been removed from them. And the base portions, and that was used for mangle. While you see the next one photograph below, that's the wasters from the ladle manufacturing, where the diagonally it was cut, two shell, Two uh, ladles were manufactured out of these two, uh, <coughs> two one uh, Chakoris Ramo shell. Sec next, please, please. There was a lot of recycling going during our Harappan times. The, uh, the, uh, the epic, this uh, columnar portion of the uh, Chakoris Ramo, this uh, Tribunal Param, was further worked into make small uh, rings, the rings for the hand as well as for the toes. You can see there. And what is important here, not the, these rings, what is important that they were, they were made by using a tribular drill. A tribular is, is a drill which has a tube and it is drilled to make it hollow. This tribular drill, next slide please. You will see this again in the, <coughs> this is a, a Rajan, Professor Rajan's work uh, from <coughs> early historic period, where you see the same type technique was used on stone, of course, to make the rings, and same type of drill, same type of uh, tribular drill was used. And the lady who is seeing here, there, who is using the tribular drill, even even today, very recently, up to very recently, in Khambat, this type of <laughs> drills were used, but now they, they, they have changed slightly. They, now the drill moves on the electric motor. It's not a hand drilling. Next slide, please. <coughs> Again, uh, what is important that uh, we have in Harappan times as well, you see that uh, next to that photograph, <coughs> we have that circular impression. This is a sharpener. The, the drill gets 
blunt quite often. That has to be sharpened. So you have these type of, and in Harappan times, like I found one of the publications at Rangpur, we have the same type of drill marks there. That means that, is, that was used for sharpening the drills. Next slide, please. <coughs> Now these shell cones and the bangles as well as ladles were meant to be sent elsewhere. You will see that a lot of the material has gone to Mesopotamia. And these shell, these, uh, shell uh, <coughs> columnulas were also sent to, uh, sent to uh, Mesopotamia in order to make the such cylindrical seals out of shell. Of course, cylinder seals are not found in Harappan context, but they definitely had sent it because Tribunal of Pyram is not found in, in that Mesopotamia area. So they definitely have gone from India to Mesopotamia. Next slide, please. Uh, they, <laughs> the Harappans made very simple, uh, simple bangles with very simple decoration. A wee mark was made on this uh, there. But they decorated the inlay. They, they definitely decorated the inlay. But then later on, you find in the later early historic period, the bangles were made more decorative. A lot of floral motifs were made on it. But the technique of manufacture, looking at the cut marks, study of the cut marks on the manufacture base indicates the tape, same of type of saw. Of course, the saw would have been now by iron, not the copper like Harappan times. So they have made these <coughs> early historic bangles. Now, to even today, Bengal, in Bengal, we have this tradition, a married woman has to wear a, a, a shank bangle. And you see, they have changed. My friend who studied the shell industry of Bengal long in, in the early 80s, now that time they used the convex saw, but now they use a motor. Uh, you see the first photograph there. They use the electric powder motor to cut the shell rather than convex axis. Next slide, please. Now coming to the, this was a brief about the shell making in Harappan times. You see the continuation, even the continuation of the Harappan tradition, even early Harappan tradition down to today that the, the same technique was used for making the bangles. <coughs> now bead making, actually we have the uh, earliest bead in India is from Patne in Maharashtra, which can be dated to 24,000 BC on asterisk eggshells. Roundabout, we have also the uh, <laughs> indication of bead making to the Neolithic period from Mehrgarh, but we have also the evidence of necklace made of unfired and fired uh, statite beads uh, from 2800 to 2700 BC from Naosharo, which is very close to Mehrgarh. Next slide, please. Now, <laughs> for bead making, the first, the first stage is to collect the raw material. So usually, <laughs> this is in Gujarat, most of the material, a good quality carnelian, which is, it comes from the Miocene deposits of Bawagore Hills. Bawagore Hills are on the banks of Narmada. And usually, they, once they are dug out from, a pit is made, the, the nodules are dug out, and they are checked for the they are checked for the quality, what type of material they are collecting. They don't want to transport everything to the site. So they check it for the quality and by taking a window out of the nodule. So if it's a good quality material, then they will ship it. If it is not, they will discard it near the mines. So what happens around the mines, that there is a lot of <coughs> flakes which have 100% cortex and a lot of bad quality material, which is not to be extra-exported. So, by looking at such patterns, perhaps we will be able to identify the, 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 the mining areas. <coughs> Next slide, please. And then once it reaches the site where the things have to be made, usually uh, big uh, merchants purchase the raw material and they stockpile it around, their, uh, <coughs> around that area or around their houses and segregate them on the basis of raw material. What you see is the present day st stockpile of at Khambat where the material has been segregated on the basis of what type of material it is. And similarly, we have segregation of raw material, jasper actually, uh, <coughs> onyx and jasper. Uh, material got segregated at one of the Harappan sites excavated by our department in Gujarat uh, known as uh, <laughs> known as Bagasra. Yes, and this is the raw material which is uh, in the form of a jasper, with the type of material we find here is just 80 kilometers from the site. Next slide, please. Now, uh, this jasper, the material, it doesn't need much 
really. But the, what is important is the, to make a carlinian bead. It is not carlinian bead which is important, but it is the size. If it is a bead which is, which is very large, so for that it demands certain things. The nodule has to be very large. It has to be red. And you don't get such big nodules quite often. But this is in present day, what you say, the good quality nodules today uh, in Khambat, where the bead making is carried out even today, the good quality raw material is dried for six months on the rooftop so that nobody can steal it. They cannot put it in the ground. So the good quality material is dried on the rooftops, while the entrepreneurs, those who are not very careful about bead making, they dry them anywhere. They do. There is no such segregation of drying the things. So first important thing of bringing this nodule is to get the relieve the water which is trapped in the rock so that, next slide please. Next stage of it is to uh, take the nodules that are heated in special containers for three hours, uh, sorry, one day or three days depending on the how much time it's got. The first heating usually is carried out in order to relieve the moisture inside the nodule so that it is easier to flake. And this easier to flake, it developed in Mesolithic period quite earlier than uh, when it was used. But then second important for uh, important function of this uh, is, is, the, is to get, get the red color. So it's not in one go that you get the red color. It is the various stages or uh, various stages of heating has to be carried out in order to turn. Some turn quickly, some turn takes many heatings before they are turned red. Uh, you can see the, uh, the type of pots, and this is a next slide, please. I don't want to go into length there. These are some of the bead ruffles from uh, Shikarpur, one of the sites which was excavated by. We believe that the technique which was used for making blades was what we call inverse indirect percussion technique. Uh, you can see the person who is making the at beads at Khambat and how it is done today. <laughs> next slide. Not all materials are to be chipped, like what I, why inverse indirect percussion. Certain materials don't stand chipping, so they have to be cut. So, like uh, you can see the amzonite. Amzonite is not good material which can be chipped, so it, they have to be cut by saw, the type of experimental saw on the top. And we believe it's not this type of saw which I have illustrated here. It was a wire saw, a simple wire which was used for cutting this. And then there's another uh, stone which has been cut by a wire, copper wire saw. Next slide, please. <clears throat> if you want to make a long blade, if you want to make a long bead, first, as I told you, there is a limitation that not many, not many <coughs> nodules are very large. So it has to be very few. Actually, the person who purchases the, in Khambat, who is to purchase lakhs of rupees, the raw material, out of that he would mail 100 long beads. Not more than that. Rest was smaller beads. So the long beads, like what we see in the Harappan times, the long carnelian beads, they must have been very limited and very like, time consuming because they have to be chipped first, chipped sawn, that you can see the second one. This is from Chandadaro, and uh, th that is to be sawn, then second chipped, uh, second uh, after they're sawing, they chip it again uh, by uh, pressure technique. And then the third, the last one, the last below, is the semi-ground, it is ground, and then finally, this is similar to what is this, these, these long bead making in Khambat, in, in Harappan times, is very similar to what they used to do some years ago to produce the chassay. Chassay is a long bead there. As I told you, not more than 150 they would make, but we have found in Harappan times huge, huge belts of this. Next slide, please. A second stage after chipping, it is a grinding. You can see the beads start to be ground. Uh, the photograph I have shown is from a grinding stone from the bead workshop at Dolavira. You can see the grooved stones which have been used. Uh, we have experimented with that grooved stone to how the grinding could have been done. But the polishing was not done. The polishing was done on an instrument like this where the wheels of copper and the leather were used for polishing the beads, while nowadays they use the electric mowing uh, various wheels to polish and also grind the beads. Next slide, please. Drilling, very important drilling. 
you can see the drill which was used by the Harappans. I will show the slide of the drilling. Uh, the, the drilling was carried out by various stages. It was number of drills to perforate a long bead. It's not only a single go, single drill which will drill. It was, you can see the SEM below. There are many multiple drills which have been used to drill the whole thing. And this is the modern chassis. Uh, ma made at the Khambat these days, and they are drilled in one go in terms of, but again, multiple drills uh, <coughs> by a diamond drill. Next slide, please. This is the type of instrument which is used nowadays at, the, at Khambat. <coughs> but in Harappan times, they use it, they use a diamond, double diamond drill to drill the beads, which is much faster, quicker. And, but then in Harappan times, we see these type of drills were used. The diagram below indicates how the drills were made. And the, we presume that, that the technique was similar what is to made, made in Harappan times. And the, what you see above the drills uh, of various uh, carlelian other materials, they were used for softer material like shell, maybe amazonite, and many other soft materials, or maybe even for uh, lapse lozily. <coughs> to drill the holes. But for long carlinian beads, it was this type of drill, what we call Ernestry drills, were used for make, drilling the beads. Next slide, please. And then as I told you, finally, many multiple heatings have to go into making a bead. It's not one go that you will turn them red. Yes, first, is, it is simply to remove the moisture, but later on, the heating cycles are repeated in order to make the red. Next slide, please. And such beads, such shell was meant to be imported. You can see the, some of the carnelian, long carnelian beads from Brahmaman. And you can see the SEM which has been taken <coughs> off of one beads, indicating the same technique of making be drills. This is the Ernestrite drill, what you see in the below. Then you can see these uh, shell bangles, as well as ladles, as well as the cones, which have reached up to <coughs> a long distance travel up to Oman. Uh, uh, no, sorry, of the Mesopotamia, some of the other artifacts which are Harappan origin found, found in the, uh, <coughs> in the uh, Arabian area. Next, next slide, please. The bead making continued during the Harappan times. This is a late Harappan site in Gujarat, and you see the bead making is, but now the long carlin beads are gone. It's very small beads which have been, because I don't know what happened to between that they perhaps lost the technique, and then we really don't know where the beads were in later upon period were produced. There is not a site like Bagasara for later upon where the beads were made, though, whatever it will be the reason, but then we know that the bead, beads continue to be made during this time. Next slide, please. This is from, again, from K. Rajan's work, early historic period in South India, where we have this huge bunch of rough-outs, bead rough-outs he has from, and the grinding stone nearby, which is very similar to grinding stones which were used in Khambat, say, maybe 100 years ago. They don't use it now, but then similar type of <coughs> grinding stones are found. Uh, these are some of the early historic beads from, uh, from Orissa. Next slide, please. The study uh, a site nearby Khambat, which is six kilometers from Khambar, known as Nagra. Uh, here what we have, the study of the beads have indicated that is the first time in early centuries of Kitchen era that we see the use of diamond drill, like what we see today, that the same diamond drill is used, as well as the development of bag polishing. It was hand polished earlier, now it is a bag polishing. Bag polishing means mass production. Now they could polish the beads in one go, hundreds of beads. You can see the person uh, there, the beads are kept in that uh, leather bag and then rolled for 21, 22 days so that they get the polish of it. <coughs> Next slide. Uh, this is the SEM from the Rajan's work where he has indicated, shown that the diamond roll had developed by then, which is still con is continued today. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Any questions, please? Yeah, please. No, you showed us pictures of uh, Dr. Rajan's excavation at Kodumadan. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was there for several seasons when he excavated it. One of the Sukhran excavated it. So you showed us the pictures of uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, two big dash of uh, shells, full fetch conch shells. Oh, I don't know about, see, I have these dips, they, what I have used, the slide, his slides I have used is from one of his lectures. Yeah. I have not read. 
uh, whether you I have I know I know that you have a huge catch of shell which is not trabezna pyrum which is uh, facially trapezium whether it was used to there for bagel making or not I'm not very sure. No, your pictures are genuine, no problem. But uh, what I want to know is like say uh, Dr. Ajit Prasad's uh, Shikarpur and Bagalsar, he also found huge cache of uh, full fetch conch shells. Yeah. No, no, it must have been out the Tamil Nadu coast. I'm sure it has not it has not come from such a long distance here. It has been because they it is a shell which is a different species. Harappans never used it for making bangles. But if it is used in a historic way to make bangles, I'm not sure. If it was used there, I'm not very sure. Yes, I, I have seen the photograph where they have a huge catch of these facial atrophism uh, shell. Early Harappans made bangles, but very simple. I think Harappans made the bangles of shell, which were very simple, having a simple decoration of V mark, nothing more than that. During early historic period, they became very decorative. The floral designs were made, geometric designs were made. They became early historic period everywhere. They became very, but in Harappan times, no, they never decorated the bangles so profusely as what we find in in early days. For Vadnagar, uh, it is an early historic site, and then the, the basically the raw material they have collected from Gujarat only, particularly run of. Uh, there are two bays like Poshitra and Pindara, where the sea is shallow, and during the high tides, the raw material, the sh complete shells, were brought to the shore, and they have collected such uh, shells uh, <coughs> during the even. Uh, early historic period and so most of the stuff gone to Vadnagar they are from the two bays of uh, Little and of Kutch. So that is the, because that is the only source from where the shell uh, raw material in the form of turbine of iron uh, they have gone there. I'm done. Good. Thank you, sir. I now request Dr. Ramadevi Shekhar to present the memento. I now request Dr. Ramadevi Shekhar to introduce Professor Vishwas Rao Sonavani, retired professor, MS University. I feel it honor to have you, Professor Sonavani, here, who will be giving our valedictory address also. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invite. Prof uh, professor is uh, retired from the direct, uh, 
MS University, Baroda, and he is the director of field of archaeology. He is a well-known Indian archaeologist, and uh, not only in India but all over the world. During his dedicated academic service of 50 years, he has extensively worked on various aspects of prehistory, proto-history, and history uh, archaeology. Besides the rock art, he has been associated with various premier academic governance bodies of the country, such as General Secretary of the South. Uh, South Asian Archaeology, SOSSAA, and member of standing committee member by the Virtual Central Advisory Board of Archaeology, CABA, and the Archaeological Survey of India, member of World Heritage Committee, and uh, it goes on, goes on. And uh, uh, to mention a few, Indira Gandhi National Centre for Arts, New Delhi, and the Vice Chairman of the Indian Archaeological Society, IAS, to name a few. Professor Vani has conducted various ex uh, excavation in Champaner, Tarsan, Vaga, Nageshwar, Nagavada, Ratnapura, Moti, and the list goes on, goes on. Sar has attended 110 national and international seminars and published more than 100 research articles in national and international journals. He has widely traveled uh, for the purpose of academic in uh, Australia, France, Italy, Malaysia, Iran, Singapore, Thailand, Sri Lanka, China, and Hungary. Apart from the active involvement in the achieving the world heritage status for the Pavagar Champagne, and discover, he discovered uh, uh, zinc furnace at uh, Zawar in Rajasthan. Because of him, Gujarat obtained its place in the map of rock art uh, of India, identification of regional indigenous charcoalithic cultures and the role of rural settlement in the development of Harappan urban settlement in Gujarat is considered as a major research contribution to Indian archaeology. Now I request Professor Sonamani to take over the session. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ramadevi, and also I take this opportunity to uh, <clears throat> thank her for inviting me for this prestigious, and I think the first conference is having in the department after, from I think 2005. So it's a great uh, uh, miss uh, kind of uh, adventure to venture into the international conference like this and that too on a very important topic like uh, Harappan civilizations. First of all, and that shows uh, particularly the uh, film which you have uh, seen today. So that shows how she deeply interested in uh, Harappan studies. And so uh, all thanks to her for this uh, gathering people from different parts of the country. Now today, whatever introduction she has given, that's okay. But then uh, the last topic which she said that one of the contribution is the role of rural settlements in the development of uh, mature uh, urban uh, cities and the towns. So earlier, particularly, these villages were village settlements or the rural settlements were not given uh, priority or they have not understood uh, actually uh, but then in the recent uh, studies, because it's a problem-oriented research, and uh, we particularly, uh, my lecture is based on the excavations carried out by our department right from the beginning. And so there are certain limitations for the university departments to carry out excavations, particularly the uh, financial uh, assets and as well as the uh, capacity of the faculty members to participate in the excavations. But since uh, we have understood uh, quite many interesting things and how these rural settlements or the uh, village settlements have contributed for the development of uh, mature uh, Harappan, particularly the uh, urban cities and the towns. So uh, before uh, I will go to the slides of, uh, for that,
Hello. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, the title is that uh, role of rural settlements in the development of urban uh, towns and cities of the mature Arapan culture, a case study of Gujarat. No, no, as that I am fine. <coughs> so, uh, as I said, uh, uh, ex I am extremely thankful uh, again uh, Dr. Rama Devi for inviting me for this seminar. Now, before me, uh, right from uh, Professor Sinde, and then uh, and uh, then uh, Professor Ban also, they have made my job very easy because I'm not going into details all this mature or uh, later upon also, but basically trying to concentrate uh, on the role of village settlements. Now. Before going into the details of the urban-rural economy of the Harappan settlements, it is imperative to note the various aspects which led scholars uh, to define the urban or mature phase of the Harappan civilization. These broad parameters include large site settlements, monumental architecture including town planning with street in grid pattern, underground and covered drains, fortification of uh, brick dimensions in the ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 4, uh, long distance trade uh, and craft specialization. Class hierarchy, state of organization as well as diagnostic artifacts such as indus seals, indus script, triangular terracotta cakes, kidney shaped uh, inlays, long churred blades of rohri origin, cubical stone weights, H. carnelian, and long barrel cylindrical beads together with typical copper or artifacts like bent blade knives, double edge uh, razor, or barrel uh, bar barbed triangular arrowheads with holes. In addition, ceramic forms like goblets, perforated cylindrical <coughs> jars, and jars with S profile, often decorated with intricate or naturalistic painted decorations, etc., as suggested by Child and Wheeler, are some of the characteristic features of the mature urban settlements associated with the urban or mature phase. Next one, please. <coughs> A cursory glance at the panorama of urban settlements is enough to reveal that bigger settlements are few and far, uh, far between. However, until three decades ago, it appears there was a trend prevalent among the archaeologists who focus their studies by giving preference to large-scale excavations of urban centers neglecting the rural ones. Excavations at large settlements such as Harappa, Mohenjo-daro, Kalibangan, Rakhigadi, Dholavira, Lothal, etc. demonstrate the preference and priority. The picture emerged from the interpretations of archaeological data derived from such sites that appears to have prompted the earlier scholars to define urban or mature phase of Harappan civilization without taking into consideration the nature of rural or small village settlements. Considering uh, these broad parameters based on material culture of excavated bigger uh, settlements or the sites, supporting these characteristic features are stamped as Harappan settlements re representing urban or mature phase, while the rest sites which are not fitting into that proposed model are interpreted as post-urban or late Harappan or even post-Harappan. Next one, please. However, recent advances have made, um, have modified earlier interpretations about the urban or mature Harappan phase. Irrespective of the size of the settlement, where it is, whether it's a small or big, presence or absence of some of these features would depend on the multiple factors like location and nature of the settlement, but certainly show 
close functional interaction between the urban and rural rural cities and villages as it exists now all these settlements were linked by trade and economic activities as well as uh, by religious beliefs and social relations it is well known fact that the urban centers cannot survive or exist on their own without a strong rural base in spite of this basic awareness the study of village or rural settlements has not received adequate atten attention and remain in shadows of the privileged towns and cities uh, though they played a vital role as those of towns and cities in the making of this world's unique civilization accepting accepting uh, this lacuna more recently some welcome efforts were made to understand the cultural style of the harappan civilization as reflected in its uh, village sites that is one of the remark by mr professor thapar uh, village settlements of any cultural period exist in clusters around primary settlements of an urban nature therefore it is quite obvious that the smaller ones have a symbiotic relationship with the bigger counterparts so in order to know fully the harappan life lifestyle one has to have a fair idea of the role played in the development of material culture by nuclear settlements along with their satellite ones the vast corpus of harappan settlements can be classified as small villages or hamlets occupying an area of area uh, sometime less than uh, one and up to 10 uh, hectares with a few larger towns and small cities covering 10 to 50 uh, hectares all these settlements contributed to support and maintain the large urban centers that grew up along with the major trade routes of this vast corpus uh, five large cities have been identified as the major urban centers of this civilization among these mohenjodaro has spread covering an area of more than 200 hectares harappa has extended in an area of about uh, 150 hectares while ganveri wala and rakhigadi are of almost equal dimensions and uh, uh, each occupying uh, more than 80 hectares and dolavira uh, nearly or uh, around 100 hectares the first four are inland centers located approximately equal distance in a zigzag pattern that covers the indus and saraswati river river plains next one the fifth dolavira is situated on a small island called khadir uh, in the little run of kutch in gujarat from the pattern of distribution of these sites it is quite clear that this existed there existed a clear network between cities towns and villages throughout the harappan domain uh, dominated uh, by the presence of village settlements uh, forming a tight cluster around their primary settlements thus a perfect stage was set for the mutual relationship in the existence of an economic tradition that spread like a of web on the harappan uh, countryside with a city occupying a central that is spider like uh, commanding position what precisely was the relation between the urban and the rural phenomena is difficult to detail out but it is fair to point out that the tentacles of the urban growth went deep into the sustaining energies of the countryside the symbiotic relationship between these sites played an important role in establishing links with uh, interregional and international trade network which was in some respect vital to their prosperity next uh, now i will come to the case of gujarat 
uh, Gujarat as a case study. During the last three decades or so, with the application of new uh, models, uh, the perception of the Indian archaeology has changed drastically. Now, study, studies have become more problem-oriented and multidisciplinary in nature. As a result of this revised understanding, there is a large volume of data available now to fill the lacuna in the rural urban economy of the Harappan settlements. The discovery of a large number of village settlements spread over in different parts of the entire uh, domain of Harappan civilization, which coexisted with their bigger urban counterparts, has removed the lingering doubts about their contemporary as well as a mutual interdisciplinary. In this context, some initiatives were taken by the Department of Archaeology and Ancient History of the Maharaja Sahaja Rao University of Baroda while formulating its research program of thrust areas. Priorities were set up to excavate small village settlements, particularly in the District, distinct regions uh, within Gujarat, which is demarcated as one of the peripheral zones of the Harappan tradition. Excavations carried out by the department at Kanewal district Kheda, Wagad district Ahmedabad, Nageshwar district Jamnagar, Nagwada district Surendranagar, Jekda, Datrana and Moti Pipli uh, district Banaskanta, and Bagasra uh, district Rajkot revealed cultural remains associated with mature Harappan phase representing typical rural features. Besides these, sites excavated by the Archaeological Survey of India as Rangpur uh, district Surinanagar, Desalpur and Surkotada district Kach and Prabhas Patan uh, District Junagad, Kuntasi District Rajkot, and Padri uh, District Bhavnagar, excavated by the Department of Archaeology, Deccan College, Pune. Apart from Rojadi uh, District Rajkot, uh, Pabumat, and Sikarpur District Kach, excavated by Department of Archaeology, Government of Gujarat, brought to light interesting features of mature Harappan culture but revealing rural traits. In this context, it is imperative to note that in more than 700 sites associated with different levels of Harappan appellation in Gujarat, apart from above mentioned excavated village settlements of mature Arab phase, large number of contemporary village settlements have been identified based on surface collection and the site scatter. The sites such as Padri, Prabhas Patan, and Lothal in Saurashtra, Nagwada in North Gujarat, and Surkotada and Dolavira in Kutch, stratigraphically reveal elements associated with the pre or early Harappan phase beneath the mature Harappan strata without any cultural or chronological gap, and thus show a continuity in the uh, in in the emergence of urban mature culture. Similar evidence has been reported from the excavated sites of North Gujarat at Datrana and Moti Pipli also, while sites like Nageshwar, Kuntasi, Bagasra, Rojadi, Wagad, Rangpur in Saurashtra, Jekra in North Gujarat, and Sikarpur, Desalpur, Pabumat, etc. in Kutch emerge only during the mature Harappan period in order to exploit local resources to sustain some of the growing needs. All these sites locationally can be broadly categorized as coastal and territorial settlements. The first category of settlements are situated on the sea coast or on the margins of the runs, which are hypothesized as being originally forming an arm of the Arabian Sea, while the territorial sites are situated in the hinterland 
regions surrounded by considerable landmass. Locational aspects of these sites make them economically interdependent. It has been noticed that the territorial sites are never large and economically as developed as the coastal ones. Besides, coastal sites have more relevant connections so far as overseas trade relationship with uh, settlements of the Western world, especially the Middle East, are concerned. The reciprocal contacts between these sites played an important role in establishing link with interregional and international trade network, which was in some respect vital to their prosperity. The locational setup of these settlements amply demonstrate that these were developed mainly for trade and access to raw material of specific commodities and to facilitate their flow towards the areas of uh, demand, especially the nuclear urban, urban centers. However, sites like Wagad, uh, Rangpur, and Rojadi played a different role. The material inventory of the excavated sites located on the coast or along the margins of the geographical features like the uh, runs apply amply demonstrated that these settlements were associated with the manufacture of specialized items, for example, exposing processing of semi-precious stones, steatite, fence, shell, ivory, copper, etc. It is worth noting that quite a few of these are strongly fortified apart from uh, Dullavira and Lothal uh, sites like Surkotara, Sikarpur, Bagasara, Kuntasi, and Nagwada have revealed most of the diagnostic mature open markers such as typical ceramic with fossil forms, metal tools, architecture with standard brick size, uniform weight system, seals and ceilings, variety of ornamental beads including H. carnelian, churled blades of rory origin, terracotta molded triangular cakes, etc. On the, on the other hand, sites like Nageshwar, Padri, Rangpur, Prabhas Patan, Jekra, Wagar, Rojadi, Datrana, Moti Pipli, Desalpur, etc. because of their specific character and function cannot be expected to possess all the parameters as as distinctive markers of the urban phase found elsewhere in the contemporary settlements. The absence of certain parameters at a particular site does not rule out the contemporary of other urban sites. They are just not there because of the nature of, of the settlements or the function with which it is associated. Now uh, here uh, I will just, these are the mostly map showing the excavated uh, sites of the Harappan period out of uh, this 75 which are in number. Next one. Now, uh, now this uh, after the background which I gave, now here now we will try because most of these sites are uh, particularly excavated by our department. And now here you will realize how these rural settlements and uh, which are quite according to the function of the site or the location of the site, they are not in any way irrespective of that, not con in conferiate or to um, urban centers or so. So that was the site called uh, Datrana. That's a general view. Uh, next one. Now, what is happening here at particular this particular place? Uh, we have found uh, this uh, copper punch. Now, there are three, four localities at Datana. So, one of the locality called locality four, we have found this copper punch. It is a prism like copper punch. The first photograph on the left uh, is, is an in situ and then right in the section. 
and now after removing that you can see the on the right right side is another picture of the same copper punch next one now up till now we just believe we have some understanding about this what we because this is the period which we use the prepared core technique using an intermediate punch so that was just the assumption what kind of punch they might have been used but then uh, this is the clear evidence that certainly they used the copper punch here and what was the uh, product of this copper uh, punch that is the crystal guiding ridge blades of chert and chalcedony from the same site literally thousands of such blades uh, are uh, found reported there and what is interesting along with this uh, local chert and chalcedony blades we have one long blade of sukar ori origin also so that means when they are found at the same place so they are contemporary to each other otherwise if you just get crystal guiding ridge blades uh, particularly along with the sites representing malwa chalcolithic culture or jorvik chalcolithic culture they become quite late of the post chalcolithic uh, post harappan but here both the types of blades found together and that means they are contemporary to each other so so here we just uh, try to just demonstrate how this punch might have been used because that it is fixed on a uh, uh, maybe a wooden uh, uh, and, and then uh, the stro that is the prepared core technique using an intermediate punch and because of that a long parallel sided series of blades have been uh, detached so just see this is very simple site otherwise people might have identified it as a late harappan or, or post urban or post harappan but then certainly it belongs to the mature harappan period next one that was the point i would like to emphasize here now this is again the black slip jar from bagasra now you can see again bagasra <coughs> professor bahan has already talk about this site but then he now here we have some uh, graffiti marks and uh, on the basis of the rim portion and we have got some bottom so we could reconstruct the uh, complete what is the what should be the size or the shape of the this uh, black slip jar and then exactly similar jars have been reported uh, from some of the sites in oman and so it is identified as a transportation uh, vessel uh, or jar and so the it uh, some finished objects or goods might have gone from this site because it was a uh, workshop site or production uh, site from where bead as well as shell objects or uh, ornaments by the women and they have gone to oman and what in exchange they have got from oman probably the uh, copper objects because the same at the same site we have found one complete copper vessel containing series of large number of copper object uh, bangles so that was the exchange between the two sites showing the contacts with oman and uh, this uh, this area of gujarat <coughs> next one now again this is one of the site uh, where professor bahan has talked about excavated by the department so the settlement wise the the northern part half uh, half of the northern part is very well uh, fortified and the rest we have the extension of the other activities next now here uh, the fortified part you can see this north eastern corner of the fortification you just see the for the corner they have used uh, well dressed sandstone uh, blocks because they are more particular about this uh, shape and size of this such blocks because they are quite chiseled out next one and here you can see the details the close up of that corner so it is very from the from top to bottom it is slightly deviating 
and that certainly shows that is the planning of the fortification, which is broader at the base and narrow at the top. And they have used copper chisel for uh, chiseling these blocks. And from the chisel marks, we could certainly know that on the because we have found chisel from the same site, which is exactly fitting uh, to the chisel marks found there. Next one. Now this shows the construction of the outer fortification uh, wall, particularly the lower two parts we'll find in st stone blocks and the upper one uh, is uh, having the typical standard size of mature and open bricks in the ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 4. Next one. That is the standard size used in the urban centers as well as that rural settlement. Even uh, this one of the inside the fortification wall, at one place we have found uh, this uh, broken uh, pillar base falling down outside down. But it is exactly something like arrangement at Tolavira and other places. Next one. And then uh, this is the entrance uh, of that settlement. Now you can see. Uh, Particularly, uh, we were trying to get this entrance because this site we have excavated for eight or nine years. But most of the time, when we are trying to find out the, where should be the entrance, but, but uh, luckily, in the last season, we could found this entrance. Next one. So here you could see the uh, entrance part. Now there is a kind of a ramp to approach the entrance. And just outside the entrance, there are some um, post holes indicating some sort of canopy might have been uh, erected to give a shelter or shed like that. So again, again, this very uh, interesting uh, feature of the architectural uh, pattern, uh, even used uh, at the rural settlements like this. Next one. Now, <coughs> this is the Sikarpur, uh, the site uh, again escorted by our department. Earlier it was escorted by State Department of Archaeology of Government of Gujarat. And let, later on we have uh, conducted some excavations there. And just see the how the width, width of the fortification, it is almost 10.20 uh, meter thick. Next, uh, then uh, this is the site Kanmer, escorted by Professor Jivan Karagwal, almost uh, of the contemporary period and having similar results. Next, he will be talking may maybe more about this site later on, maybe today or tomorrow. Next, but these are all rural settlements, but showing the characteristic features, you cannot deny them that something there and they are late Harappan or post Harappan. Now this is the site uh, excavated uh, uh, by us at a place called Wagad. So very clearly you can see the circular uh, huts. Uh, now the circular huts are demarcated on the basis of the uh, line of post holes which are in, uh, runs in circular pattern. And then inside the house uh, we have the uh, hearth or chula and some uh, jars were buried uh, underneath. So that was the arrangement of keeping as a storage jars for either grains or some other uh, antiquities. Next one. Now the same site we have given the evidences of some religious activities. So we have identified these as uh, fire uh, altars. Now we talked about the fire altars at Kalibangan uh, or at Lothal or in other sites also, the, the site which was excavated by Bishji, <coughs> that is Banawali. But here, apart from those mature urban sites, this is most convincing evidence because we have uh, this uh, rectangular uh, platforms. Uh, just one is on the other side. Do you have the pointer, please? Or just leave it. Uh, 
this is one platform here and another platform is here. So, no, no, no go back, go back. Yes, now these are the two uh, square or, or rectangular platforms, uh, particularly as assumed because one is for the person who is performing the yagna and the other one is who is the, actually the, uh, means we have the performer or, and the, what is called that, uh, I am not getting the term, the persons who perform the rituals and the person who, uh, the household, uh, means the family who is doing that. But then in the Vedic literature, we have the evidence of uh, three fires like Garyapatya, Ahavaniya and Dakshinatya. And they are all circular and neatly uh, plastered from inner side that is mixed uh, clay uh, with cow dung and cake. And inside it is just a <coughs> bunch of cow dung uh, uh, cakes, just as that's it. And in the mi middle, uh, this is the place which is also known as Utkar, which is cylindrical with flat base. And this Utkar is normally used to keep the uh, objects which are left out after the uh, ritual is over. So this exactly gives the evidence of fire altars used by the Harappans during the mature Harappan period. And we have the carbon-14 dates from this level that is again going to the bracket of the mature Harappan period. Next one. Now this is one of the uh, close-up of one of the fire uh, pits. Next one. Now this is another site excavated by our department that is known as Jekra. So it is again uh, rural settlements. You can see the circular uh, huts uh, with a projection, next one. But then we have all triangular cakes and other typical mature or urban antiquities from there. Now another site uh, excavated by the Urdipan again that is also and <coughs> Ratanpura. Here also you can see the circular huts with post holes on the periphery and inside we have the evidences of fireplaces. Next one. Next one. Now, uh, this is the again uh, inner uh, side of the, uh, in, inside the fortification, but just along the fortification, we have these four fire circular bins. Uh, Professor Bahan has shown one or two as a close up, but then they are all filled uh, with some kind of semi-precious stone nodules, particularly semi-precious nodules were stored and carefully kept there, maybe to process further to make or convert them into a variety of uh, beads, because the entire site, uh, one of the craft activities carried out there is either semi-precious stones, uh, beads, and the shell. But here, particularly this area shows the some activities for the uh, beads. Next one. Now, this is the same one. You can see the close-up of that circular beans. Next one. Now, this is the product of those uh, stone uh, craft. You can see in the upper line with the uh, stone bead production. We can see the uh, beads there in the finished beads, then here you can see the uh, particularly uh, partly finished or partly work, and then these are the various types of drill beads, and these are again uh, finished beads. So same type, means variety of stone beads or steatite beads occurring from these sites, and the same is reflected from the mature urban, uh, urban centers also. It is quite possible some of these beads might have been supplied to some of the mature urban sites from this uh, rural urban areas, rural areas. Next one. Now this is the just conjecture of the uh, stone uh, beads, how they might have supplied either finished uh, beads in the form of necklaces like that. 
because from the same sites we have this variety of beads including edge carnelian beads or uh, this uh, long barrel shaped carnelian beads and even the stone uh, gold objects which might have been used as caps for some of the uh, beads. This is just the conjecture on the basis of stone beads reported from the same site. Next one. And these are of course <coughs> the French beads the, and the bangles. Now once casually uh, Dr. Beast was telling that we have, you have more number of uh, this carnelian beads than what we have at uh, Dholavira, just as a comment like that. But that means, but then these small sites also engage in this type of ma manufacture or making of such type of beads. Next one, please. Now, of course, these are steatite micro beads and then disc uh, beads, different varieties, two main varieties of steatite. And since the steatite is uh, available in Gujarat, so even the manufacture or making of these beads even continued in the late Harappan period also. Next. Now uh, here, uh, uh, <coughs> this is the site called Nageshwar, and this is the perennial lake, what is known as Bhim Gaja Talao, and then this wild grass which grows there plenty. Uh, so Dr. Bahan has already talked about the site because the site was discovered by him and then later on excavated by our department. Now normally we don't touch the sites like this because it was uh, thoroughly destroyed uh, by some of the activities carried out by the uh, Tartas of the Mithapur factory to supply, because this is the only lake which contains sweet water lake, sweet water, uh, what? sweet water lake uh, and then otherwise subsoil water at other places is brackish. So for their factory they have put a, a conduct and uh, taken out the earth from this entire Harappan uh, mound but very little area was left out. But in spite of that lot of damage to the site, considering the potentiality of the site and considering the uh, remains left out at the site, we tried to excavate that and we have got fantastic re uh, results. So we could establish various activities of shell manufacturing there. This is the entire site, only site which gives the evidence of shell manuf of work workshop. <coughs> Next one please. Now see, uh, the. Tata people, they taped out the earth and left the other uh, objects there. So this is the heap of the uh, columella uh, of the uh, uh, Turbinara pyrum. And so, see, I, I think it is uh, how much? There is more than how much? 1,000. And so, like that, the entire mound uh, is covered like this type of uh, shell uh, work, work, working workshops. Next one. And then he also talked about the other side, Lord Bhagasra, where you can see the workshop, this complete heap of the complete shells, means raw shells, and then they, uh, they take, taken out the shell circulates and so here again you can see those uh, shell circulates and then uh, bangles of different uh, state of activities or production. Finished as well as un in unfinished. Next. Then again, again some ladders and the bangles. And then this is a very interesting object, what is known as, uh, we are not very sure, what exactly the use of this, but it is uh, all the six sites have been decorated with concentric circles. And quite enigmatic. Next. Now this is the site from Nagwada, from where uh, we have complete uh, this uh, copper axe or silt uh, with the uh, chisel and then a scroll, if you stretch it uh, on one edge side, it shows the, some kind of punch. So 
that could have been used uh, as a copper blade for perforate or cutting the shells. Next one. Then these are variety of, you just compare the objects found from rural settlement and ob copper objects recovered from uh, urban settlement. That is comparison between Dolavira and uh, Bagasra. So, so in that case, Bagasra also belongs to the same cultural period, but only it is a small size. That's it. Next one. Then again, interesting evidence that the use uh, of <coughs> copper knives and with their handles, bone handles. Next. And then again, uh, quite <coughs> copper toe ring from Jekra, Jaidak. Third, next one. From Kuntasi also, they have got similar uh, type of spiral toerings. Then some of the gold objects. Now some of these, I said, are they are used in making the uh, ornaments. Next one. Then typical cubical agate weights. Next. Then some terracotta objects. Next one. Then other variety terracotta objects, and then ceilings, next, and seals. What is interesting here, though it is a small settlement, Bagasra, we have very interesting evidence of uh, this uh, particular uh, seal here. It has got a cavity, and so, and it has been there is a device to uh, close that gap with some, there is, you can see here, this portion. And so this has been used as an amulet. So very few places you get this sort of uh, seals. Next, even the side walls are uh, decorated. Next one. Just a minute, I'll just conclude. The aforesaid uh, data gives us a fair idea of the role played by these rural settlements in order to understand the uh, sophisticated urban ethos of the mature Arapan phase. The Arapan settlements of this category excavated other than the MS Institute of Baroda, such as Rangpur, Resalpur, Surkotara, Prabhas Patan, that is Somnath, Kuntasi, Padri, Kanmer, Pabumat, etc also contributed substantially, substantially um, by supplying variety of finished goods and even raw material from this one of the peripheral areas of the uh, overall development of the Harappan material culture. A critical synthesis of available data thus suggests that the drainage network of Kutch, Saurashtra, and the mainland of Gujarat were complex and varied from region to region. The spread of Harappa culture was therefore conditioned uh, by areas of attraction. Next one. These features partly explain the regional diversities even within Gujarat in the manifest manifestation of the mature Harappan culture. Unlike the fertile tracts of Indus Valley in Sin, None of the rivers in Gujarat, particularly of Harappan ecozones, laid themselves for uh, irrigational use uh, with ancient uh, technology. Agriculture here is entirely dependent on dry farming techniques. Therefore, alternate subsistence strategies were adopted by the Harappan communities to suit the local environmental setting. As a result, most of these sites uh, amount for a complex system of occupational diversity. What emerges is a complicated picture of the varying, uh, varying interrelated aspects of sedentism, pastoralism, hunting, and many other diversified resource exploiting strategies which took advantage of the region's uh, total available subsistence potentiality. Next one. A wide range of site location does not only highlights the adoptive skill of the enterprising Harappans, but also throws light on how it gave rise uh, 
to the regional phenomena which fossil has called uh, the sora tharapan the pattern of settlement in saurashtra was mostly controlled by various river systems whereas in north gujarat it was based on locational variables of relic sand dunes and associated uh, lakes rather than rivers the settlements in kutch on the other hand developed both linear dendritic as well as dispersed pattern next one the nature of collective evidence from gujarat on the village sites of the harappan belong to the mature or phase as revealed a close functional interaction between the urban and rural settlements as a universal phenomena whatever we have cities and towns villages played a vital role in the process of sustaining uh, cities or towns by various means therefore the harappan who lived within the confines of the walled cities did not live in isolation but rather remained surrounded by rural settlements hence taking the reference from gujarat similar situation must have prevailed in other regions of harappan domain uh, such as rajasthan haryana punjab jammu and kashmir beside territories in pakistan thus the harappans could evolve one of the earlier earliest flourishing civilization mainly because of their efficient extensive and intensive trade network system establishing bilateral balance reciprocity between hunter gatherers farmers and craftsmen working at specialized craft manufacturing centers occupying rural areas in close proximity of urban centers this is exactly on the same line what gupta has uh, emphasized on the normal process of urban growth here i mean professor s p gupta uh, further in support of this observation he comments that not only india and pakistan but also the whole world has more villages and and townships than cities hence the birth of cities is neither the end of the villages nor the towns of the three forms of human settlements exist side by side interacting and supporting each other thank you Thank you, sir. I now request. I now request Dr. T. Satyamurthy ji to honor Professor Sonamani ji. I now request our COENC intern Shri Nikila to introduce Dr. T. Satyamurthy. Dr. T. Satyamurthy, the founder president of Rural Education and Conservation of Education Foundation, had his education at Chidambaram and obtained his master's and doctoral degrees in Sanskrit. 
from Annamalai University besides obtaining a PG diploma in archaeology from the Institute of Archaeology Archaeological Survey of India. He served in the Archaeological Survey of India for 36 years in various capacities all over India till his retirement in 2006. During this span, he has published over 50 research articles in reputed journals and written five books on archaeology, art and numistics. Presently, Secretary of UVESA Library, Chennai. His achievements in the field include researching the Indian monuments, particularly those in Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka, Orissa and Gujarat and conducted many excavations including the recent discovery of the ancient Murugan temple at Mamalapuram and the famous Adichanalur excavation taking successful efforts to include, include the Brahadeshwara temple, Gangai Konda Cholapuram and Airavateshwara temple, Durasharam as the World Heritage Monuments. He founded REACH Foundation, a non-profit organization dedicated to the cause of pre preservation of the heritage and educating the rural population about the heritage and serving as consultant for Hutko's heritage projects. We welcome you, sir. Namaskar. Can I operate it? Remote control. Okay, so I am Namaskar. Of course, I am very, very thankful to this institution, especially to Dr. Ramadevi. Of course, so, um, I am very grateful to her to invite me to be here with you and share something. She told uh, about this continuity of this intercivilization. She especially asked me that is why people are all talking about uh, Indus Valley and it's what happened in Tamil Nadu. Is there any possibility of uh, that having any influence on uh, this uh, Tamil country or far south? Thought I could uh, do something, some justification because we cannot expect everything to come. Especially I'm very much thankful to her because she worked with Nagasami and was successful. <laughs> That is uh, in under Guru Shishya scheme. She is, uh, did her thing, and uh, it is very difficult to satisfy the, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Narswami. And uh, she was successful and successfully carried out uh, her project and submitted the thesis also. So I congratulate her and also very really thankful to uh, that she is here. But anyway, coming to our point, of course, it will not take much time because another four speakers are there. Of course, uh, it's there. Uh, whether is it possible because now what I'm seeing from the morning, that is uh, uh, in the first three decades, as he pointed out, so much of uh, that is information, inputs have come to this field. Especially when we were taught, of course, I'm talking about 1970s, uh, 60s and 70s when I was a student. Of course, uh, and, and under Thopper, we got the training, excavation training and B.B. Lal, under B.B. Lal. So, so many, it's uh, all the stalwarts, uh, the Desh Pandey and all others. Of course, uh, at that time, this, uh, the resource was so small, and also the, the, uh, it, the field was not so, so much opened. Now, they only discovered, they were very interested only in discovering more sites, so that uh, India will get more share in, uh, in the civilization, that they were successful. Of course, uh, especially J.B. Joshi and M.C. Joshi, they were all very, that is, uh, uh, very, very, very say, interested in training uh, all of us. But the thing is, that is, whereas when we talk about inter civilizations, of course, uh, generally we were taught about, uh, of course, B.K. Topper, of course, what they are talking about, the pre harappan levels. He divided into six groups and he took so much of interest to teach us and to repeat it to him. So that was the thing which we were uh, trained. So he generally said, in spite of these uh, party differences, 
I'm not going into much details about this, but it is a revolutionary civilization. And so urban character, that is the main character for, uh, that is main things. Of course, now Sonavala has shown how it is also in rural level. Of course, uh, dance, standardization uh, took place during that period, that time, that is what he has also projected. Also, introduction of mining for various source materials which were exported and which they have also, you have seen how the beads were made. Without this mining technology, they could not have uh, done those beads, so that was a thing. And um, trade and, uh, of course, exchange of materials from other uh, overseas. Of course, crafts and specialization. These are some of the features which is, uh, we were taught in, in, in a very elementary level. Of course, is it possible that is, uh, the way we talk about the civilization, the civilization is uh, the deteriorating, it's falling. The entire thing cannot come to outside. You can see only some elements outside coming outside because civilization is a, a great thing which is having so many elements. So now, which one? Ah, next one. Next one, this, one, this is the main uh, place, of course. Uh, in the morning, we are talking about this Indus Valley, and there is a spread of the Indus uh, civilizations, matured in the Indus mm -hmm. civilizations. But when it uh, has fallen or when it has disappeared, what happened to the people there? That is, uh, of course, a mystery which is not yet solved. We, so many theories are now have been sponsored. But now, this is uh, the way out. Next one, next one. When this, uh, it, it was falling, that is, all the people have moved towards east or west or somewhere, they would have gone. Of course, because they could not live there anymore, due to reasons which we, which, which we are not discussing now. So we are seeing that is, uh, of course, the AP Joshi has a wonderful paper and also he has taught us next one. You can see. Next one. Of course, uh, the, uh, after discovering of so many sites that's in, within India, that is, uh, tracing of the root of the spread of the Harappan cultures towards the, that is the prime objective of the archaeologists at that time. But when it has fallen, because we are seeing that is, uh, the elements are moving outside. Next one. So beyond the boundaries. We could see encounters, the <coughs> explorations in Ganga, Yamuna, the elements of the Harappan cultures in many ways. Of course, that was uh, his main paper. J.P. Joshi has done wonderfully in the annual report of the Anthropological uh, Survey of India. Archaeological, uh, yes, so many rudiments, rudimentary elements have gone there. That is uh, what we call it um, uh, Ganga Yamuna sites, of course. Uh, they are all uh, the, uh, Copperhood sites also, and later sites also. It's uh, mentioned more than about uh, 50 to 60 sites, uh, which have, that is uh, where these elements, rudimentary elements have gone. We cannot expect when the civilization is falling, the same, same thing to go there. But we are finding that is uh, either in pottery or in other elements. That is a very wonderful uh, paper, of course, in yes, status also. Next one. Next one. Of course, now, uh, while we want to apply it to this uh, south, is there any possibility that is, uh, that is uh, such a uh, movement or such some of the elements we could hear in the far south? Because uh, that was a great uh, that is, uh, civilization which was so, that is, uh, spread throughout the uh, subcontinent at that time. So is it there? So one such site uh, which I excavated was Aditya uh, Nalur. Of course, that is, uh, you cannot expect everything of the Harappan to be applied here. But some elements which we can come back, we can come to it at later stage. Of course, the first instance will show some of the uh, excavations which we have done there. Next one. Of course, this is the site. It is uh, under the banks of uh, Tham Thamravarni, one of the perennial river uh, of uh, Tamil Nadu, of far south. That is, it, uh, it, it is located there. Next one. Of course, I excavated in 2005. Of course, it was originally excavated 100 years back. Next one. Of course, in the earlier excavations, that is Alexander Yax done something. Of course, he has done a wonderful work of uh, uh, exposing so many, so many more. That is, uh, of course, it is, uh, according to him, it is only a burial site. Of course, we can say 2004 and 5 uh, we excavated. Of course, in the, in the first season, we could uh, find only the burials. Second season, of course, I could locate uh, that is a uh, habitation site. Next one. 
is location of the site. Next. Next. Of course, the description of the site is that, of course, it covers an area of very vast area, but we took a very small area for uh, excavation because uh, I wanted to see that is whether it is a habitational site or uh, what are the things, because he mentions so many antiquities, that is, uh, numerous antiquities, uh, and also he gives us uh, one of the very, very great sites of the South India. Next one. And this is this. Now, earlier also, there is a, the excavation was started even in earlier, that is, uh, uh, during the latter part of the 19th century itself. There is some French archaeologists who have excavated. But they wanted to see whether the skulls or uh, either uh, Aryan, uh, this, uh, Aryan or uh, Dravidian. That was their purpose to show that it's uh, Aryans also lived here. That was their purpose. They could not uh, prove anything at that time, of course. That is, uh, they stopped the excavation, but it's still the skulls are in Germany only. Even more than 100 skulls are there even in, in Bonn, even now. It's not brought back. Next one. These are the, when I excavated, these are the small area of uh, six trenches only. We could come across, uh, that is about 185 is on. on. Uh, the three-tiered uh, area, it is, of course, uh, location, it's, it is buried. Next one. Next one. Of course, uh, very few ants are, are uh, encountered, of course, in the earlier. Mostly are of them uh, disturbed condition in earlier period, means in, in top level. All are secondary burials in uh, in phase one, and few grave parts are encountered in the in, in that area as you as you excavate. Mostly, few um, fragments of skeletal remains were there. For me, be, be very recent time we could not date them because most of the site is much disturbed in the level. Next one. Uh, you think this is as you are you are seeing the how the site is disturbed. Of course, geologically there are so many theories about that, but anyway, it's uh, much disturbed. You can see, you are, you are seeing the, uh, uh, as soon as come, within one meter, a burial, next one. This phase two, we call it, next one. Of course, the problem is, uh, that is, uh, the burials are made in the same site for a longer time. Of course, uh, such things are found only in European countries. Uh, the same burial is used for more than 100 years, 200 years burying again, again, and again, burying over it. This is uh, the, the black and uh, red bear. 60% of, of the portrait is black and red bear. Of course, I will uh, deal it in later. Next one. Next one. Uh, this you can see that is uh, how this is going deep. That is not only it's, uh, in upper level. As you go deep, you find the burials also. That is uh, one below the other. Next one. Uh, you can see that is in three levels of that. One on the top, what you are seeing, the straight is uh, second level and third level. This is very interesting because uh, um, how the one site can be used for longer time, that is, same barriers with them, but what was the necessity and how they did it, because uh, there is a sturdiness will not be there. If they place the one bar on, that is close it. Again, another one cannot be placed. Why, how they did it and why they did it, these are the, some of the uh, enigmatic problems which, which were solved by the uh, geologists. Next one. Yes. You can see that it's different levels, different barriers. Of course, we are coming to the contents later, but you will see that is how the levels are there. That is one, two, three. Of course, it was very difficult to excavate also. While you excavate in the top level, another uh, burial you are finding third level. Is very, uh, only the excavator will uh, find. Of course, we got a good team of excavators. Next one. Next one. You see, this is the of course, section drawing. All the levels were there. Next one. This is another section, long section. In different levels, how they bury. Next one. Of course, now the important aspect is how they used it and why they used it. It means the shared and fractured quartz mine was there. That is, that was used for many years, maybe we have for a century or more than that. That's uh, the, the fractured quartz was there, which they used as a mining. That is, the mine was there. So wherever the, the mine, they removed it. That part they used it as a barrier electron in a lower level, and then uh, middle level and upper level. Where wherever this uh, rock was there, they buried it, because already this mine has been exploited. Next one. Next one. Uh, you are seeing next one. Of course, uh, as you are going inside deep, 
you are seeing different types of parties. Of course, next one. Next one. Of course, barriers and uh, copper bangles all right there in the phase two. Copper and iron both, you get iron outside and copper inside. Next one. See here. Next one. These are some of the shapes which are uh, very, uh, very common in, uh, in other uh, like chalcolithic sites and also in the megalithic sites and also in this site. Of course, the importance is that uh, we cannot call it as a megalithic site because we don't have the mega stones there. No, they are all uh, pit burial. They are directly buried into the uh, uh, earth without any uh, association of um, uh, lith. That is the thing, uh, we, there is a pre-megalithic barriers. We can call it pre-megalithic barriers. Next one. These are the, some of the paintings, some of the, uh, the portraits are very superior in uh, quality. So, so more than, uh, of course, some of the qualities of the other historical portraits. You can paint this very fine, thin variety. Of course, we can even ants, which you have seen, are all about three and a half, four feet high. But it was thin fabric that is a, uh, that is a, a magnetic um, uh, black and red wear. Next one. You cannot see, of course, some people call it uh, slippered wear, but it is a uh, magnetic wear. Next one. Next one. You can see copper bangles were also seen the same level. Next one. And this is the, the uh, which uh, section I just shown you for the other side of the mound. This, uh, it was a mine which was used by the earlier people. Maybe if it is dated to uh, 2000 BC, earlier than that, this was used as a mine. So the mines, they uh, used it and left it. All these uh, the rocks were used as a burial. When the one rock is over, they filled it. Then that is the reason you don't get uh, there is um, yeah, a different type of layers there. Next one. I can see this uh, um, uh, old workings in the northern area. Of course, the entire thing was uh, rather um, completely scanned by the geologists. Of course, these are the people from Geological Survey of India. They traced this uh, this war inside also. Next one. You can see this, uh, of course, quartz veins showing the old wars with uh, accessory minerals. That is very important. Of course, uh, these minerals were also taken out from there and uh, that is used by maybe for a sport or for some other purpose. These are very important for uh, that is uh, yeah, industry or for a yeah, um, yeah, uh, higher setup. Next one. You can see this. Kersh has crop. Next one. You see different types of. Of course, there was an. Uh, they, they found this uh, charcoal. Of course, um, the charcoals made them to make a smelting area. That also was described by the geologist. Next one. Ash bed below the soil that shows that uh, uh, the importance of this um, uh, our, uh, smelting area. Next one. Of course, uh, you are finding the pipes also in the same location. Next one, you can see. Of course, the interesting aspect is the site was much affected by the flood. There is, uh, the river is flowing. Other side is the mound. That is, the, that is, you are seeing the deposits on the front side. Land shown is the deposits on the mound. So flood was to that level. The flood was there. That means the completely site was uh, that is uh, merged. The river was so, of course, that was a port city which we had discovered later. Maybe a city that is, which was used by, uh, by ships to come inside the land next one. Of course, these are all some of the barriers which you have shown are all uh, the depicted or narrated in the Tamil literature, Sangam literature of uh, first to sixth century is a C. Maybe um, whatever was existing, they have uh, mentioned this. All such such barriers. I'm not going into those details. All such things are uh, that is uh, we, we find in the site. Next one. Of course, uh, the Tamil literature is based only on the site. Next one. Of course, we find double, of course, lid also. Double barriers also because skeletal is interrupted in cultural positions. Of course, you are finding your entire body that is inside a jar of uh, for, uh, three and a half feet or four feet. The height of the fellow is maybe about five feet, 5.3 inches for female, and 5.6 inches up to 5.46 inches for male. So there is, they're all crunched into this uh, inside. Of course, uh, the, we don't get this uh, extended burial as in, but we get in other sites. Of course, in Nursipur, we get it, but not here, Nestron. 
Of pottery is in shapes are different, of course, it is a very important aspect. Is Alexander Ria, when he excavated in 1905, he is telling that he is 25% of the potteries which are discovered have no analogous. It has a very, very prominent only for this site. And this site, uh, 30% are very rare types, and 45% are wide distribution. Of course, terracotta objects, uh, which he reported are ornaments like uh, Mangala Sutra, which are very popular in uh, Tamil Nadu, and uh, Gobbler Beach, and so many shapes he uh, gives uh, descriptions uh, in the catalog published by him in 1917. Next one. Next one. Of course, distribution of the pottery is also, that is, uh, your finding, as I told you, that is, uh, wide distributions of uh, the 40% outside, but 25% are very rare. Next one. But it was interesting, you are seeing this uh, pottery, uh, the uh, black and red ware, and black were also similar things, very, very, uh, very fine also. These are not the ants. Ants are three and a half feet to four feet high also. You are finding that is, uh, that is black and red ware of thin uh, fabrics, which you cannot uh, find in anywhere, because thin fabrics making three and a half feet high is so technically that is uh, how they advance, we don't know. Next one. Shapes are seen, can these wares, different types of wares which you find in Chalcolithic as well as in, in some of the shapes which you find in, in Harappan sites also you can find here. Next one. You can find some of the parties, that is what a goblets, and also say beakers. All you find here, sir, in also that is uh, uh, cups, dimpled, dim cups with dimples. Next one. You can see this. Uh, Fineness of this uh, pottery, even though we, we, we buried very below, that is, is, is still it, it has lost its uh, this, um, color. Next one. Next one. You know, some of the other sites, of course, if you compare other sites in Tamil Nadu and also in uh, chocolate sites, uh, similar shapes you get it. Next one. So you can comparison, both shapes and also the shining. Next one. Some of the shapes which you find that is uh, throughout in Harappan or either in the Chocolithic sites and also there is uh, in Southern Chocolithic sites in Karnataka and also here. Next one. For each and everything, so yes, uh, named it. Of course, in our excavation also we got it. But uh, the Alexander Yak has named each and every one giving the local name. If it is a long one, he was called Tumblr, which is a local name. So everything is named it. And, uh, uh, published also there are all the interesting aspects is all the parties have got a dotted painting white dotted painting that is uh, maybe uh, post firing some people call it but it's only pre firing painting some of that next one next one uh, perforated that next one so some of the uh, shops next one of course uh, the black and red were aunts were there two examples of double burial so encounters both in phase two and phase one Double burials, double, two bodies were also buried. And uh, the one part within another part also we kind of, these are some of the things uh, which you don't find anywhere. Next one. Yeah. And then it's a very important aspect is uh, Dr. Corina Waxley. He has studied, uh, the, she's from German, she studies all the potteries in the southern India. He came to the conclusions that uh, most of the potteries in the southern India, that is uh, more than 25% uh, of the potteries from here, the shapes uh, have spread up to this Maharashtra. That is uh, her conclusions. That is, she has published her thesis in Pondicherry. Next one. Next one. Seeing this, uh, it is maybe a site. Next one. It's, uh, we, the second season, I told you, is we find a habitation site, which is a bead industry. That is, uh, it was made, uh, small quacks beads, beads have been made. Next one. Uh, next one. This is the next alien on top. And this is that bead that is which you are finding that squacks is uh, maybe organic material. This is very small, maybe very, very small. They just uh, the, the pace and made the hara out of that. Of course, we have made it. Of course, uh, it was an industry there. Next one. Next one. Of course, now the word analysis is very important because the, the words that is uh, having is, uh, the copper horse are having is, uh, more copper only, but they are not having uh, arsenic in them. But with the, with the copper, next one. Copper bangles, if you see, they're about uh, arsenic 6%, 4%, and 3.8%. 
any increase it's the inclusion of our uh, finding of uh, arsenic as a material uh, that is composition more than 1% is intentional so the technique of adding that is uh, arsenic was known to them that's not so of other words from other kodumanal and others, we don't get arsenic even in kodumanal or any other site uh, in India, especially in South India. Next one. Next one. Early historic coins also we don't get arsenic. Next one. Of course, this is uh, the addition of arsenic to copper as an alloying element was, is, um, the, the, of course, practiced by the Harappans. In Harappans, uh, of course, copper materials have been tested. There, there is more than 3%, 4%, 5%. 6%. So say, same technique was adapted. This is a thing which we are telling, telling something has come from that. Of course, the, these people have learned uh, from them are some type of continuity. Some type of continuity. Of course, this uh, site can be dated later than the mature Harpan site. Probably it's the technique of adding that is uh, arcanic, uh, is arsenic as an uh, ally came to us. Uh, that is uh, to these people from that is uh, Harappa, Harappa only. That is the thing which we can think. Some elements which I said earlier have come to us from that is uh, from that great civilization. Next one. But this is a rampart wall, but we could not prove it. The outside it was seen as a rampart wall. Uh, of course, I could not uh, uh, excavate it. Next one. Then. Um, Killing, well, killing was also for next one, graffiti marks. Now, second kill, I, I, I showed you that uh, factory. There it was a kill. It was used for uh, the bin, uh, the manufacturing. Now, graffiti marks are very important. Graffiti marks are found only in the um, uh, habitation site, but not in the uh, burial site. That is an uh, interesting thing. Of course, in uh, Harappan context and also in other contexts also, they, they, of course, uh, B.B. Lal shows uh, that is the, the gravity marks in all, all the portraits. Next one. Of course, these are the gravity marks. B.B. Lal has studied its ancient India system. It's published it in gravity marks. It's taken 64 uh, symbols and compare it with all the other parties available that is in Harappa, in Charcolithic sites, and Megalithic sites. Of course, in, uh, in including this, uh, the original um, next one. Yes. These are the, some common symbols. I don't go into because he has given in, in, in detail in the volume 16 of the ancient India. Next one. You can see uh, that is um, out of uh, 64 symbols studied by him, 40, uh, 44 are common to the megalithic uh, pottery and Harappans and the post Harappan Sartlithic sites. A few of them, about six or seven symbols are found that is in, uh, in um, Aichinur also. So this, uh, the continuity of this, uh, the, that is graffiti from this Harappan um, uh, to Aichinur. Next one. Next one. Uh, these are the original pottery, of course, in Habitian side. Next one, you can see better, it's not so clear. You can see here that is uh, the same uh, uh, graffiti marks in the, in the pottery of um, uh, this uh, uh, original also. Next one, next one. And these are the uh, common symbols, that is uh, very few symbols you have shown. Of course, he has shown many more symbols, but which is common in the gravity marks common in this uh, um, uh, Harappan and also in magnetic batteries. And of course, uh, he has given some of the symbols. Most of the symbols he has uh, done in detail in his report. Next one. These few symbols uh, I wanted to show you. Next one. But these are the uh, paintings of this Arcadic period. So as you are seeing, that is um, from there, that is from Harappan. Some of the decorators are um, found in Aichinalur. Uh, um, it was a lid found inside the pot, probably a very prominent person. You can, you can see the next one. Go next one. These symbols are found in Kalibangan also. There is the uh, same designs were there. And same designs are copied here, also. not copied also. They are, they are also found here. You cannot say copied, but they are also found here. Next one. Next one. Uh, you can see the in detail. Next drawing is next one. Next one. Ah, uh, you can see there is a especially the deal, is a, which is shown in the paintings of Kalibangan, and also you are seeing this is a alligator which is this below, and also this uh, peacock. Uh, what you see not peacock, it is a bird, 
all around this uh, from the uh, your, uh, your your paintings from Mohinder. Of course, um, we cannot say that he said they copied it, but he say somehow that is uh, it has come to this uh, site also. Some the, the uh, way of uh, depicting. Of course, it is oblique design. This is only one abstract. It is very difficult to interpret it. Also, this uh, center is uh, a, a lady or a girl dancing. So, of course, uh, you, can, you cannot directly compare it with the dancing girl of uh, Mohinder Harappa, but you can see that it's a uh, 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 mode of it, of course, uh, having two triangles forming the uh, body. That's a very, uh, very rare only in this uh, next room. Next room. Oh, double burial. This is our finding double burials in uh, Kalibangan. You are finding uh, double burial here also, next room, you see. Next room. You see the double barriers, of course, even though it's a part burial, that is a, 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 a male and female, both are both were buried in the same part. Maybe husband and wife, we don't know, but they are all uh, buried in the same part. That is as you are finding in the in that. That the tradition continues. That's what we want to say. Next one. Next one. Of course, uh, Raghavanda, of course, from Australian University, he studied the of course, um, uh, uh, all the skeletons, of course, uh, 24 skeletons, he has studied in Eston. Yes, most of the skeletons of 45 to 50 years, of course, uh, were, were buried. Of course, uh, the um, partial bones and so many extraordinary thick, the bones of, of, of the skull are so many extraordinary thick. So there is a 14 mm thick, thicker than a normal man. That shows the man was a seafaring people, Eston. That is the important point to show that is, uh, the people who are seafaring means they are doing trade. So outside the country, the frequent uh, visits in sea only will change the, of course, uh, uh, the skull. Of course, uh, it is having more, uh, it is breathing more, uh, that is, uh, sea the wind. That is the theory given by the um, um, anthropologist. Of course, that is the primary barriers, uh, of course, uh, may not be there, they, they put, put even though they, are, uh, they were cut the limbs and pulled, that you can see it in the next slide, next one. Double barrier, you can see that is. Uh, these are all seen in the, some of the sites in uh, Rappan context also. There are cuttings were there. Of course, there they say maybe a war or something. But it's, uh, such cuttings were also found uh, that is uh, in the barriers of here. Next one. <coughs> the agreeances with the analysis of Kenneth Kennedy. Kenneth Kennedy has studied the earlier in. Uh, skulls of uh, Alexander Ria. Yeah. He published the report in 1985. Of course, uh, observations were, uh, 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 were found to be correct. Of course, he is telling frequency of their voyage indicates their uh, commercial activities. That is the reason why the skulls are different from the modern man. So, of course, um, yeah, he is mentioning about some disease. We are not going into that uh, uh, now. Of course, he also mentions that the community consists of say, different layers of uh, populations, indicating the urban nature. Of course, he goes much into the detail and says uh, different ethnic groups lived there. That is his conclusion so that is, uh, he has given. Of course, he has given his report in three parts, which is not yet published. But it is uh, the three parts. He has mentioned that means that area may be a, a metro city like this, uh, where the different type of people came and did commercial activities because of uh, other uh, things which you have seen earlier. And also they, are, they lived here and buried here. That is saying there are some difference in the burials also. Not all the, uh, I mean, uh, parts have the same type of uh, burial. Next one. Next one. Next one. Of course, another one aspect now recently, that is one, uh, Mr. Balak, yes, he has studied the place names, this uh, toponomy. Toponomy is a study of the place names of the uh, Balochistan, of uh, the pa Pakistan, and also of the and uh, he has come to the conclusions uh, that uh, so many names are common. That is, uh, as mentioned in the inscriptions, uh, that is uh, in uh, Pakistan area, of course, in this uh, main uh, area of this uh, Harappan area, and also in Tamil Nadu. Come. Next slide. Of course, if they are not Tamil, I am unable to say you, but they are all Tamil names, that is, which are found in uh, there also, that is in Harappan area also. It's on 
purely placed on a topographical study. He has studied about seven lakhs names. He has come to the conclusions, the possibility of that is uh, people coming from here or from the, going from here to there or there to here. That is not, uh, that, is, that may be disputable, but the names are common. That shows uh, the connectivity is, uh, between the Harappans and this. The name may be later, but anyway, these uh, names are common. That's even now, as found in inscriptions which he has copied it. Next one. Next one. Next one. Of course, it's, um, again, this oil, oil, this uh, uh, Gautier has dated some of the um, parts there. He has come to the, he has given many dates. Of course, it is uh, 2005 he has uh, published it. One such is uh, 1570, maybe the middle level he has given, maybe the BCE, the day. That means that is uh, after this, uh, follow the, maybe the, during the contemporary time, means they will be, may be very prosperous, but during this later time, that is, they have come here. This is the date. Of course, there are so many dates he has given, but I have given for you only one date because uh, so many levels he has taken and is given date. Of course, see 14 dating of the uh, recently done by uh, ASI. That was uh, that gives about 900 uh, say the BCE, but uh, uh, that was uh, very difficult for me to accept because uh, the um, samples were kept in uh, that is Barra in Bonesha. This for more than uh, 10 years. I excavated in 17, 20 years back. Of course, uh, it was uh, lying there in uh, Bonation Institute of Science for about 10 years, and they returned it uh, after that only. So uh, we don't know whether it is contaminated. Or now they are doing again excavation. We may get a uh, date, actual date. That is there. But anyway, to show you that is. Uh, that is, you may not have all the things applied in uh, continuity of these uh, Arapans in the far south. But there are some elements, some uh, things uh, some we are finding, some elements or uh, some infrastructure, things which was there, we are finding it next one. So this is also, thus we can get, maybe this, it is also referring. It was urban character, we cannot prove so far, uh, except the population, which is having a, uh, that is a, a multi-layer populations. Also, different ethnic groups, as according to the um, uh, anthropologists. Uh, that then only we can uh, um, uh, say it is also urban because the more type of people were there, it was more in uh, metro city, maybe there. Of standardizations, of course, we we we, we cannot, we could not get, but there are so many materials which Alexander Ria has got. We can prove it is uh, standardized, but in my excavation, we could not get such uh, things. Intellectual mining, I have shown the mining shows that is the various source materials uh, that is uh, an uh, for the for it was required for the for the export also. But trade exchange was there because of that only and crafts specialized things were not not many. But of course, the things which he has published that is uh, the problem is whether he has excavated in the uh, habitation site or uh, it is a burial site is uh, we could not um, uh, find it out. That is the reason why uh, we cannot say the craft toss that is uh, where in the site, or where he excavated, I, I, it is not clear. But anyway, he has shown so many that is, uh, craft materials uh, in his publications, that is, which was published in the State uh, Museum in uh, 1970. So with this, we can say some elements of this uh, have come here through some day, that is, uh, the date is later. So there was a uh, continuity that is uh, beginning from that is, uh, of course, the date given for this site is there, but we have seen the chocolate sites and other sites which is uh, which are earlier than this, and this we are seeing that some elements uh, uh, come to far south that is in uh, that is original. Uh, that is my conclusion. Thank you all. Kindly request Professor Karakwal to honor Dr. Sati Murthy, sir.
let's have a tea break for 5 minutes due to time constraint we kindly request the upcoming speakers to reduce their presentation for 15 minutes thank you so much uh we took uh, various help of google maps uh, gi uh, gi uh, prepared gi uh, maps mathematic maps and other uh, 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 instruments to make out my field uh, explorations uh, the environmental ba uh, background was this uh, this uh, after this uh, this collapse of herpes virus in northwest india is significant process to understand the pale environment concern uh, parameter the herpes virus observed between indus and ganges uh, watershed now larger uh, difficult drainage system saraswati once upon a uh, huge heavily populated being during the herpes times but after the entire uh, river got dried and uh, this uh, in, uh, the settlements have been moved out from these places uh, they have uh, Uh, right now, I'm just talking about this uh, divide, Rajasthan divided in four parts: Thar Desert, Aravalli Mountains, and Eastern Plains, and uh, Harothi and Malwa Plains. Right now, only I'm talking about the uh, uh, Thar Desert. Uh, the, uh, if you talk about the geomorphology of uh, North Rajasthan, it's widely covered with the Thar Desert. It, we find huge dunes uh, which rises from five to fifty meter heights. In between them, we find. Uh, uh, Pelu channel of Saraswati and Deshadwadi, which is uh, around three to eight kilometers wide. Some places is twelve kilometer wide, and the mostly uh, right now it is also the mostly populated area is, uh, is this that particular Pelu channel, and those uh, uh, subtle sand dunes which covered by drift sand now uh, is not uh, occupied by the uh, people right now also. This is the feasible map for Rajasthan. Uh, this is the Harappan settlements. we can see uh, this is the saraswati river basin saraswati river flows from here this place and uh, uh, it, uh, at its surat gard it's meets with the uh, confluence with the dishad river and at anu uh, and near uh, baror it take approximately 90 degree turn and move towards the anub gard and enters in the pakistan region and this entire uh, region after confluence of this river is very significant because prior to this Uh, in even in Dishadwati and in Saraswati River Basin, we don't find this much number of site. And uh, same work uh, we can find out by Rafik Mughal's work. And then in Cholistar region, in same continuation, he, we find uh, around 174 sites, which is biggest cluster in uh, uh, in entire uh, Harappan context. <coughs> uh, during this is the site of uh, the, this is the same map DM. This is the Hanuman Gard uh, site showing the Harappan sites, both early and mature Harappan sites, in which we can find out there is only three mature Harappan sites in the Saraswati River basin and twelve, uh, sorry, eight uh, early Harappan sites in the uh, on the Saraswati River basin. But drastically, there are fifty-five sites early Harappan and uh, around uh, eight sites of uh, sorry nine sites, nine are mature Harappan sites on the Saraswati River. the uh, some important sites on the the dishad river sothi nohar and uh, kali banga is on the saraswati river basin and then uh, and when is when we came to ganga nagar district we we'll see the drastic increase in the sites uh, both in the early harappan mature harappan phases uh, during my exploration i recorded 21 early harappan sites and 28 mature harappan sites If you look at the some significant sites we found at the exploration, is Bugia is one of the largest site we find after the Baror. It is uh, most of the mounds is destructed, but still it is very good evidence we finding over there. We finding over there evidence of uh, uh, most of industrial activities. The look at the section we have found well over there. It's half cut, but still very well preserved uh, in, uh, mound. This is the pottery. Uh, reported from the site is belong to early and mature Harappan period. These, this, these are the uh, some uh, uh, portraits. This is 11 GB site, which is also very important. Over there, we they find burial uh, along with some uh, pots on the head site, and uh, we we can find clearly your evidences of uh, mud bricks and all the structures.
these are the portraits from the site belong to uh, early harappan mature harappan phases this is 23 gb uh, which is also identified by uh, orlstein and a ghosh as jorian wala later on the name of the uh, site change due to the advent of the canal so they name after uh, the numbers of the which number of the canals passing by through so they named it as a 23 gb uh, this uh, this in this side we've got mature open pottery and some uh, copper uh, uh, pieces and bangles. This is 28 GB reported by or, uh, Sir Olstein. This is Mathula. This is also a very intact site. We find a lot of industrial activities over there. And uh, this uh, there are very few sites left which is uh, good for excavation. Bogia, 11 GB, Mathula, uh, Jorianwala is one of them, we, uh, still uh, quite intact. Most of the site, are the, apart from that, are destroyed uh, due to modern interventions. These are the pottery required from the well, dug by the uh, 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 one villager in his house, in which he found a lot of the burning activity, which suggests that ki this is the industrial uh, site. This is 43 GB, uh, excavated by Sri, uh, Dr. S.K. Manjul. This site is located on settled sand dune. These are the, some few uh, portraits from this uh, site. This is 48 GB. You can see entire mound is destroyed. Only 10 to 15 meter uh, mound is left. What of the evidences we are getting is from the early herpen period and the mature herpen period at site 48 GB. It's also uh, named as, uh, uh, reported as Chuck 50 by a ghosh. Problem is in region ki who's, whosoever new person going in the region, they're naming site according to their own convenience. So that is why re-reporting of sites is happening so much in this region. This is the pottery report from site. This is uh, 68 GB. This entire mound was cut and uh, the earth is used to fill the uh, land uh, for the petrol pump platform for the petrol pump. This is beautiful, we find beautiful pottery, you can say Kodiji and also so much of beautiful Soti shirts and beautiful floorboard motifs we can find. This sort of pottery only find, uh, we can find in Barore site. Apart from this, this kind of regional variation I'm not finding anywhere nearby. The entire site is removed, dug and we also find the uh, they, uh, villagers said uh, they have find well with the uh, well which is removed by the JCB. But with uh, those uh, wet shaped bricks, they make the small temples over there. And the site is quite rich and we find a lot of pottery, uh, beautiful pottery. This site is 80 GB, located near the river bed. That is why it's destroyed due to the flood activities of the river. That is Motasa Tebba 2. Uh, I think uh, after A Ghosh, uh, I'm the uh, uh, next person who looked at this site. A Ghosh um, reported this site as a burial mound. You can lot of uh, you can uh, this is this is intact mound because this is covered with the sand dune, and this uh, uh, this is not for use for anyone. So that is why this mound is still intact, and uh, uh, lot of bur uh, uh, burial potteries you can find in, in these places. These are some pot uh, potteries on the site. Uh, this is site of Binjor 1, which is earlier reported by, uh, first reported by a, uh, Shri A. Ghosh, and later on uh, Kitty Dalal Bam reported this as RD89. This is the problem of nomenclature in the region, because uh, they don't have the exact location of those times. So this re-reporting and re-nomenclature has happened a lot in this region. This is like basically, uh, nowadays this site we, uh, we can found with the name of 30A. We, the site of Barur, there's a few excavated site also, which has very good evidence they are providing, like uh, Barur, Binjor, Tarkhanwa, Dera in the region. Barur is the most significant one, because over here, from where the uh, river takes the 90 degree turn, turn towards the Anubgar and enters the Pakistan, in this place we find a huge cluster of Harappan sites. Uh, up to the uh, up to the uh, border of Pakistan, because uh, rest of the area we can't able to explore due to the restrictions. But uh, we find very good evidence over here, pre or uh, pre early and mature European period. Uh, we're still waiting for the report, but if anyone can do the re-excavation site, we actually find very good evidence from site of the world. These are the few evidence from site. 
with our Khanwar Dera site is entirely destructed by this kiln activity. And uh, this much of water I am able to find out from the site. Rest all uh, destroyed. This is the site of Benjur. Uh, Manjus already talked about it. Uh, this is a roach of uh, copper artifacts and uh, brick, uh, co uh, copper smelting activities they have found. The same kind of uh, sites we find from these uh, entire this region, the industrial activity site. A major chunk it looked like is entire region used for the uh, prepare, preparation of the uh, copper, used for the copper artifacts. Whatever the evidence, the copper slags we are finding is from the other sites. This, uh, this basically, this entire region is on a trade route from this, uh, connected from the Kali Banga, Rakhi Gadi, up to the Ganveri Valan, further to the Mohanjodaro. So entire, uh, significantly this entire region is uh, very, at present if you go, this is very harsh climate over there. So uh, in, in this picture you can, uh, whatever you're looking at it, it's entire green region. This entire flood belt of the Saraswati. And apart from that on the left and right, uh, right corners, there's huge sand dunes. Though human nowadays also utilize this entire landscape to, for cultivation. Uh, due to the construction of the canal by Sri Maharaja Ganga Singh in 1925, this uh, human all, uh, uh, again uh, uh, tried to utilize this entire region. And they are cultivating entire uh, uh, crops like rice, wheat, barley, which, is, uh, which was not possible earlier to cultivate. Botanical remains, what we find, we find wheat, barley, rice, all the things what we find. But significantly one more uh, find we find, uh, get from the uh, Benjur is this key, summer cropping is increase during the mature open times, which also suggests uh, maybe the flow of the water increased or the mon monsoon intensified during that particular period, 25 to 2400 BCE in this particular region. These are the Harpan settlement. Uh, uh, you can see in the entire region of Saraswati and Dishatvadi and the Pelu along with the Pelu channels. And uh, 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 you can see w w these are the sites. These are the early Harpan sites. And 50, around 55 numbers uh, explored by Shri Vikas Pawar. And uh, uh, you can also find out that this, uh, the, uh, during the mature open time, very less number of sites you can find over there. And same over here also, in the upper, reach, upper reaches of, uh, in, uh, in the region near Haryana and in uh, Anwangad, the you find only three to four mature open sites. And when we move towards, uh, after the confluence, the site number increased up to 39 mature open site and 26 the pre herpan sites. And further, if you go to Cholistan region, it's increased to up to 175 mature herpan sites. Next. Uh, these are the settlements or uh, manga already showed to you. This is totally, uh, this number is already told, uh, so no need. These are the, those early Harappan sites. We are, I'll talk about uh, uh, that. And these are the mature Harappan sites. You can see only three to four sites over here on Sarsuti River Basin and only uh, nine sites over here uh, from Noha to Bhadra. This entire region is blank. It all, um, and after the confluence of the region, this, after the confluence of the region, the, uh, significantly the number drastically increase. So this portion is blank because the entire sites of this region is destroyed due to the culture, uh, agriculture activities. So what I reported, it is 28 a total number mature upon site. Uh, uh, but it is total, uh, uh, after uh, uh, calculating the site which is destroyed due to modern interventions, its total number is 39 and 26 earlier open sites. It's 11 site, um, uh, sites I was not able to uh, locate. So, in Ganganagar district, uh, the 20 sites out of 26 sites, earlier open sites, evolved to the mature open sites. So this is uh, this is the only place we find the uh, drastic increase in the number of the sites. 
uh, with the factors affecting the site's location is basically uh, the uh, fiscal factors and the economical factors. Fiscal factors find out that uh, the location of the sites, river, flood plain, uh, alluvium plains, uh, whatever the uh, raw materials, what are these things we are getting around. So we'll find out, though it is a very harsh terrain, entire uh, North Rajasthan, at that time, we uh, not uh, then also they utilize this entire uh, region due to the uh, economical factors because it's located on trade link. They have the water, but not not in ample amount. But rain is very uh, uh, rain is very uh, good for them to sustain. Good amount of rain is happening over that particular time to sustain them. Due to the fiscal and economical factor, they are living on this entire region. Uh, these are the uh, these are uh, these are the sites locations you can see this these are the cluster I'm talking about at that particular time okay back up next uh, we explored this region, this region, this region. We find a lot of open site, which reported by earlier by so many scholars. But uh, after doing, uh, going through uh, other regions also, in this region, the, uh, the Gharsana region and the Pallu region, and over here, the Sadul Shah region, uh, lower to the Bhadra. This is also a potential area where I, I think we can find Harappan, or apart from them, if not finding Harappans, we find sites which is very well connected to Harappans. Because uh, a few sites, uh, some uh, some of our friends working over there, they find some pottery which is uh, look like related to Harappans, because I have not personally visited those particular sites. So I'm just still, uh, this year I'm trying to go through all these regions, Gharsana, Pallu, and this into Sadulpur uh, regions. The same kind of thing, uh, settlements, which are talking about in the earlier context, we find nowadays also. The same, this is the village, it's uh, Binjor village, near to excavation sites. Look like this, look like the same street patterns, house planning they are following. And the same sort of strategy they followed, which was followed by earlier by the predecessors. Like the, the building, same kind of houses, uh, mud houses, but uh, though they have adopted modern strategies also, but still the old people, the uh, local Rajasthan people, uh, they use the mud brick and mud plaster house to uh, so live there because it is, first of all, is economical and it's good in this particular environment to sustain. Next. Same kind of enclosure walls they are building. Next. The agriculture practices, due to the availability of the water, same uh, same sort of agricultural practices like rice cultivation of rice, uh, wheat, barley, they are still continuing over there. They are utilizing this entire dune area as a grazing ground. And uh, after observing this, it looked like also, during time of Harappans also, they utilized entire flood belt for the agriculture purposes and the dune region where you can uh, different kind of vegetation which is good for your animals. And uh, f uh, so they uh, used as a grazing ground, entire region. Uh, the uh, pottery manufacturing uh, is more or less same. They use the... Uh, local available, mat uh, available material for uh, preparation of the pottery. Whatever the mud they're using, they're using the old alluvium river plains soil, and whatever the yellow, uh, ochre color here they're using, they're utilizing from the locally available. They don't uh, bring anything else from outside. They, they, uh, they normally use open kilns for preparation of this pottery. Designs are very simple, not very, they don't, uh, they don't over, uh, they, uh, they, they are very quite simple. And if you look this entire uh, bed, it is a Sarsuthi river bed. 
we are losing entire bed because they are using for the cultivation. After, if you go after five years, we will not able to find the locate the pellu channel because they are covering up. Uh, same you can see in Haryana. If you try to locate three of the pellu channels, it is very difficult to locate. But based on the depression, we can find out okay, it was used to be pellu channel. The same is happening in Rajasthan, and entire sites in Rajasthan is destroyed by the uh, kiln activities. It's more than thousands of kilns illegally working in this region because the alluvium soil is very good for this for the brick kilns brick uh, preparation of the brick so illegal bricks is in thousands of number only 600 brick kilns are allowed but thousands of brick kilns over there are operated by the illegally by the people over there thank you yes sir was site how many sites reported by the ASI? Uh, most of the sites are reported by the uh, AGHOSH. Uh, in During my exploration, I reported 10 new sites. Sir. Protected. Protected sites is only uh, two sites over there. It, that is the destiny, sir. This is after partition, we, uh, they are talking about AGHOSH have explored. We lost Harapan to the Pakistan. So, uh, we AGHOSH tried to explore those sites. He explored 25 Harapan sites and more than 100 sites over there. Until date now, uh, only five or ten sites are protected. Most of the sites getting destroyed. And after a gosh, very really few, uh, few people able to relocate those sites. Uh, because uh, one more thing is a gosh report was never published. It's published in 2021. Uh, in the second part of the third uh, third volume of the Kalibanga report, the back side. Apart from that, they never published the a gosh report. So uh, scholars never able to relocate the sites. So what uh, I'm due to the help of Dr. Sanjay Manjul, he gave me the old maps of Aghosh. Uh, because of that, I'm able to record, relocate the old sites of uh, Aghosh, which were reported. The best work till date has been carried out in the region by Sri Aghosh. So all, all together, you have 75 sites. If I'm hmm? How many sites are you reported? So, uh, 75. Uh, there's so many sites, sir. No, no, no. Huh. All Harappan sites. All Harappan sites. Uh, total mature Harappan sites. Huh. All, all, all. Pre and mature. Pre, mature, late, including late. Late, I still, I still, still, the, I never found a single late Harappan site. There's also problem of uh, understanding between, uh, like, in Hanumangad, I've only covered 20% of the region. Because wherever I go in Rajasthan, uh, Hanumangad, uh, scholars confuse with the Rangbhel uh, pot shirt with the Harappan pot shirt. So as one very big site like Karoti, it is a Rangbhel site. So it is reported from 1950s like a, uh, as a Harappan site. But, but come down to the basic question. Basic question. How many total Harappan sites are there? How many total? Mature Harappan sites. Hmm. Hmm? I have to calculate, sir. I have to look at the again the data. Like an OT, but ha, still 26 early Harappan we get. Uh, 26 no, because, plus 4. Um. No, because you see, hmm. you see when Ghost did work, huh. that time only 25 sites were known. He's talking about mature Harappan site at that so time. That only 25. Now okay. the number is around 80. So out of 80, I, I remember. Not, not 80, sir. So not 39 is Ganga Nagar in the Saswati River bed, 3 in Hanumangad. It's 42. And in uh, Drishadadi River, it's... Uh, total, total Harappan site I'm talking about. Yeah. It's not 80. Harappan site, Harappan site mature, mature, mature Harappan site I'm talking about. Uh, then I have to again recheck the numbers. Sir. Give me some time, so I have to calculate. <laughs> so how, many, how many sites, sir? Huh? I still very doubtful, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you, sir, but I'm still very doubtful, sir. <laughs> Rajasthan, sir. Only Rajasthan, sir. No, but uh, from your thesis, I remember, you know, you have uh, mentioned few late Harappan sites. Sir, those late Harappan sites not reported by me because it's, uh, uh, I have some restrictions to work, at, uh, time restrictions. So those are t data uh, data I have taken from uh, Dr. Vikas Pabas' okay. work. Okay, uh, Pramasar also worked with him. So I personally, wherever I visited, some few sites he reported like uh, Birbal Masani and all. 
Uh, sorry, Salim Gad Masani. Salim Gad Masani, I went over there, he reported it earlier up on site, but I didn't find a single shirt over there. Same like few other sites also. So for me, I just uh, explored 20% of Hanuman Gad. It's still 80% me to re, uh, redo the work this year as a planning to... Uh, because it's all, uh, one more problem is over there, sir. There's, if you have these small settlements around your settlements, their number, uh, they number like uh, settle num settlement number 1 to 7. One, there is one site, and you find small, small other sites. So you find Karnpura 1, Karnpura 2, Karnpura 3, Karnpura 4, Karnpura 7. But uh, uh, Prabhakas has excavated only one Karnpura, and he has reported seven Karnpura. So I get confused. For me, also, I confusing while writing my thesis. So where are the rest seven Karnpuras gone? So these things are a pro uh, problem because we, we, when get, uh, we try to increase the number of the sites. Site never get increased, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. No, no, please stand there. Stand there. Stand there. Uh, I just, you know, wanted to congratulate him. I think, sir, if after Ghosh, he is the only person who has, you know, uh, compiled, surveyed carefully all the Harappan sites in northern Rajasthan. This is, I think, he has Thank you, sir. done a wonderful thesis, you know, because I, I, I examined it. He has done wonderful thesis. I think that book should come, that should come out as a book because that will be a good guide for the future work. This is one thing. The second thing which I wanted, what I wanted to request here is that since like uh, Professor Sunavane, Professor Bhan, Professor Ajit uh, is here, all including Santi is here. This is the problem. What he said in Northern Rajasthan is happening. I think in the entire country, we are losing sites like anything. So maybe I am really afraid if there are sites for the next generation. If there are no sites. I am, I am clearly saying we are losing incredibly history of techniques. We will never be able to write that history of techniques in India. That will go. So we have to do something. Maybe we have to knock ASI, ministry, whatever we have to do. If we are not doing it, if we are sleeping like this, maybe what do we do? So we have to do something. I think this is not happening in Rajasthan. I suppose this is happening everywhere in India, ever since this JCB came. So this JCB is, is just last 10, 15 years. And I've been hearing because I still remember uh, Tejas wrote a couple of years in a, a paper in uh, Puratatwa how the Harappan sites have been flattened in Haryana. So the situation is happening in Rajasthan also. I mean, many, many sites are gone. So maybe we have to do something. So I think this is also a good platform that uh, something should go from here to the ministry or something. I think Professor Ramani can guide all of us how to go about it. Thank you very much. I now request Dr. Ramadevi Shekhar to honor, to honor Dr. Chanda Shekhar Singh. I now request Dr. Aatya here to introduce Dr. Ajit Prasad. Uh, I would like to first thank uh, uh, Chandrasekhar Singh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Singh, for giving us such an interesting and very intriguing uh, talk. And, uh, um, and also Dr. Karagwal, sir, for raising the concern for protecting the uh, archaeological sites. I am now going to welcome our next expert, uh, Dr. Rajit Prasad, sir, who is, who is a retired professor from Department of Archaeology and Ancient History. Uh, sir Mahadaja Sayajira of University of Baroda, and he's currently the guest professor at IIT Gandhinagar I, um, in the Department of History and, Yuma, uh, History and Science. Uh, 
Um, I would like to call upon uh, Sir on the dais, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I start my presentation, um, let me thank uh, the organizers of this conference, Dr. Rama Devi and uh, ICHR, for organizing this conference as well as for inviting me. I would also like to thank my fellow researchers, uh, our colleagues, those who are here, and also other members of the faculty, students uh, from our department as well as from other institutions, those who actually kind of helped us to continue our research in Harappan archaeology in Gujarat. Uh, my presentation today is actually about uh, uh, the cultural diversity, regional diversity, which we actually come across in the Harappa culture. Generally, what we see is that uh, people actually present a picture. The Harappa culture is quite uh, uniform throughout its uh, length and breadth of its geographical spread, which is actually is not the case we could actually kind of see a lot of regional uh, traits, what we call the regional variations within the Harappa culture. One of such, uh, uh, oh, it's not it, it's on my face. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah so uh, Gujarat, in fact, is the southernmost uh, uh, extension of the inter-civilization. We do actually come across certain uh, regional traits in, uh, uh, in Gujarat. Um, I will actually be st uh, stressing upon this is. Yeah, uh, I will actually be uh, touching upon three important. Uh, uh, my pr presentation is actually in three important parts. One is about what is this regional traits which we come across in the Harappa culture in Gujarat, which is generally described as the Surat Harappan. That has been actually defined uh, in the 1980s by Professor uh, Greg Possel and M. H. Ravel. I will actually look at uh, 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 the origin and root of these regional traditions in the early Harappan cultural remains you come across in Gujarat, and then trace the resilience of those early traits through the late Harappan through mature Harappan to the late Harappan. That is how I, I, uh, my presentation will actually go. Uh, when we talk about, there are more than 700, you see, you can see the uh, distribution of Harappan sites in this map. Uh, uh, there are more than 750 sites uh, 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 which are uh, found in Gujarat. Uh, many of these are actually very small uh, rural settlements, as Professor Sonamani recently present, just now presented. Uh, and uh, what you can actually see is that uh, uh, they are actually distributed in all the major cultural regions of Gujarat. When I say all the major cultural regions, there are three major cultural regions, uh, four major cultural regions in Gujarat. One is Kutch, then the North Gujarat, Saurashtra, and South Gujarat. In all these regions, you do actually come across distribution of Harappan sites, but there is a disparity in the distribution. The number of sites you come across in Saurashtra region, in fact, are much more. One reason is that, that uh, Saurashtra actually covers much more larger area than Kutch or, or North Gujarat. Now, there are more than 500 sites or sites of the Harappa culture in, in, in Saurashtra, whereas in Kutch and uh, North Gujarat, somewhere around 100, 125. Whereas in South Gujarat is uh, uh, 25. Another reason for this disparity in the distribution is the environmental constraints of different regions. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I uh, so when I think there is a slide which is missing here. I think there is a slide which I don't know how did it became blank. So <laughs> there are more blanks in that. Uh, but anyway, uh, what I want to actually I, I, uh, uh, what I want to say is that the the difference in the material culture which we have come across in the. Harappan site in Gujarat was actually noticed not in the 1980s by Possel. Uh, it was actually noticed by uh, in the 1940s, okay, 1940s by 
N.G. Dikshit, who actually excavated uh, 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 Rangpur, and he actually found uh, this is most probably post Harappan, which was very little Harappan remained, Harappan characters, as we, uh, he at that time applied the logic of what we come across in the Indus Valley as the touchstone for identifying Harappan sites. And um, uh, then S.R. Rao, when he excavated, he could actually establish the Harappan presence, but he also did come across material remains which are different from the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Indus Valley. Uh, so he act what are the things he actually found? He actually found micaceous redware and black and redware, which are actually not a part of the Harappan remains which you come across in the in the Indus Valley. So he actually thought these were actually the representative of the indigenous population, Chalcolithic population that uh, were in existence prior to the beginning of Indus civilization during the urban phase in Gujarat. But he could not actually kind of uh, substantiate that uh, position by, by in the excavations which he have actually conducted. Uh, and then subsequent to that, uh, this difference was actually kind of reflected when Wheeler and uh, Raymond Dalton actually described the sub -indus. You know, the difference in the Indus material, but affiliated to the Indus uh, civilization. So he, th they described it as the sub -indus. And uh, uh, B. Subarao, uh, who is actually, a, you know, uh, an expert uh, surveyor and an analyst of uh, Chalcolithic cultural development in India, he also described the cultural materials found from Gujarat as Kathiawad Harappan. So what I mean to say is that uh, primarily all the scholars have already kind of observed the difference which you come across in the Harappan culture remains in Gujarat, which is different from the Indus Valley. And this is what has been actually kind of defined so what happened to those days was that there was no dates available. They all actually thought this kind of development actually happened in the late Harappan times, that is the post-urban times. But uh, in 1980s, uh, SR, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Greg Gregory Fossils and uh, M. H. Ravel's excavation tragedy revealed the date going back contemporary to the urban phase of Indian civilization. Uh, so that is when they came up with uh, the, the, the definition of uh, uh, Sorat Harappan. Sorat being one of the traditional names of Saurashtra. So, uh, uh, so Sorat Harappan therefore actually uh, is a manifestation of Harappa culture in Gujarat in the regional terms. It actually shows the regional trait. This is the way it has been actually defined. And what are the characters by which one can actually def uh, identify these regional traits? One of these is actually pottery. The ceramics which you actually come across in the urban context, as you, which is some of them are actually shown over there. Is there a laser point here? Yeah. No, no, no. Go backwards. <laughs> backwards. Yeah. There, no. Uh, yeah, there, there it is. No, the same thing. I don't know. Yeah, uh, the ceramics. Um, that is one um, which you can actually see over there on the on the left side. And then these are the Surat Harappan material, which is a so this is in the later time. Uh, the other aspect in which the Surat Harappan differed is that. Uh, uh, in the, uh, the cuisines, the Arapans and the as well as in the Gujarat. There were significant difference in the kind of crops they actually produced. Next slide, please. Oh, that is also a blank. I um, don't know what to do. <laughs> okay, this is okay. Uh, it's fine. Uh, that, is the, that is the variation which we actually come across, whereas the classical Harappans or the Indus Valley and the adjoining regions in the east, they actually depend upon, depended on the winter crops, which is, you know, based on wheat and barley based cultivation. Whereas in Gujarat, we do actually come across, in Gujarat Harappans, we do actually come across the, uh, the size actually depending upon the summer crops or the smaller millets. Uh, there are two kinds of millets. One is the larger millets, which were actually introduced almost the fag end of the urban phase of Indus civilization. Where in the early times onwards, right from the urban phase, beginning of the urban phase, most of the Harappan sites the in Saurashtra or in Gujarat were actually based, I mean, their uh, subsistence were based on uh, uh, cuisines and food items which were made from different kinds of millets. There were six, six different millets. There are more than six. There are at least six different millets which were actually identified from, from, from the Gujarat Harappan sites. Next slide, please. 
No, I don't think I can continue with this. Next. Can you reload this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I want to see you go and do it. It's not easy. I I now request Dr. Rama Devi Shekhar to honor. So th that's a chart which actually shows the. Uh, <laughs> huh? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, that's a chart which actually shows the the uh, the kind of food brains we actually have in Sarat Harappan and the classical Harappan context. What you what is what you essentially uh, suggest is that the dominance of the millets in the Sarat Harappan sites. Uh, not only the Surat Harappan context, but also in the classical Harappan sites of Gujarat. Uh, that is primarily because of the environmental constraints, which is not actually uh, not conducive for the cultivation of wheat and barley. So they had to actually depend on, you know, uh, the local millets. Uh, uh, 
uh, that is one of the reasons uh, you come across the, uh, the, the, the millet-based scenes in the Sarat Harappan uh, context, and that is one of the major reasons uh, for the variations which we come across in the lifestyle of the people as well. That is what we will actually see. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, when we actually look at the root of these, uh, you know, this, where exactly, when exactly this uh, millet, millet cultivation actually start, that will take us to the early Harappan settlements uh, uh, prior to the, the beginning of the urban phase in, in Gujarat. There were at least three or uh, three major uh, early Harappan uh, uh, cultural regions which have been actually kind of identified in Gujarat. One is Gujarat. One is in North Gujarat, what is known as the Anadha tradition. And then you have uh, two of them in the Saurashtra course. One is um, Padri and uh, several sites around, surround that, in that. And the other one is Pre Prabhas. All of these, these early and uh, Pre Prabhas assemblages has also been reported from northern part of Gujarat, that is in Tatrana, which you can see in the map. And this has been actually dated from 3600 BC to almost uh, 2600 BC. That, that's the time range within, within which we talk about the pre-urban Harappan settlements. Uh, uh, if you look at the kind of food grains which we come across in all these sites, what we see is that they are all uh, these are all agricultural pastoral settlements. We actually come across instead of wheat and barley, what we come across is the exploitation of uh, exploitation of millets. Next slide, please. So this this is uh, the evidence which we have from Lotesha, one of the one of the uh, early uh, pre-urban early uh, uh, Harappan sites, uh, which has been dated from 3600 BC to 2900 BC. We have once again six or seven different kinds of millets. Uh, there is no evidence of wheat at least at this particular site. There are evidence of wheat and barley from sites at Datrana, which is a pre site somewhere around 3000 BC. That is essentially because of the contact with the the Indus Valley has already started by 3300 BC. You also have evidence from phytolith as well as some start grain analysis that uh, indicate exploitation of other local pulses like the like the horse grams and also green grams and black grams, etc., which are believed to be, have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, exploited locally. Um, uh, next, next slide, please. And uh, one of the important aspects of this cuisine variation, in fact, the kind of vessels used for the cooking them. The Harappan, the classical Harappan, or the, the you know, with, with the sites which are located in the Indus Valley, they are known for this peculiar kind of cooking vessel with a, with a kind of ledge at the shoulder. Uh, you come across that in almost all the classical Harappan sites, which are completely, completely absent in Surat Harappan sites, indicating that, uh, you know, Surat Harappans and the classical Harappans are certainly preparing different kinds of cuisines. One, uh, and that's the reason you do not actually come across this classical Harappan uh, cooking vessels uh, in the Surat Harappan uh, uh, sites. Uh, next, next slide, please. So, um, what is uh, most easily identifiable in the ceramic assemblage of Saurashtra? In fact, this is different kinds of uh, bowls. SR Rao, who actually excavated Drangpur and subsequently Lothal, he could actually kind of build up a cultural sequence just by looking at the variation, the morphology of the bowls. You can read SR Rao's report. He actually builds up. Uh, among many other parts, one of the important uh, uh, vessels we used to, uh, to to have this division within the cult, uh, you know developmental stages in the Harappa culture was this morphological changes that actually happens in the case of bowls. And you come across in all Harappan, I mean, uh, Surat Harappan sites. And uh, why, you know, you can actually see them having different convex sided, concave sided, etc. Next slide, please. And um, uh, this is the Prabhas. Prabhas pottery, which is found uh, uh, in the sites along the Saurashtra coast uh, near Prabhas pattern. Uh, this is a, a variant of the uh, 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 Surat Harappan, or primarily that is also dominated by, by the bowls. And then you can also see this Maitreya's redware and black and redware, which was identified by Rao. That's also primarily dominated with bowls. So throughout the Harappan sites in Gujarat, you come across the dominance of these bowls. And that, again, and, uh, uh, is an indication of the, the kind of cuisine variation or the popularity of a, of a particular kind of cuisine, probably liquid or fluid kind of uh, a food item, which was popularly consumed by the people of Saurashtra, Saurat Harappans. Next slide, please. Um, uh, yes, um, you, when we actually look at the early Harappan sites or the, you know, you have the, the Anarda or the Padri 
or the or the preprabhas you do actually come across uh, uh, those cultures or those ceramic traditions were also kind of dominated by the bowls you can see on one side, these are the sarathara sorry the anarda bowls dating back to uh, 3600 bc uh, uh, and painted uh, you know uh, and then next slide next slide so you can actually see the similarity of the shapes. This is the Surat Harappan, the earlier one in the Surat Harappan on one side and the another on the other side. So the bowls you come across there have the root in the early Chalcolithic uh, traditions in, in North Gujarat as well as in, as, as well as in Saurashtra. Next slide, please. So you can see the similarity of the shapes, continuity. Or uh, what one can see is the res resilience of a tradition a trait and then its continuation. Its continuation is seen in the post-urban stage as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is in the post-urban stage. So it continues almost up to 1300 BC, suggesting that, you know, probably the food items or the kind of cuisines they produced would not have been changed. It was entirely depend, mostly depend on, on the pulses. Uh, sorry, on the, on, the, on the millets. Next slide, please. So now when we come to, so that's about the cuisines and their variation, um, how the continuity is actually reflected from the early Harappan to the urban phase to the post-urban phase. When we now come to the architecture, you know, so how, how is Surat Harappan architecture actually varied from the classical Harappan? There is a lot of variations and uh, between the two. Uh, in the classical Harappan is much more structured, uh, whereas the Surat Harappan is less structured. But what is more important is that uh, you do come across curvilinear structures as well as circular structures in the Surat Harappan, which are almost completely absent in the classical Harappan. So this is a tradition which is mostly confined in the Harappan context. In, 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 Saura, uh, in the Surat Harappan. You can actually see these are some of the examples which I have actually taken uh, from during the urban phase. So Surat Harappan, when I see it, the urban phase. Okay, you have the Clarvillian structures or circular structures which you actually come across, a Rojdi or at Nagwada, which is a polygonal or Clarvillian structure as, it, as, as well as at Kuntasi. And then Professor Navani has actually shown the Zekda, which is a, it's, it, you know, which you can actually see a rural settlement, but have but have a series of these circular structures or circular huts, um, um, which actually is the kind of architecture you come across uh, in the Surat Harappan. Next slide, please. And that is actually continued even in the post-urban stage. You come across that at Dolavira in the final stages or at Shikarpur in the third stage, which is the post-urban stage. And even, you know, and, and, and uh, sites like uh, Kanewad probably is the late Harappan site or the post, uh, late Surat Harappan sites. So there is a continuity uh, in the Surat Harappan, late Harappan. And what about its, its origin? Uh, you, you know, next slide, please. If you look at the, uh, the early Harappan context, there are very little actual evidence of structural remains or circular houses or any kind of houses. Most of the times you actually come across very thin and flimsy uh, deposits of the early Harappans. Most of them are dominated by different kinds of pits, as we can actually see. These are not dwelling pits, these are mostly kind of uh, uh, storage pits. But then you also do come across evidence of wattle and dope kind of structures with, uh, you know, you can see the clay lumps with the reed impressions indicating there, are, there were wattle and uh, 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 dope structures. Its plan, we do not know. We haven't come across in any of the excavations the real plan. I suppose from Padri they did actually excavate uh, 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 an house plan which is made of packed mud, <coughs> but whether it is circular or rectangular is not actually properly described in their report. But that is a picture of the kind of circular huts which we actually come across in the modern context. So we would actually presume when we actually see the kind of circular or curvilinear structures which we come across in the Surat Harappan and the late Harappan, probably even in the it, it has its root from the from the early Chalcolithic or early Harappan context in, 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 in Gujarat. Next slide, please. Now, when we actually started looking at the subsistence activities of the Surat Harappans, Surat Harappan subsistence were essentially dominated by agro-pastoralism. Pastoralism and opportunistic farming of millets. Uh, you do not come across organized farming. Uh, you do come across organized farming, but then not as much as the, the classical Harappans based on winter crops. So, um, but in addition to that, we also do come across uh, some of these you know, beads, which these are old from the Surat Harappan sites. Uh, these were contemporary to the urban phase. 
uh, if this, this is actually coming from JEDEC, which has been dated to around 2300 BC, which is almost uh, you know, in the middle of the urban phase. So many of those beads you come across, in fact, most probably they go through transaction with the urban Harappan sites. And some of the beads, as you can see, uh, have an attempt at perforation, so an attempt to kind of imitate or make beads by the Surat Harappan also, but then there was no organized way of producing those beads. These were mostly a kind of amateurish attempt to kind of imitate or make the beads. So essentially their, 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 their economy was not actually based on craft production. Their economy was essentially based on, uh, you know, pastoralism and uh, agriculture. Next slide, please. So that is what we actually come across. You do actually come across uh, enough evidence of uh, pastoralism uh, based on cattle, sheep, goat, rearing in all the Harappan, uh, sorry, all the Surat Harappan sites, uh, including the, uh, uh, you know, uh, classical Harappan sites as well. Um, but then this, this was the mainstay of the, 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 the Surat Harappan economy as one actually presumed. Um, next slide, please. So this has been actually kind of supported by the kind of uh, kind of site planning we come across in larger Harap, I mean, Surat Harappan sites. Like the one on the extreme right is a site known as JEDEC, which is around a 15 hectare site. A very large site. It's one of the largest Surat Harappan sites in Gujarat. And you can see, uh, you know, uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the right, you can see an open court with hardly any evidence of any kind of pro stru prominent structures. Uh, this probably would have been a cattle pen, in the sense that where the cattle were actually cattle or the cat, you know, pastoral heads were probably managed. And similar kind of, uh, uh, you know, structural features has been found from other Sarat Harappan sites like uh, Kotara Badli. Um, uh, that's what both could actually kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, enlighten us regarding that. We are actually talking about it. He said it would have been essentially used for the managing uh, uh, cattle herds. Uh, then you do also come across a drojdi, a similar kind of uh, open space, open structure. Probably these were all, uh, one way or the other, uh, you know, kind of directly or indirectly used for managing cattle herds. Um, um, next, pastoral herds, not only cattle, including sheep and goat. Next, next slide, please. And uh, one can actually trace the origin of this, you know, pastoral economy to the early Harappans. In all early Harappan sites, be it at Padri or at Somnath or at uh, uh, Loteshwar, that is uh, another tradition, we do actually come across uh, cat, uh, cattle, sheep, goat, pastoralism quite prominently reflected the animal faunal remains excavated from all these sites. So you can actually see how it actually in the, in the Mesolithic context. Lotusher incidentally has a substratum of the Mesolithic uh, hunter-gatherer, uh, you know, uh, deposit. Uh, which does not have uh, evidence of, uh, you know, sheep or uh, wild cattle. There are evidence of wild cattle, uh, but not sheep uh, in, uh, in the Mesolithic context. Some evidence of wild cattle has been actually reported from Loteshwa. Subsequent to that, uh, what you actually, when you come to the Chalcolithic level, so that is around 3600 36, 36, BC, you come across you know, fully domesticated cattle uh, bones actually dom not dominating you know, coming in substantial numbers uh, in, in that context, uh, essentially indicating the importance of pastoralism in the early agro-pastoral communities uh, at Lotesher or the, uh, that tr tradition. Uh, yeah, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, that's, that is the crux of my presentation. What we have actually tried to understand is the uh, uh, Surat Harappan uh, uh, cultural traits have the roots in the pre-urban, uh, the Harappan or Chalcolithic uh, traditions of Gujarat. It shows free and opportunistic exchange of technology with the classical Harappan. Uh, that is how you actually come across, uh, you know, and, uh, it is very difficult to actually separate technologically one from the other. It is the manifestation of the technology uh, that actually, uh, you, know, you know, set them apart along with the intangible cultural traditions which are reflected in, in, in the, type, in the cuisines or, or other things. Uh, the interaction is reflected in the material culture of the Surat Harappan in terms of making structures or uh, different cuisines, etc. So, continuation of regional traits in the late Surat Harappan indicates the resilience of an earlier tradition and its continuity in the final stage. 
So thank you very much for your patience. Um, yeah, I should actually thank uh, a lot of people, the MS University, Actual Survey of India, those who actually have uh, yeah, gave us permission to excavate state uh, archaeology without which we could not have actually continued our excavations and uh, other projects uh, uh, and people and uh, institutions those who are involved in our Harappan research. Thank you very much. I request Dr. Ramadevi Shekhar to honor. Shadi asked the question about uh, mobility of pastoral communities and uh, how exactly, uh, what proportion exactly. Uh, how uh, does one actually figure that out? Uh, very, 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 very difficult, in fact. You know, what if you, the only way one can actually kind of look at it uh, is looking at the ethnographic records today. In, in Gujarat, uh, Kutch or Saurashtra, wherever you go, there is a section of the population actually are pastoralists. They move uh, from along with their herd from one place to the other. That is a necessity for maintaining the uh, maintaining the herd healthy. And uh, and then in that process, I suppose some of the family members may stay back. Not necessarily all of them, but they do. And then they actually come back. They have different routines of coming back, etc. One, may, one can only project that understanding back to understand, to see uh, probably that is the way uh, the sites actually formed around uh, in, in Saurashtra. So in that process, what we what can see is that some of the sites which we see are actually campsites, where they, these pastoralists actually move and settle for a few days. And that actually results in the formation of few portraits and other material remains in, in that region. So some of the sites you can actually see is that just 10 meter by 10 meter, and hardly few portraits. And then if you actually collect them, and then there is nothing left over there. So when, you know, just the earlier uh, speaker actually talked about when we went and we did not actually see the sites. Uh, so this is uh, also because of the, the nature of the site. So we also carry, carried out a kind of um, uh, survey, re-survey of Harappan sites in Gujarat. In that process, uh, you know, we kind of with Rajesh and uh, our other researchers, Charu, um, uh, we, we have all the list of all the, you know, 700 old sites and then uh, revisited the, those sites. In that process, we were able to, I suppose, we were able to kind of locate almost uh, something, some 30, 40 sites where I could, we could not, um, in, uh, in that 750 old site, 30, 40 sites we could not actually kind of locate. The rest of the sites we could easily locate. And uh, there, were, there are different names you know, which are given to the same site, etc. We could actually get to resolve all those issues. But by and large, we were able to actually locate most of the sites. Uh, and these few sites which we are not able to locate would have been, you know, these kind of flimsy sites where, you know, and also a lot of developmental activities are going on. Um, so one of the sites near Bachao, that has been completely kind of, because of the expansion of the urban, you know, settlements, it is all under, uh, under that uh, settlements now, modern settlements now, there is no remains over there. So otherwise, there is, no, there is no problem. But then it is true. It is very difficult to kind of say what percent of the people would have been actually actual pastoralists. And then how many of the members actually stayed back. It's very difficult to actually put a number on that. We can only kind of have an understanding about it by looking at the, the modern yeah, ethnographic records. Yeah.
with this we are winding up today's sessions tomorrow's sessions will be starting at 9:30 sharp thank you